right, ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, delegates to the eighth session of the Africa Regional Forum for Sustainable Development on the Sustainable Development Goals. If I could get your attention, please, and ask you to make your way to your designated seat. Thank you for your kind attention. My name is Lerat Mbele, and um, I'll be facilitating the conversations this morning during the plenary. What I'd like to request of you now is for you to take your seat. Let's also please make sure that we are observing all COVID-related protocols. You'll see that the chairs are nicely spaced out, and that is to encourage a little bit of social distancing. If we could also implore on everybody to wear their mask, I know I should be wearing mine as well. Television aesthetics, though. Let's just get through the uh, running of the program. What we will be doing this morning is um, we will be hearing a few words from the sponsors of the event, namely the government of Rwanda the UNECA, Collaborative Partners, um, the chair of the last session, the chair of the current session. And thereafter, we will be having a short memorandum, a signing agreement, um, based on the commitments that were made uh, in the hybrid and the virtual forum last year, hosted by the government of the Republic of Congo. And thereafter will be a high-level panel uh, which will be facilitated on the theme, which is how to unlock finances that will help us to build better. We will then break for lunch, and then afterwards we will continue with the formalities where we're looking more in depth at some of the local and regional and country reviews, and there will also be an election. What I need to ask of you, please, I know that security has been quite strict outside, and rightly so, but for those of you who have been allowed to bring in your uh, iPads, laptops, cell phones, please can we just make sure that all devices are on silent, at the very least silent, at best switched off. And please can we also remember to observe COVID protocols. During our high-level session, we may take a few questions in the room. So perhaps this is an opportunity for me to say, can I get an indication, having looked at the agenda, who might want to say something? Who might want to say something? I'm almost running it like a lottery. If you put up your hands now, I'll make sure you get given a chance but in the interest of time, we won't. So, sir, please stand up. You will say something. Please stand up. No, no, not now. Please stand up so that we remember. Anybody else who might want to say something during an opportunity for interactions, Q&A? Please stand up, ma'am. We all know what the agenda of the day is, what the theme is for the eighth session. The five goals we're focusing on, building better for a sustainable future, unlocking financing. Please keep standing, ma'am. Anybody else? Yes, please stand. And for the last time, and that's it. So those four people standing, may I ask the ushers to pay special attention who they are? Those will be the four questions we take from the floor at Q&A time, and those questions only. Thank you very much.
again, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, members of the media, if I may ask you all to take your seats, keep your masks on, observe social distancing. We will be beginning our program in a very short while. We will be receiving His Excellency, the President of Rwanda, in a few moments, and that will signal the start officially of today's program and the opening of the eighth session of the African Regional Forum on Sustainable Development. Thank you, Mia. Also, if I can make a special announcement, please. Ladies and gentlemen, if I can have your attention and make a special announcement. So, during the course of the morning, we will be hearing uh, statements and commitments from our esteemed guests and the host government in the form of the president himself. Shortly after that will be an opportunity for a group photograph, which I've been told you've been informed about for the visiting ministers. Just in terms of the logistics, what I ask of you is at that point, in other words, after the keynote address by His Excellency Paul Kagame, please can we allow His Excellency and his team to leave, as well as our speakers on stage, and then may I ask that the visiting ministers stand up and follow them. There will be protocol officials who will guide you uh, and direct you where you should go for that photograph. But just so that we know and we anticipate it, after the keynote address by President Paul Kagame, he will leave the room along with um, our esteemed guests on stage to be followed by you, Your Excellencies, the visiting ministers, directed by protocol where you will then take a group photograph. We will then commence with the second half of the morning session shortly after that group photograph. If everybody else who will not be in the photograph, if we can ask you all to just stay in the room when the time comes. Thank you.
Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, may I ask you all to be upstanding? Distinguished guests, it gives me great pleasure to welcome our host, the President of the Republic of Rwanda. Thank you all very much. You may take your seats. Neza, Karibu, Sianamgela, Bienvenue, and the warmest welcome to this eighth session of the Africa Regional Forum on Sustainable Development, brought to you by the Government of Rwanda under the stewardship of His Excellency the President Paul Kagame, together with the United Nations Economic Commission on Africa, in collaboration with the African Union, the African Development Bank, agencies of the United Nations and essentially the UN system at large. Now, as you all know, this is an annual event that brings together policymakers, business, civil society, and everyone within the field of development who cares, who cares about sustainability, who cares about economic growth, who cares about equity in gender, who cares about the alleviation of poverty, who cares about the dignity of people in the world and the people of Africa in general. Now, it is really a wonderful moment for us to be able to say that this eighth session is taking place in a hybrid format. We have delegates in the room and we have many of you online, but it's wonderful that we can engage in this way virtually and in person after a really challenging past two, two and a half years. So to that end, we're grateful and we thank you for logging on and we thank you for being with us here in the beautiful country of Rwanda. Now our theme for this eighth session is building forward, building better, a green, inclusive and resilient Africa poised to achieve the goals of uh, the Agenda 2030 or the Sustainable Development Goals for 2030 and Agenda 2063 of the African Union. Now these dates are really important and I think we need to underscore them. They're important because 2030 is a target date for the achievement and the accomplishment of the UN Sustainable Goals and 2030 is literally just around the corner. So the pressure is on, the heat is on to make sure that commitments are met, that programs are accelerated and that we live the truth of those commitments. This can't be achieved through the interventions or the actions of one leader or one agency or a leading development finance institution. This requires all hands on deck, all constituent players and partners 
all citizens to actualize the Sustainable Development Goals and to start to breathe life into the African Union's Agenda 2063. Now, the good news is that on quite a few indicators, the African continent is set to accomplish uh, these goals, particularly the SDG 13 on climate change and just, just transitions. Research also so shows that African nations have made great strides on SDG 12, which is responsible consumption and production. Of course, it would be remiss of me not to admit that there's still a lot of work to be done in areas of ending poverty and transforming local economies to be high value, high growth economies. But here today, you will hear that that work has already begun in a collaborative and concerted and deliberate way. Our focus for this eighth session is on five key goals. They are gender equality, quality education, life on land, life below water, and partnerships for the goals. I'm just reminded, Your Excellency, of what young Africans like to say. It's a slogan, Africa, your time is now. They also say, we are the ones we have been waiting for. We are our ancestors' wildest dreams, living the dreams of our forefathers, foremothers, our forebearers. Because we are in the moment, let us make it count. The time has come. And so with those opening remarks, let me acknowledge all of you, distinguished guests. In particular, let me acknowledge you, Madam Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations. Let me acknowledge you, the outgoing session chair, Minister from Congo. Let me acknowledge you, Dr. Vera Songwe, and yes, our host, President Paul Kagame. It now gives me great pleasure to yield the floor for this morning's session to the session chair. She's the Minister of Environment, Sustainable Development and the Congo Basin. She was the chair of the seventh session, uh, which took place under the auspices of the government of the Republic of Congo. She is Arlette Sudan Nono, um, and she will be chairing this first session for us. Madam, may I yield the floor to you? Distingués euh, délégués, bienvenue à la huitième session du Forum régional africain sur le développement durable. Je voudrais commencer par remercier le gouvernement rwandais d'accueillir ce forum sous le très haut patronage et le leadership de son excellence, le président Paul Kagame, le chef de l'État. Je souhaite maintenant aborder les questions d'organisation pour l'élection du bureau de la huitième session du Forum régional africain sur le développement durable. Je demande maintenant au secrétariat de faire un bref exposé sur l'élection du bureau. Et donc, secrétariat, vous avez donc la parole.
Merci beaucoup, Madame la Ministre, et merci d'avoir euh, accueilli tous les délégués. Euh, nous allons passer directement aux, euh, aux interventions des, euh, des eaux euh, dignitaires qui sont avec nous. Alors, Madame la Ministre, à vous la parole de prononcer votre intervention. Je vais peut-être euh, laisser cette, euh, notre euh, Madame Lerato Mbélé, peut-être, prendre le relais, sinon je vais euh, tout de suite me lancer donc, dans le propos de circonstance. Je vous remercie. Monsieur le Président de la République du Rwanda, Son Excellence Monsieur Paul Kagame, Monsieur le Président du Conseil économique et social des Nations Unies, Son Excellence Colline Vixen Kélapilé, Madame la Vice-Secrétaire Générale des Nations Unies, Madame Amina Mohamed, Madame la Secrétaire Générale adjointe des Nations Unies et Secrétaire exécutive de la Commission économique pour l'Afrique, Madame Vera Sangoué, Monsieur le Ministre des Finances et de la Planification économique de la République du Rwanda, Dr Uziel Dajijimana, Monsieur le représentant de la Commission de l'Union africaine, Madame la représentante du président de la Banque africaine de développement, Mesdames et Messieurs les membres du corps diplomatique, Mesdames et Messieurs les représentants des organisations et agences spécialisées des Nations unies et autres partenaires du développement, Mesdames et Messieurs les représentants du secteur privé, des organisations de la société civile, des grands groupes et d'autres parties prenantes, distingués, délégués, mesdames et messieurs. Au nom du président de la République du Congo, son Excellence Denis Sassou Nguesso et de son gouvernement, au nom du bureau de la septième session du Forum régional africain sur le développement durable, Et en mon nom propre, c'est un grand honneur pour moi de prendre la parole à l'ouverture de la huitième session du Forum régional africain sur le développement durable. Ce forum régional nous offre une occasion unique de contribuer à la transformation de notre continent en un lieu prospère, inclusif, résilient, en harmonie avec nos écosystèmes riches et diversifiés pour le bénéfice des générations actuelles et futures. Permettez-moi de commencer par l'expression de notre profonde gratitude envers son Excellence le Président Paul Kagame, le gouvernement et le peuple rwandais pour avoir accueilli cette session de notre forum régional une fois de plus. Votre présence en personne aujourd'hui, Monsieur le Président, témoigne de votre engagement exceptionnel en faveur du leadership africain, de la fierté africaine et de la transformation de notre continent dirigé par les Africains eux-mêmes. Votre pays, le Rwanda, est un modèle de résilience et de dignité. Et ces qualités sont aussi, si je peux me permettre, Monsieur le Président de la République, les vôtres. Monsieur le Président, votre présence inspirera sans aucun doute des actions concrètes qui permettront à l'Afrique de mieux se relever de la crise de la Covid-19. À cette fin, notre continent doit tirer parti de ses ressources naturelles et de son avantage démographique et intensifier ses investissements pour créer une région résiliente au changement climatique, à la fois verte et inclusive. Il s'agit d'étapes cruciales sur la voie de la réalisation en Afrique, des aspirations incarnées par l'agenda 2063 de l'Union africaine et le programme 2030 des Nations unies. Excellence, distinguer délégués. Mesdames et Messieurs, lorsque nous nous sommes réunis à Brazzaville en mars 2021, les conséquences issues de la pandémie 
de la Covid-19 se faisaient déjà lourdement sentir. Elles ont depuis persisté. Les perturbations causées par cette pandémie ont considérablement élargi les écarts déjà importants en matière d'accès à une éducation et à une formation de qualité. Cette crise a gravement accentué les inégalités entre les sexes et elle retarde encore la transition urgente vers des économies plus vertes et plus inclusives au point de remettre en cause l'application du programme 2030 et de l'agenda 2063. Pourtant, pour l'Afrique, la voie vers une prospérité partagée et durable doit passer par une réponse efficace au choc posé par le changement climatique, la dégradation des sols et la perte de forêts et de biodiversité, ainsi que et par l'exploitation durable de ces ressources aquatiques, marines et minérales. Au même moment, l'Afrique doit imaginer des solutions urgentes, mais durables, pour s'attaquer au cercle vicieux de la réduction de la marge de manœuvre budgétaire et du surendettement croissant d'un nombre croissant de pays. Il n'est pas impossible de surmonter ces problèmes, mais ils exigent une solidarité et des efforts persistants. C'est pourquoi ce forum régional représente une échéance décisive. Il nous offre, à nous, pays africains, et aux diverses parties prenantes, l'occasion de renforcer la solidarité régionale et multipartite, d'évaluer en permanence les progrès accomplis et d'identifier des solutions multiniveaux viables pour ces questions et d'autres problèmes émergents. Excellence, Monsieur le Président de la République, chers délégués, Mesdames et Messieurs, permettez-moi à ce stade d'exprimer notre gratitude aux États membres pour avoir élu et confié aux membres du Bureau la responsabilité de diriger les travaux de la septième session de notre forum régional. Les membres du bureau sortant sont les suivants. Présidente, République du Congo. Premier vice-président, Kenya. Second vice-président, Niger. Troisième vice-président, Algérie. Et rapporteur, le Zimbabwe. Je tiens à féliciter et à exprimer ma gratitude aux membres du bureau pour leur engagement actif, ainsi qu'à la secrétaire exécutive de la Commission économique pour l'Afrique, Madame Vera Sangwe, et au secrétariat du Forum sous sa direction pour leur soutien qui a contribué à l'obtention de réalisations importantes pendant notre mandat. Permettez-moi de vous présenter quelques résultats concrets que le Bureau a pu enregistrer avec, en toile de fond, les défis et handicaps posés par les pandémies et cela dans le contexte des priorités clés de notre région. Le Bureau a dirigé avec succès les travaux de la septième session du Forum régional qui ont abouti à l'adoption de la déclaration de Brazzaville et des messages clés du Forum. Nous appelons à la mise en œuvre intégrale de ces résultats pour ouvrir la voie à une relance résiliente après la COVID-19 et pour mettre les pays africains sur la voie de la réalisation des objectifs de développement durable. Un accord de partenariat a été signé entre la CEA et la République du Congo pour établir le Centre africain de recherche en intelligence artificielle en République du Congo. Le Bureau a adopté un plan d'action et avec le soutien du secrétariat, nous avons accompli ce qui suit. Conformément au mandat du Forum, la présidente du Bureau, avec la participation active de la secrétaire exécutive de la CEA, Madame Vera Sangwe a transmis et défendu les résultats du forum lors du forum politique de haut niveau sur le développement durable qui a eu lieu à New York en juillet 2021. 
les priorités de l'Afrique sont reflétées de manière adéquate dans la déclaration ministérielle de l'édition de 2021 du Forum politique de haut niveau sur le développement durable. En outre, des actions de sensibilisation de la déclaration de Brazzaville et au message clé ont été menées lors de la 9e conférence sur les changements climatiques et le développement en Afrique et des comités intergouvernementaux de hauts fonctionnaires et d'experts pour l'Afrique orientale et occidentale. Par l'intermédiaire de la présidence, de la présidente du bureau et avec le soutien du secrétariat du bureau, le bureau a mené des actions de sensibilisation sur les mécanismes de financement de l'action climatique et du développement durable. Le fonds bleu pour le bassin du Congo, les échéances de dette pour l'action climatique, la nature et le développement durable et les obligations bleues et vertes font partie de ces mécanismes. Je suis heureuse d'informer le forum régional que la CEA et ses partenaires ont développé le mécanisme de liquidité et de durabilité pendant notre mandat. Nous demandons à la CEA et à ses partenaires de renforcer la capacité des États membres à tirer parti de ce mécanisme pour faire face aux énormes problèmes de liquidité auxquels sont confrontés les pays africains. Durant ce mandat, nous avons appelé à une intensification du plaidoyer pour mobiliser les pays africains afin qu'ils s'offrent à l'examen national volontaire. Cet effort s'est traduit par un nombre record de 21 pays, Afri 21 pays africains qui ont choisi d'effectuer leur examen national volontaire cette année. Un seul pays manque encore à l'appel. Enfin, en collaboration avec la CEA, le partenariat a été renforcé avec ONU Habitat, l'UNDSA et les cités et gouvernements locaux unis d'Afrique pour soutenir davantage d'examens locaux volontaires, notamment dans quatre localités du Zimbabwe, Bulawayo, Chuisa Anvan, Mutasa et Nkai. Excellence, Monsieur le Président de la République, chers délégués, Mesdames et Messieurs, le thème de cette huitième session, à savoir « Mieux construire l'avenir avec une Afrique verte, inclusive et résiliente, prête à réaliser le programme 2030 et l'agenda 2063 » est très proche de celui de la septième session de l'année dernière. Il s'agit avant tout d'un appel au rassemblement pour assurer la pleine réalisation des objectifs de développement durable dans le cadre de la décennie d'action en cours. Cela implique une opportunité et une marge de manœuvre considérable pour consolider les réalisations et intensifier le travail entamé pendant le mandat de notre bureau sortant. J'invite donc le nouveau bureau et notre forum à intensifier leurs efforts sur les cinq priorités suivantes. Première priorité, l'opérationnalisation et le renforcement des mécanismes, mécanismes post-Covid-19 de financement pour une relance inclusive, verte et résiliente, l'action climatique et le développement durable, Parmi ces mécanismes citant le fonds bleu pour le bassin du Congo, le mécanisme de liquidité et de durabilité, les échanges d'obligations pour l'adaptation au changement climatique, la nature et le développement durable et les obligations bleues et vertes. Deuxième priorité, la mise en œuvre de la grande muraille bleue et l'augmentation des investissements dans la biodiversité durable et la gestion des terres conformément au cadre de biodiversité post-2020. Troisième priorité, accélérer la mise en œuvre des objectifs de développement durable et de l'agenda 2063 
conformément à la décennie d'action. À cette fin, des efforts accrus et un soutien solide sont nécessaires pour revitaliser les cadres de planification et de budgétisation nationaux et infranationaux et pour générer et appliquer des données et des statistiques de qualité. Quatrième priorité, renforcer la capacité notamment des jeunes et des femmes à tirer parti de la numérisation de la science, de la technologie et de l'innovation pour des entreprises et des industries vertes et créatrices d'emplois. Et enfin, cinquième priorité, renforcer le soutien à l'égalité des sexes et au programme d'éducation et d'autonomisation des femmes et des jeunes afin de générer et de soutenir un développement inclusif. Monsieur le Président de la République, chers délégués, mesdames et messieurs, je ne saurais terminer ce propos sans rappeler une fois de plus que la Commission climat du bassin du Congo, institution de l'Union africaine, dans son excellence Denis Sassou Nguesso, assure la présidence, s'est dotée d'un outil financier innovant, crédible et opérationnel, le fonds bleu pour le bassin du Congo que je viens d'évoquer, dont je voudrais ici, en ma qualité de coordinatrice technique de la dite commission, une fois de plus faire le plaidoyer. Fort de 254 projets de développement locaux repartis entre les 16 pays membres de la commission et qui n'attendent qu'à être financés avec l'aide de nos partenaires, le fonds bleu est une initiative africaine lancée par des Africains pour les Africains et pour la protection de poumon vert qui est le bassin du Congo, le second poumon en termes de réservoir carbone après le bassin de l'Amazonie. Il serait incompréhensible qu'ils ne reçoivent pas toute l'attention et l'accompagnement qu'ils méritent de la part des bailleurs de fonds. Tout en souhaitant plein succès au nouveau bureau et une huitième session réussie et fructueuse de notre forum régional, je vous remercie, Excellence, Monsieur le Président de la République, ainsi que chacune et chacun d'entre vous de votre aimable attention. Let us also thank you, Madam Chair of the seventh session, and also thank you for reminding us of the hard work and the strides that have been taken in the last year, especially in the midst of an ongoing COVID pandemic, as you mentioned, the vulnerability caused by lockdowns uh, and people not being able to work, and also reminding us not to forget the all important work that has been done on preserving the environment and building on biodiversity. And uh, where better a place than the Republic of Congo, that part of the African continent known as the lungs of our continent. The work that you do is truly for the greater good and we see it and it counts. And we want to say to you, félicitations en vous, Madame Arlette Sudan Nonon. Let me also take this opportunity just to remind you that obviously this is a multilingual forum and if you are looking for translation, um, please use your um, translation phones and English is on channel one, channel one, and French is on channel two for translations and interpretations. We move on with statements coming through from our distinguished guests and Madame Sudan Nono mentioned the importance of quality statistics, credible information, data that can be relied on. And I think in the research around development and sustainable goals in Africa, there is no better organization than to guide us than the United Nations Economic uh, Commission for Africa. And they do more than just provide us with quality data, statistics and information they really put a name and a face to those statistics. Those women that are spoken about, they have a name, they have a culture, they have an identity. 
And the ability to do that really speaks to empathy, credibility, and compassion in the leadership of none other than you, Dr. Vera Songwe, who is the Under Secretary General of the United Nations and also the Executive Secretary of the ECA, who will address us now. Thank you, thank you, Lerato. Your Excellencies, good afternoon. Your Excellency President Paul Kagame, President of the Republic of Rwanda. Your Excellency Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, Madam Amina Mohammed. Your Excellency Colin Kapele, President of ECOSOC. Your Excellency, and uh, very hardworking, my sister Aled Sudan Arno, Minister of Environment, Sustainable Development of the Republic of Congo and Outstanding Chair of the Bureau of the Forum. Commissioner Joseph Asako, representing the African Union. The Minister of Finance of Rwanda and our partner in the last two years, uh, Minister Uziel, the Vice President of the African Development Bank, distinguished ambassadors, the private sector, members and representatives of major groups and other stakeholders, members uh, of the different mayors and cities around the continent, the youth, and of course, all the members of the UN family. It is a great pleasure and an honor to be with you here today at the 8th African Regional Forum for Sustainable Development, which we commonly call the United Nations Party in Africa. Once again, let me start by expressing my profound gratitude to the government and the people of Rwanda for so warmly welcoming and hosting us in this beautiful land of a thousand hills. We want to thank in person and personally President Kagame for agreeing to have us host this session here today. As we all know, coming out of COVID, very, very difficult to come together. The last time we were together like this was in Victoria Falls. And when we left, barely three weeks after that, the COVID-19 pandemic hit and we have not been able to hold and meet as we have met today. So again, thank you so much to the government of Rwanda. Normally when we come to these gatherings, we start by talking about all the ills that happen on the continent and everything that befalls us. But I think I, I, I'm gonna turn around a little bit and let's talk about some of the big wins that we have had and while, why these big wins are important for us as we go forward. Of course, we meet in the context of COVID-19 in an environment, and somebody has some slides that they're going to put up, in an environment that is very challenging and there has been a lot of concern about where Africa meets and where Africa will begin to move from after the pandemic. The reason we are here today, and this is the best success, and the first one that I would mention as we go forward, is the success that Africa has had on COVID-19. We are here today because we are standing in a country that has vaccinated more than 70% of its population. This is an important fact because Africa will not open and our economies will not recover if we do not vaccinate. The conversations in most forums like this is about vaccine appetite. But when we stand here today, we talk about vaccine success. Rwanda has been able to get the vaccines and Rwanda has been able to use the vaccines. So it is not an impossibility that Africa totally can get the vaccines and use the vaccines. And I think as we continue our conversations and as we talk about meeting Agenda 2030 and how we do that, we must look to our continent for the successes that we want to emulate and that we must demonstrate. However, unfortunately, as we stand here today, when we average and aggregate Africa, and I don't know, there's a slide that's gonna go up somewhere, um, only 17% of Africans are vaccinated. We have about 53% of African countries that have vaccines in country that are not being used. The question then is why not? Is Africa willing to stand apart from the rest of the world as we recover? And we know the answer is no, because we're all here today to talk about how we get to Agenda 2030 and the Africa we want in Af Agenda 2063. So we can win this battle. 
We can win by looking at our neighbors, the seven countries on the continent that have managed to vaccinate, succeeded in vaccinating 70% of their population. And that's the first win that I would like to talk about, or at least put my conversation within. The second one, again, coincidentally, because it was not planned, has Rwanda in its title. And that is the agreement that has been arrived at in Nairobi, which essentially begins to handle plastic and plastic waste. And the Deputy Secretary General just came from Nairobi where this conversation has been raving. When we talk about plastic waste, everybody wonders, why are we worried about plastic waste? What are the numbers? But let me just give you some sense of the statistics again on plastic waste. Plastic production rose from 2 million tons in 1950 to 348 million tons in 2017, becoming a global industry of $522 billion. That's what we're talking about. This is the economy of the plastics industry. This is the economy that two countries in the world managed to say, we need to stop this and we can do it. And those two countries that started that conversation were Rwanda and Peru. So again, Africa is in the news. Africa is winning, and Africa can win. And I think if we remember this, as we talk and manage to steer our way through this difficult quadruple pandemic that we're going through, which is a pandemic of health, of course our economies, climate change, and now today when we all wake up, a war in Europe. We must know that as Africans, if we set our minds to it, all it takes is the first step. I'm sure many years ago when we came to Rwanda and saw that there were no plastics, and those of us who were bringing gifts back uh, to Rwanda in duty-free bags and got stopped at the airport wondered whether this would persist. Mr. President, we must thank you for your leadership. It has persisted. And not only has it persisted, in Rwanda, 200 countries signed the agreement, despite all of the petrochemical industry, a trillion dollar industry, going up against the agreement. I think this is the power of partnerships, which is one of the goals that the AFRSD is talking about. Now the next positive, which again has Rwanda written on it, but Africa and partnerships written on it, is the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement. When we talk about the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement, everybody wonders why are we doing it and how do we get out of the morose that we are in today? And why are we talking about this when we are all suffering, as they say, from a debt burden and we are not able to finance our economies? It is 2022 and Africa is still standing. We have not yet had one African economy go into a full-blown debt crisis. I think when we started the discussions around the COVID-19 pandemic and we were meeting so many times with ministers of finance and minister Uziel, ministers of health, we were all waiting for what was going to be the first African country that will declare insolvency, meaning we, they cannot pay their debt anymore. They cannot meet their internal, international obligations. That has not happened. One of the reasons that has not happened is Africa came together. And in the two years of COVID-19, Africa has traded more with itself than it has in the five years before COVID-19. Essentially because Africa had to rely on itself to begin to trade PPEs. Everybody became an SME PPE producer. The Nigerians were trading across West Africa. The Kenyans were trading across East Africa. The South Africans were taking care of the Southern African market. And the Moroccans and the Egyptians were taking over the North African market. That was Africa at its best. That is the Africa That is the Africa of the CFTA. That is the dream that we all, again, in Kigali, Mr. President, saw come alive as we signed the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement. When we talk about it, I think it seems like a very far off dream and a very far off possibility, but not very far away from Africa in East Asia, which we always look to emulate. During this crisis, East Asia has grown fastest. East, Asia, East Asia's GDP is expected to reach $39 trillion by 2023. They have gone from $33 trillion in 2020 when COVID-19 started. So in the three years of COVID-19, or in the two years of COVID-19, they have actually exceeded the growth of the Americas, of Europe, and of course, of the Middle East. 
This is because they are trading much more with each other. They are trading faster with each other. They have built global supply chains inside East Asia that are allowing them not only to look internally for demand and consumption and savings, but also now to begin to supply the rest of the world as supply chains coming from our traditional partners are being disrupted. Africa can do the same, and Africa must be the same. The Economic Commission for Africa just finished a study that showed that actually for us to leave the dream of the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement, we need about 2.2 million trucks running on our streets, going from Cape to Cairo, going from Dakar to Djibouti. 2.2 million trucks, if two drivers a truck, that's four million jobs we will create with the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement. But then we also need to produce the trucks. In Rwanda, we produce cars, Mr. President, we can produce the trucks. In Morocco, we produce cars. Of course, in South Africa, we produce cars. So Africa does have the ingredients of how to do this. And this is what Agenda 2030 is about. This is why we are standing here today, is what kind of partnership can the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement deliver for us so that we actually get to where we need to get to and create the jobs that need to be created. Of course, as we talk about the SDGs and we talk about education, which is one of the SDGs which we'll be talking about, we start asking ourselves what kind of education. We have been looking a lot at the wars on the continent or on the wars outside the continent. But something has been happening very quietly that we have not seen. I'm sure many of you have not even noticed. In the last three days, huge, massive change in the technology industry. Microsoft acquired an industry called Activision. It's a $200 billion gaming industry. $200 billion. This is where our youth see the future. And also when you say that we are the ones we've been waiting for, we are the ones we've been waiting for with $200 billion. The question, Your Excellency, is still today the policies on our continent do not allow our youth to develop their applications, grow them on the continent, use them on the continent, monetize them on the continent. Every day we have some youth on the continent selling an idea to Google, to Microsoft, or to Cisco. If we continue to do that, what Microsoft has been able to do will never happen on the continent. Waking up one morning and being the largest gaming industry or the largest owner of a gaming industry in the world at $200 billion. With the population Europe has, Africa is going to be the consumer of those games that are being produced by Microsoft. But there are African kids in all of our capitals, in all of our villages that certainly can do that. The question is, under the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement, Your Excellency, can we create a global mutualized setting for African youth? You are in Kigali leading the way with the Innovation Center and the Innovation uh, 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 Port that you're building a free, a free uh, zone. Can we bring together all the intellectual property? Yes, we're all talking about intellectual property for the COVID-19 vaccine. And I think, at the very least, it has done us good because we understand the importance of intellectual property. But intellectual property for our youth is even more important in the digital and technological space. Rwanda today has 34% of its population that has access to the internet. Overall on the continent, we're at about 17%. We can do more, we can do better. Again, by investing in infrastructure, by investing in the broadband that is needed, by investing in access that is needed. That is why we're coming together with ITU, with UN Women, with UNFPA, to see whether we can put in place different centers, digital centers for coding for women in particular, because as we talk about education, we need the women. And women creating their own jobs, creating jobs for themselves, is really what the SDG 14 meeting SDG 5 on gender is about. And we hope, under your leadership, Mr. President, that we will be able to take the continent to that place where every girl on the continent can have access to the internet at affordable prices and deliver, why not, a different Microsoft for the continent at $200 billion uh, a ton. And finally, on climate change as the last point, of this conversation, I just want to thank um, our outgoing chair, and as she hands the baton uh, to our incoming chair of Rwanda, the COP27 is going to be our COP. It is going to be Africa's COP. The other win that we must take to Sharm El Sheikh is not a win that says Africa did not cause climate change or is not responsible for climate change, so somebody needs to help us. It has to be a win that says Africa is sequestering three years of carbon emissions if Africa was not sequestering 
three years of carbon emissions, we would have passed the 1.5 mark by now. Africa is protecting the world, but Africa needs to be compensated justly through market mechanisms. If we get compensated, as Madam Minister has been talking about and has been leading the fight over the last year, not at $5 a ton of carbon, as we are now taking in Kenya and other African countries, but at 50 tons or 75 tons per, per carbon, we can create 360 million jobs. We can get $3 trillion off of our carbon because we are saving the world. This is the victory that Africa needs to take to Shamel Sheikh. We must put a price to carbon because by putting a price to carbon, because we have been good, because we have protected our environment, because we have, and as I close my last uh, um, sentence is as I was landing in Rwanda, and same for most of you, we saw the greenery of the, 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 the villages and the, the rural areas, and I thought, wow, it must be planting season. I'm going to ask for corn. And then I reached and I called the minister and I said, it, must, it is planting season, can I have corn? And he said, no, we, we're not expecting rain. Nobody has planted because this is an unexpected rainfall. So uh, rain is supposed to come in one month and we will only plant in one month. So even as we see it and as we look at our environments around us and they look as if that's how they are meant to be, we are living with climate change and we cannot continue to live with this climate change without asking for the rest of the world to acknowledge we have protected our environment for this long and deserve and not asking, not begging, but deserve and require a market mechanism that would allow us to monetize what we have preserved for the rest of the world in such a way that we can continue to grow our economies. The developed world economies are growing. The East Asian economies are growing. In most of the world, COVID is done. In Africa, we can certainly put COVID to rest by doing three things. One, beginning to vaccinate as we can. Two, beginning to ensure that our youth and our women have access to the technology that COVID has shown us is important to keep our economies open. Three, ensuring that we make the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement a reality in its action because that reality in its action will require the kinds of investments that will make sure that no African country falls into insolvency even as we battle the COVID crisis. And finally, the partnerships. As we battle wars in Ukraine, we know that energy prices are going to go up on our continent, but in some countries they will go up and in others they will go down. A mutual conversation around wheat and where we have more wheat on the continent and where we have less wheat. As we talk today, because the CFTA is not working, there are countries with wheat that's rotting and countries that need wheat that are importing from Ukraine at seven times the price. We are living in a crisis on wheat as we have never seen since 2008. And those of us who were around in 2008 saw the crisis of grain that led to another conflict across the world actually, and particularly in Africa. So we hope that as we talk about partnerships, the last of the, of, of the SDGs that we are really putting as an umbrella on the, all of the rest, life in the sea, education, women, partnerships brings us together, but first partnerships on the continent, and we have the partnership tool in the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement, and we hope that we can use that to deliver not only on the SDGs, but on, on Agenda 2063. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much to you, Executive Secretary of the United Nations Economic Commission on Africa and the Secretary General of the United Nations. And may I just say thank you for all that you are, Dr. Vera Songwe, for women, for the youth, for the entrepreneurs. We see you, we feel your energy, and we're behind you. Thank you. Now, partnerships is the subtext of the statement that's just been made by uh, Vera Songwe. And partnerships won't matter if we don't get the job done. And it's an important segue for our next speaker because the core work that's being done by the president and his team, the president of the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations, ECOSOC, is just that. It's monitoring, evaluation, coordination, and that needs 
pulling together all sides and making sure that everybody is singing from the same hymn sheet. Please, can you welcome warmly this recorded message from His Excellency Colin Gelapile, who's the permanent representative of Botswana to the United Nations and the president of the Economic and Social Council of the UN. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, I am honored to address the eighth session of the Africa Regional Forum on Sustainable Development. I thank the UN Economic Commission for Africa, UNECA, the host country Rwanda, as well as other partners for organizing this very important event. Let me at the outset indicate that the theme of this session, Building Forward Better, a Green, Inclusive and Resilient Africa, poised to achieve the 2030 Agenda and Agenda 2063, perfectly described the path that the region should take as it strives to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic in a sustainable manner. In this connection, let me share a few thoughts on the actions that need to be taken now to achieve this sustainable recovery for the people we serve. First, we must overcome the COVID-19 pandemic by ensuring equitable access to the life-saving vaccines. The current vaccine inequity gap between developed and developing countries is seriously concerning. As we have seen with the emergence of the many variants, if the gap in access to the vaccines is not addressed, the virus will continue to mutate, it will spread and wreak havoc around the world. As it is often said, no one is safe until everyone is safe. As ECOSOC president, I have therefore pledged to utilize the full strength of the Council as well as the high-level political forum on sustainable development, the HLPF, to identify sound policy solutions and promote international solidarity. The high-level segment of ECOSOC this year will address the shortcomings in multilateral cooperation that were revealed by the response to the COVID-19 and efforts to ensure equitable access to the vaccines. The HLPF will also reflect on the kind of recovery that will put us on a path towards achieving the SDGs. Furthermore, I should note that ECOSOC, the General Assembly, and the Secretary General are speaking with one strong voice on this matter and closely coordinating their efforts. On 25th February 2022, the President of the General Assembly held an event on galvanizing momentum for universal vaccination in which I participated to reinforce the key messages. In the same vein, vaccine equity is a recurrent theme in the Secretary General's activities. For instance, the Secretary General's report on our common agenda calls for an immediate global vaccination plan to at least double vaccine production. This is an important call which I also support. We need this kind of ambitious collective action to overcome this pandemic. Vaccine equity will help us overcome COVID-19 and embark in a resilient social and economic recovery that puts us on track to achieve the 2030 Agenda. Secondly, there is a need to ensure that African countries have the adequate fiscal space to finance COVID-19 recovery efforts. Measures need to be taken to mobilize resources from all sources for immediate response, as well as for long-term investments in critical socioeconomic systems and infrastructure. Thirdly, in pursuing the recovery, we must simultaneously address the climate crisis. First action now is needed to prevent the most severe disruptions from climate change. The climate finance commitments that have long been made to African and other developing countries should be honored to enable the necessary climate action to foster resilience and adaptation. And lastly, part of building back better should include decisively addressing the root causes of persistent inequalities within and between countries. 
This includes providing equal economic opportunity, as well as robust social safety nets to vulnerable groups who have borne the full brunt of the pandemic. In conclusion, let me reaffirm ECOSOC's commitment to supporting Africa, which is one of the established priorities of the United Nations system. As part of our contribution, I'm happy to inform you that the President of the General Assembly and I have agreed to jointly convene a special event soon on the development of Africa. We hope the event will bolster the actions towards the 2030 Agenda and the continental vision and aspirations of Agenda 2063. I thank you for your kind attention and I wish you a successful forum. And even though he may be watching virtually New York time, we will say to you in Setswana Reale Boja, Re Gelapile. Now, SDG 5, one of our key focal points at this year's forum, gender equality. And I know when women speak about gender equality, it feels like we're on a soapbox, but the statistics show we have to keep making a noise about it socially and economically. And the reason is because women are the engines of an economy. They contribute 40% in the formal economy and almost 80% in the informal markets. They are running the show. They also weave the fabric of society, the values, the unity, the security in our communities. And I'm really proud to say that our next speaker is somebody who engages the issues of women not as weak, but as able. She speaks for the marginalized. She also lives the truth of SDG 4, sounding at every opportunity the clarion call for better quality education for all people, specifically the girl child. She also says we can't normalize inequality in a world where the rich are getting richer and everybody else is pulling harder and harder we can't say that's okay. That inequality must be dented. You're a champion for social justice across the world, madam. You're a champion for the dignity of the people of Africa. We say to you, you're warmly welcomed. Murakaza Neza to Rwanda. And if we can welcome warmly for her remarks, the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, Amina Mohammed. Thank you, Your Excellency, President Paul Kagame, the Deputy Prime Ministers, Ministers, the President of ECOSOC, our AU Representative, our ABLE Executive Secretary of ECA, Dr. Vera Songwe, uh, the Chair of the Seventh Session. Um, I was just saying to Mr. President that um, with him on the podium amongst three women alone, one might say that he's, a, um, <laughs> he's, a, he's an endangered species, but um, he isn't. I'm going to go to the piece where it says, blessed is he amongst women. So, Mr. President, you're blessed. <laughs> Excellencies, um, colleagues, uh, especially the resident coordinators of the United Nations who gather here in Kigali uh, from all over the continent. Um, and I'd like to make a special welcome to them because they're here to hear and share and, and uh, to further support the continent of Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, really pleased to be with you today for the opening of the African Regional Forum on Sustainable Development. And I want to thank uh, President Kagame, the government and the people for such a warm welcome. And what better a place to get back in person on an issue that is so important to the continent than here in Kigali when so many agreements have been reached and leadership has been shown on the continent and in the world, the latest of which has metamorphosized into a outstanding agreement resolution on plastics. <laughs> Excellencies, we are meeting at a crucial time when our ability to achieve the goals that we set for ourselves in, 20, in 2015 for the 2030 Agenda and Agenda 2063 does hang in the balance. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought havoc on our societies and economies, 
it's also been a big disappointment in terms of solidarity to the continent of Africa. We've seen hunger and poverty increasing as a result for the first time in a generation, and one in two students in Africa suffering learning losses due to the pandemic. Over 700 million people across the continent still have no access to the internet. And there is slow and fragile progress towards gender equality, which risks going in reverse. The climate crisis, biodiversity loss, and pollution are destroying lives and livelihoods at an unprecedented rate. And momentum towards an inclusive and sustainable recovery thwarted by inequalities in access to COVID-19 vaccines and access to finance. In fact, we had the health uh, pandemic hit Africa, but even worse was the socioeconomic impact. Ongoing conflicts and insecurity are also serious obstacles. And now, just when we thought we had an opportunity to begin to recover better, the conflict in Ukraine is further destabilizing and exacerbating the global economy that, that means to recover well. Excellencies, in spite of all that, the 2030 Agenda and the 2063 Agenda and our national development plans together with the most recent Secretary General's report on our common agenda, remain our best blueprints to successfully confront the challenges we face. And Dr. Shongwe mentioned the opportunities that we have to build on what has started to be successes on our continent. This eighth session of the Africa Forum on Sustainable Development presents an important opportunity to focus our energy on implementation and to continue to chart an ambitious path forward. There is solid ground to build on. The fact that we can again meet in Kigali today is a testament to Africa and Rwanda's resilience and the leadership of His Excellency President Kagame and other leaders across the continent. Excellencies, I'd like to highlight five priorities that I believe could help inform our deliberations. First, we must end the acute phase of the pandemic and build resilience against the next outbreak. Through the COVAX facility, the African Union is on its way to securing over half a billion vaccine doses. But despite these tremendous efforts, high-income countries have administered 13 times more doses per person than low-income countries. And vaccinating 70% of the world by July this year still remains our primary objective. And we do have Rwanda to see as a best practice. So there is hope. We must also build stronger and more resilient health systems by investing in primary health care and health surveillance systems, as well as a greater production of vaccines, diagnostics, and treatments. The actions taken by the African Vaccine Acquisition Task Team and national agencies are some of the best steps that have been taken in this regard. In all of this, we'd like to remember and build on the global legacy of Dr. Paul Farmer. His sudden death last month does leave a void in the global health community. And I just wanted to take this opportunity to honor his memory. And I know that he is, is, it is indeed a personal loss to, personal, to President Kagame and the people of Rwanda due to his special bond here and the phenomenal work that he's done in public health contribution to the country. I know from a personal interaction with him on the Friday before he passed, I spoke to him coming out of Haiti. There's a huge hospital there, asking for more of his advice and how we were having, hoping to have the contribution of the continent to the recovery in Haiti. And he spoke about you, President Kagame. He said to me that um, he was expecting when I came this week that we would have coffee. But in the meantime, he had said to the president that he was hungry. And the president said, well, come and have dinner with me this weekend. Your generosity and your friendship, I know, meant so much to Dr. Paul Farmer. Second, we must scale up and speed up investments in the protection of people and ecosystems at the front line of climate crisis. The IPCC report on adaptation released just days ago in Nairobi is a damning indictment of failed climate leadership. Extreme weather is destroying crop yields, eroding food security, and overwhelming our infrastructure. Developed countries must urgently deliver on the commitments that have made since Paris, but also further in COP26 at Glasgow, to double adaptation finance to at least $40 billion a year by 2025 or sooner. Regional and multilateral development banks have to scale up their renewable energy and resilient infrastructure portfolios, and they have to mobilize more private finance. At UNEA in Nairobi, I witnessed the resolve of member states and other stakeholders to tackle environmental issues and other challenges to global governance 
by embracing a more inclusive multilateralism in line with the vision outlined in our common agenda. I hope we can demonstrate similar resolve in support of the Egyptian presidency of the next climate conference, COP27, the Africa COP. Together with COP15 on desification in Abidjan and COP15 on biodiversity, the UN Ocean Conference, and Stockholm Plus 50, we have many opportunities this year to build on a resilient future. Third, we must supercharge the just transitions in energy, in food systems, and digital connectivity. We need a just energy transition that allows Africa to access clean and affordable energy while protecting livelihoods. The Just Energy Transition Partnership that was launched at COP26 to support South Africa set a valuable precedent for international collaboration. We need sustainable and resilient food systems which guarantee access to healthy diets and nutrition for all while trying to restore and protect our nature. The UN Food Systems Summit last September and the creation of food system hubs in Rome are essential steps aimed at supporting countries in this critical transformation. And here again, we see Rwanda take the lead. Agnes Kalibata was our champion who shaped the ambitions of that summit. And so we have high expectations of Rwanda also continuing to lead on the food systems transformations that we need. We also need affordable connectivity and digital skills to create more job opportunities for young people in Africa and around the world. The Internet Governance Forum in Addis Ababa later this year will be an important milestone in this regard. Fourth, we must recover the huge learning losses of the pandemic by advancing education and lifelong learning. Education is the bedrock of all successful economies. Today, however, it is under enormous strain. Rwanda and many other African countries have made great strides in education outcomes. But despite important achievements, conventional education systems everywhere are struggling to equip learners with the knowledge, the relevant skills and values that are needed to thrive in our rapidly changing world. In developing countries especially, the pandemic risks causing a generational catastrophe. And that is why the Secretary General is convening a summit on transforming education in September in New York. The summit will seek to renew our collective commitment to education as a preeminent public good and mobilize the action, the ambition, the solutions and the solidarity that are needed to transform education. I count on African leaders and governments to embrace the summit as a critical opportunity to project forward the education system envisaged under Agenda 2063 and to be the thought leaders of that transformation. Fifth, we need to accelerate gender equality and economic transformation. Over 70% of the people across Africa, the majority of them women, continue to earn their livelihoods in the informal economy, which is an afterthought in economic strategies and metrics today. Robust and decent job creation must be matched by achievement of universal social protection. The Global Accelerator for Jobs and Social Protection, launched last September, is central to these efforts. It aims to create 400 million decent new jobs in the care, green, and digital sectors and expand social protection to half of the global population by 2030. Achieving gender equality and SDG 5 requires ambitious action from all of us. Together, I hope we can implement the five transformative recommendations of the Secretary General, namely repealing all gender discriminatory laws, promoting gender parity in all spheres and at levels of decision making, facilitating women's economic inclusion, and ensuring greater inclusion of the voices of younger women, and following through on an emergency plan, response plan to prevent and end violence against all women and girls. Excellencies, the fate of the Sustainable Development Goals will be decided in Africa. To succeed, Africa must have the financial resources to invest now in a better tomorrow. <clears throat> we are far from where we need to be. Debt to GDP ratios have risen to almost 70%. Today, 17 African countries are at risk of debt distress and four are already in debt distress. The Secretary General has appealed for a serious reform of the international financial architecture, which shamelessly favors rich and punishes the poor. The Economic Commission for Africa's Liquidity and Sustainability Facility is an important partnership with the private sector to increase liquidity for sustainable investments in Africa. But we also need to ensure 
that finance is invested in the real economy. Special drawing rights should be rechanneled to countries most in need and invested in universal social protection, as well as the green digital and healthcare economies. The efforts that have been made by African ministers of finance in partnership with the ECA, we hope will yield, full, will yield some fruit to this. The African continental free trade area can be a game changer for Africa's sustainable development ambitions, but we must have the resources and the investments. There are big returns to be had on the continent of Africa. The goal of $100 billion a year in climate finance must be met starting this year and quickly scaled up. And lest we remind everyone, this is not what we need for climate action. It is the handshake between those that have and those that don't have, those that have been the greater cause of climate and those that have taken the greater burden in ensuring that we will find the billions and the trillions to fund a green and blue economy. Crucially, countries in need must be able to access this money. And that is why we are pushing for urgent reforms on access and eligibility systems. Excellencies, together with the African Union, the repositioned UN development system is mobilizing to deliver expertise, convening power, skill sets, and knowledge. At last week's meeting of the Regional Collaborative Forum platform, we agreed on an ambitious work plan and concrete deliverables. We also committed to support further investments in better data, national data ecosystems, as crucial tools to inform policy, investments, and programs, and to measure the progress towards the SDGs. The challenges ahead are significant, but together we can and we will succeed in building a better future for all Africans in Africa and beyond. The United Nations remains your steadfast partner at this pivotal moment and remains, as always, at your disposal. President Kagame, thank you so much for having us this day. And all thanks to you, Madam Deputy Secretary General. Now, a lot has been said about the gains that Rwanda has made, so there's no need to repeat them. It's a well-documented story. But there was one statistic that wasn't mentioned here today, and I'll mention it. Rwanda has been able to grow the size of its economy by more than 10 times in the last 20 years. That's a significant figure. Because in that growth and acceleration, the country has been able to dent poverty, to empower women and the youth. I'm telling you this because we talk about the sustainable development goals, but essentially Rwanda has lived and breathed the truth of those goals long before they were given a name, long before they were put into a catalog of 17. It's been embedded in the country's vision and in the country's values. President Kagame is credited with a lot of the success together with his team. But if you follow President Kagame on social media, you'll realize that for all this time, his motivation was to empower the people of Rwanda. But in the last two years, there's an added motivation. President Kagame has a very special bond with his baby granddaughter. And it's clear that the legacy he wants to leave behind is for your granddaughter and for her generation. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our host, the President of the Republic of Rwanda, His Excellency Paul Kagame. Excellency Amina Mohammed, Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, Honorable Minister, Aret Suda, Nono Chair of African Regional Forum on Sustainable Development, Dr. Vera Songwe, Executive Secretary of the Economic Commission for Africa, honorable ministers here present, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. Let me start off by confirming uh, what uh, 
Amina Muhammad is said, uh, I want to confirm that I'm very comfortable on the stage here. <laughs> Outnumbered. Uh, one to four, including uh, the moderator in chief. <laughs> and, um, you know, somebody might uh, argue that uh, that's not uh, gender equality. But it is, because I know you'll find out soon that maybe somewhere else on stage, it is just five, women, five men without a woman at all. So if you take one to four here and then uh, five men there, I think it is uh, not a bad uh, balance. I am pleased to join you today uh, to open the eighth session of the African Africa Regional Forum on Sustainable Development. First, allow me to welcome you to Rwanda. We are happy to host you. I also wish to thank the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa under the leadership of the Dr. Vera Songwe for the good work being done to advance <laughs> our continent's development. Over the years, Africa has made significant progress to tackle economic, social economic challenges. However, the COVID pandemic has slowed development gains, and in some cases, reversed that progress that had been made. But we have to look for the silver lining in this crisis. Throughout response, our response, we can build an Africa that is greener and more resilient with the sustainable development goals and agenda 2063 as our blueprint. The truth is that we were off track in achieving these targets even before the pandemic in some cases. Instead of being a setback, pandemic response and recovery can be used as a springboard to speed up progress and innovate smarter ways to invest in human capital development. Allow me to mention three specific actions for your consideration. First, Africa must build mutually beneficial partnerships to strengthen its capacity to manufacture vaccines and pharmaceuticals. The Economic Commission for Africa has been working on this for some time in the context of the Africa continental free trade area. Africa CDC and Alda NEPAD have jointly led the way on the need for the African Medicines Agency, which has now come into force. 
And last year, Africa and CDC brought together key stakeholders in the partnership for African vaccines manufacturing. This initiative laid the groundwork for BioNTech's commitment to produce mRNA vaccines end-to-end -end in Ghana, Senegal, and Rwanda, starting later this year. Second, Africa should prioritize domestic resource mobilization to finance its development, particular for national health systems. Progress has already been made for domestic health financing on our continent, and we should build on this momentum. Lastly, to support Africa's green growth, the African continental free trade area should be used to promote the adoption of sustainable technologies and infrastructure. To achieve the SDGs and Agenda 2063, the goals need to be integrated in our national planning framework, frameworks, and it won't happen on its own. It is essential to have strong mechanisms to monitor progress and quickly adjust implementation. I commend this forum for showcasing the benefits of voluntary national and subnational reviews. Building the Africa we want is up to us. We have to own and lead the process and support one another. That's why these two development agendas are so important. It's about ensuring the stability and prosperity of our continent so that our young people can have the future they deserve. I hope that your deliberations in the coming days will set the tone for Africa's position ahead of the high-level political forum on sustainable development. Before I end my remarks, once again, I want to thank you, Deputy uh, Secretary General of the UN, Dr. Amina Mohammed, for your contribution to this continent and through the UN to the global community on many agendas that uh, were mentioned earlier. And thank you for your presence here. Once again, I thank all of you for gathering here in our capital, feel at home, and come back very often. I thank you for your kind attention. Mr. President, Mora Kozi, merci, and thank you very much. At this stage, I would like us all to be upstanding so that we can give the President and the delegation on stage an opportunity to leave for a group photograph.
we've already made announcements as to how uh, the group photograph, the protocol around it will take place. Just remember, the excellencies will leave and then the ministers who have been invited to participate in that uh, photograph, please follow the instructions of the protocol officials. With that, the opening statements for the opening ceremony of the eighth session of the Africa Regional Forum on Sustainable Development has been concluded. We will have a short interval with the group photograph and then we'll proceed with the high level panel. Thank you all very much for your time. Thank you all for your kind cooperation. You may take your seats. We'll continue with the program in a short while as we make preparation for the high level discussion on building better and funding it too.
two, four, five. No, it's fine. So ladies and gentlemen, if I may ask you to please take your seats and if you need a comfort break to please take this opportunity for one, we will be resuming with our program for the day in about five minutes time. Five minutes time, so if you could start taking your seats, those who need a comfort break, please take one now. In less than five minutes, we'll be resuming. Thank you.
that's it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your patience. Um, I think we just got our timings a little bit all right. We had thought that the photo op would not take so long, but it did. And I think some of our colleagues then decided to do more than have a comfort break, just get themselves a snack. That's all right, all is well. We are ready to continue with the morning's program, albeit um, at midday. And this is the high level panel on building better, building for the future, where we're going to be talking about opportunities to unlock funding for building for the future. And of course, with this particular focus on those five goals that we'd mentioned earlier on. So if I may ask you all to make your way back to your seats. And I know that the ushers are helping us get the rest of our colleagues back into the room so that we can have that high level discussion with our experts who have uh, joined you in Rwanda to share their knowledge and expertise and um, livable examples. And thereafter, only thereafter, will we adjourn for lunch. Thank you.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. First and foremost, thank you so very, very much for your patience. And also thank you for making it back after your very long comfort breaks. We're now ready to continue with um, the program for the first half of the day, which is a high-level panel on unlocking the financing that's required to build better and build for the future. But before I introduce to you our panelists, I'd like us all to witness and observe an important moment, an historic moment, with the signing of a commitment, a memorandum on carbon financing and carbon cooperation between the Republic of Congo and the Republic of Rwanda, also with the cooperation and support of the UNECA. And so without further ado, allow me to please invite onto stage the chair of the seventh session of the Africa Regional Forum. Um, we heard from her earlier on. It is Minister Nono from the Republic of Congo, who will be joined on stage by the Minister of Finance here in Rwanda, Minister Ndagajimana, and also the Executive Secretary of the UNECA to witness the signing and reiterate her support, the Executive Secretary Vera Song. Right, we'll be signing in just a short while. Uh, and just to remind you, the signing precedes the high-level panel on unlocking financing for building better and building for the future, preceded by a signing of a memorandum of understanding a commitment on carbon financing and carbon cooperation between the Republic of Congo and the Republic of Rwanda. Okay. All right, so just by way of an introduction as we wait for all systems clearance and to go. Earlier on, we mentioned how the SDG on climate change was an important one for the African continent, but for the world at large, simply because Africa is very much at the epicenter of the climate change phenomenon, as we heard, uh, and also because so many issues around mitigation and adaptation affect African economies, African farmers, African communities. And so with this memorandum on climate financing, it's really to reiterate the support to fund and support initiatives that will enhance uh, just transitions on the African continent, green financing, and creating fresh opportunities economically along the green and uh, uh, green uh, value chain and also in the reduction of carbon emissions. This is an issue central and important to the African continent merely because as a resource-rich uh, continent, we are so much at the uh, front line of the struggle and this battle. And this is a commitment to say not only are we putting words to paper, but we are also putting our monies where our mouths are. And so with an indication that we're ready, we can commence with the signing ceremony. I'd like to invite the Honorable Minister of Environment of Congo to join us on stage with the Honorable Minister of Finance from Rwanda and the Executive Secretary of the UNECA. Your Excellencies, Ministers, so thank you very much, dear colleagues, for bearing with us, and we apologize for these technical delays. The memorandum that is being signed is a recognition, first of all, that Africa is one of the countries, is one of the continents that is the most affected by climate change. In consequence, Africa also needs the most resources to be able to build that resilience in the long term. To be able to do so, Africa needs to mobilize more resources, and in particular, there is an opportunity for 
raising of financing using Africa's natural heritage. We've heard about the Congo Basin, and that is the second lung of the world after the Amazon. And in this memorandum, the uh, two countries that are the successive chairs of the African Regional Forum on Sustainable Development are asking the United Nations system through the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa to upscale the work that we are doing on uh, carbon financing and in particular moving towards the certification of, uh, towards assisting countries for the certification on carbon pricing so that African countries can more easily access international carbon offset markets and be able to use their natural heritage such as the Congo Basin to raise, raise large amounts of financing that can be invested to achieve the sustainable development goals. We heard earlier from uh, Minister Arlette Soudan-Leno uh, of this opportunity. The Executive Secretary also mentioned this opp opportunity and we are delighted to have the two ministers asking formally the ECA to continue this work and to take this message also to COP27, which will be held in Sharm el-Sheikh in Egypt. So, Your Excellencies, uh, we invite you to sign the MOU. Merci beaucoup, Vos Excellences. Merci beaucoup. Nous avons entendu le président Kagame dire qu'il faut mobiliser des financements en Afrique pour les Africains. C'est un mécanisme qui nous permet d'aller dans ce sens. Thank you very much, Your Excellencies. I will hand back to Lorato for the continuation of the high-level panel. Ah, mais j'ai un problème. I'm speaking French. I'm not, not going to like to speak in English. Do not understand me. They have four microphones here. You have I two? Okay. Uh, it's mine. Yeah, thank you. Mesdames et messieurs, bonsoir. Vous m'excusez. Hein? Moi, je, je, je suis plus à l'aise en parlant français. Euh, J'aurais voulu simplement euh, vous expliquer un peu euh, ce que c'est que ce MOU que nous avions signé. C'est dans le cadre des, des changements climatiques, mais précisément dans le cadre de la, des procédures de l'accessibilité au financement carbone. Tout ce qui est quantification, tout ce qui est certification. 
et pourquoi nous avons frappé à la porte de ce grand partenaire qui est la CEA dans ce sens-là tout simplement pour, puis on est nombreux, il y aura l'Union africaine, puisque moi qui coordonne la commission climat du bassin du Congo avec les 16 autres pays membres, nous, nous sommes une institution de l'Union africaine et nous collaborons avec la CEAC, tous les outils de gouvernance que nous avons dans la sous-région. Mais là, nous avons besoin vraiment de l'accompagnement et l'expérience de la commission économique pour l'Afrique. Et le bassin du Congo, qui inclut le Rwanda, aujourd'hui, je l'ai dit tout à l'heure dans mon discours, nous devenons le premier réservoir carbone au monde, pratiquement, le deuxième, le premier, pour une simple raison. Vous connaissez les forêts du bassin du Congo qui séquestrent pas moins de 1,5 milliard de CO2, donc de carbone. Mais il y a une découverte, une découverte récente qui s'est faite entre la République démocratique du Congo et la République du Congo, mon pays, sur une superficie de pas moins de 165 000 carrés, la découverte de ce qu'on appelle les tourbières, en anglais, sont des pitlands. Autant les forêts séquestrent 1,5 milliard de CO2, mais rien que ces, ces tourbes du bassin du Congo séquestrent à elles seules 31 milliards de tonnes de carbone. Et aujourd'hui, si nous voulons atteindre euh, les objectifs de l'accord de Paris hein, qui nous demande le maintien de la température à 1,5 de, degré et que cette sonnette d'alarme est régulièrement tirée par le GEC qui a encore récemment sorti son rapport parce que moi je viens du PNUE où nous sommes en session, hier on a fait les délibérations tout ce qui est sur la biodiversité et autres et le bassin du Congo là également c'est un chiffre astronomique nous, 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 nous portons en notre sein pas moins de 10% de la biodiversité mondiale aujourd'hui de la planète. Et donc il est urgent de pouvoir lever des économies qui nous permettent simplement d'aller à un développement euh, 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 intégral. Lorsque l'on parle des 17 objectifs de développement durable, cette transition écologique, cette transition énergétique, oui, mais il nous faut des ressources. Malheureusement, depuis Copenhague, les 100 milliards prévus, nous ne les avons pas. Et malheureusement, euh, il nous faut nous restaurer, il nous faut nous développer. Et donc, il nous faut trouver des moyens d'une économie de substitution pour nous permettre tout simplement d'éviter ces différents exodes, ces immigrations que vous voyez, parce que certains pensent à ce moment-là que l'herbe peut être plus verte ailleurs, et pourtant nous avons la ressource naturelle qui est au centre aujourd'hui de toute économie, l'économie verte et l'économie bleue. Donc nous avons besoin du soutien de tous, c'est par là que je terminerai, pour accompagner et soutenir le bureau qui est porté par la présidence aujourd'hui du Rwanda, qui nous permettra avec le président Kagame et le président Denis Sassou Nguesso, de porter ce MOU sur un niveau beaucoup plus élevé pour nous permettre d'atteindre les objectifs attendus dans le cadre de cet MOU. Je vous remercie. So I think they deserve an applause. I see a ginger applause. We can give them a rousing applause. Thank you very much to the outgoing chair. It's now time for us to have our high-level uh, panel discussion on unlocking financing to build better, to build for the future in pursuance of the Sustainable Development Goals and some of the things that have been spoken about here in terms of carbon financing and the opportunities that exist. So please allow me to introduce to you our panelists for this particular session. Um, and let me also just remind you that it is partially um, hybrid as well. Without further ado, may I introduce to you 
the Deputy Executive Secretary and Chief Economist of the UNECA, Hanan Morsi, who will join us on stage. Before you come up, uh, Executive ES, let me call up the other panelists as well. We also have the Under Secretary General of the United Nations and a Special Advisor on Africa, Christina Duarte, will be joined by the Chair of this session, the Minister of Finance and Economic Planning for Rwanda, Uziel Ndagajimana. We also have the Chief Economist and Director of Research and Cooperation at Efrexum Bank, the uh, African Export and Import Bank, uh, Dr. Hippolyte uh, Forfag. We're joined online briefly by uh, Dr. Mohammed Suleiman Al Jassa, who's the President of the Islamic Development Bank. And we're also joined virtually by the Chief Executive Officer of Adunik Organics, Olamide uh, Badebo. So if I may ask our panelists to join us for our conversation, please. Okay, you go. Let me just count the chairs. One, two, three. There we go. And you all have your microphones. Thank you. So again, a warm applause for our experts, our panelists, who are going to share with us so much knowledge. And we thank you for your time. And I thank you for your patience as well. Just a reminder that... Our focus today is on uh, five key goals. Goals number five on gender equality, goal number four on a quality education, uh, goals 14 and 15 on life below water and life on land, and goal 17 on partnerships. And whilst we will speak generally, broadly, but this is really um, the message we want to reiterate is into the year ahead, these will be priority areas and building on the work already achieved, just as we've heard on new green uh, solutions and carbon financing. Without further ado, I think what I'd like to do, because he is online and we don't want uh, technology to disappoint us, I'm going to defer, if I may, to the President of the Islamic Development Bank, His Excellency Dr. Mohammed Sulman Al Jasser who will just share with us a few thoughts on the topic of unlocking finances to build better and to build for the future. And also for him generally to give us a sense of um, the work that is being done by the Islamic Development Bank. So if I may, I yield the floor to you, Dr. Mohammed Sulman Al Jasser. So, uh, Dr. Al Jassa, I wonder if I can interrupt you there, sir. We are battling to hear your sound. We can definitely see you. And I'm not sure whether it's a function of unmuting your button or us patching in the sound. But if I can get an indication that we are going to address that, please. All right, what I will do is just make an executive decision as the moderator here whilst we're fixing the sound, and I'll be told in due course whether or not we can fix that. Let us begin with our panelists who are here with me. I'm going to start with you, Honorable Finance Minister of Rwanda, one, because you are the session chair for this high-level discussion, two, you are our host, and three, so many wonderful things have been said about what Rwanda has accomplished by way of meeting so many of the sustainable development goals. Perhaps you could tell us how you've gone about it, because for many African nations, it's not, it's not so much the commitment, it's the capacity, the implementation. Tell us about your best practice. Your microphone is on. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, Maybe I can put my intervention in two phases. One is the pre-pandemic, 
The other one is during the pandemic. So I think uh, what the government of Rwanda has achieved before the pandemic has helped us to respond uh, well to the challenge of COVID-19 and uh, to sort of try to recover from uh, the impact of COVID-19. The COVID-19 pandemic found us with uh, a health system that, that works, of course with some uh, room for improvement. It found our governance system uh, decentralized, reaching every village, every citizen. Uh, it found us with uh, already uh, an integrated planning system and institutional uh, setup and uh, strong coordination between institutions and also a communication system. Uh, then we had invested before in the ICT technologies by uh, deploying uh, the hard infrastructure across the country and by developing some, uh, a number of public services uh, online. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, schools were not ready for online uh, teaching and learning, but all other services could be offered uh, online. So all this uh, uh, progress has helped us really to come together quickly and uh, to prepare ourselves as the pandemic was uh, expanding, spreading from China to other regions. So when our, case, our first case arrived on the 14th of March, 2020, right. the teams, the systems, everything was ready to, right. to, 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 to resist somehow. Now, during the pandemic, of course, there's several challenges, economic challenges, the resources. We did our best to use uh, existing uh, partnership we have to maximize on the uh, available uh, concession loans. We have expanded uh, uh, our partnership by adding new uh, lenders like the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank where we could mobilize $200 million, half for IT accelerator project and half for economic recovery fund. We adopted a comprehensive uh, response uh, uh, to COVID-19, including the social component, agriculture component, infrastructure component to create jobs. And uh, also we created a, a special fund, an economic recovery fund to support the most affected businesses. All these measures put together, and also we're really in good coordination with all our development partners community here in Kigali. We work together in the planning. We work together through the implementation. And uh, despite the decline uh, on our, of our economy, 3.4, neg negative 3.4% 2020, now 2021 was really the start of the recovery. And we're expecting to have uh, almost about 10, 20, 10.2% yeah. growth. We have vaccinated our people to a good uh, yeah. rate, and we continue to yeah. deploy the vaccine to reach everyone eligible for vaccination. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing um, that experience, but um, I also think we need to temper um, the disappointment that you mentioned with the fact that almost every country in the world has experienced negative or contractions in their economy. So it's not unique to Rwanda, it is a part of the circumstance. And thank you for sharing with us the extent to which there's been some fiscal depth because one of the things we will have all observed flying into Rwanda are the mandatory PCR tests, but the fine print says for all Rwandan citizens, those are subsidized. And that speaks to not just commitment, but fiscal depth as well. I'd like to focus on the topic at hand as it applies to the goals that have been mentioned, and I'm staying with you, Minister Uziel Ndagajimana, which is goals 14 and 15, life below water and life on land. And I'm posing these two goals to you in particular because this is a largely agrarian economy, but it's also a country whose topography 
has a lot of waterways. And so when we talk about preparing for the future and preserving our natural heritage, our environment and biodiversity, as per the memorandum that you signed earlier on, how would you go about doing it in pursuance of these two goals, life below water and life on land? Thank you. There's no uh, sustainable development without tackling those two issues. We are not a coastal country, but we have uh, also our role to play. Uh, we have lakes, we have rivers, and we have mountains, as we have seen. And uh, they are beautiful to see, but they are also vulnerable to disasters. We experience every year uh, landsliding or flooding, but we have done a significant effort to prevent soil erosion by uh, afforestation activities. Currently, our forest cover is close to 30% of total land. And that was our target, but we need to, to, to do more. We have uh, tree planting activities. We have uh, 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 policies on uh, forest management. We, our target is to improve uh, forest management by contracting professional managers. And uh, we, our target is to, to privatize forest management at 80% by, by 2024, in three years time. Thank you. All right, we'll continue on that tack. I'd like to move on to goal number five, gender equality. And I'm not asking you the question because you're a woman, but because you are a powerful, accomplished woman, economist, former finance minister, Christina Duarte. Let us talk about the all-important goal number five and what it means to you and transformation of African countries, gender equality. Uh, thank you. Uh, we'll... Uh it will be a pleasure to respond to your question, <laughs> but then I would like to have the opportunity to respond to the questions of the I-Level panel. No financing, unlocking financing, That's because fine. I believe this is our challenge today. Uh, human in Africa, because they have been, let's say, sidelined, from a GDP standpoint, the opportunity cost has been measured as $60 billion a year. So, gender parity is, goes beyond social fairness, goes beyond human rights, Go, goes beyond to be the, the, in the, the right side of the world. As we speak today, is a critical key success factor in delivering macroeconomic growth and macroeconomic stability in Africa. And the only way to overcome this challenge is to change our mindset. I think we need to stop linking automatically women to microcredit. Because this is a way to corner women in a path that does not translate in expansion trajectory. So we need to understand that women in Africa needs to start getting access to assets. Only by owning assets, you can structure an expansion trajectory. For example, I always give this example, access to land, for example. So, and, and, and not just access to land, it's the title deed, it's the tenure and the right to use that land. Um, yes. I know you're in a hurry to get to the high level topic but I just want us to get a sense of why it's important for us to focus on the goals that define session number eight. So let me defer to you, uh, 
Deputy Executive Secretary of the UNECA, and ask you, Hanan Morsi, the importance of Goal 17, the goal for partnership. Why does that matter? And the UNECA and the role that you play is so instructive of bringing together so many multilaterals. I think your uh, microphone is working. Thank you very much. Um, well, you know, the, I think it comes really back to the topic of this, as you know, have just been said. Uh, the, the partnership, you know, uh, works best or comes when you are facing huge challenges. Yeah. And basically what the continent has to deal with are huge challenges and even before the pandemic. Yeah. Um, you know, it, we have uh, um, huge challenges in terms of the needs of infrastructure financing. There is, you know, a need of 130 to 100 and 270 billion US dollars just to meet the infrastructure years need a year. Uh, we had already, uh, um, you know, uh, needs in terms of education of 60. Six billion U.S. dollars. Uh, we have needs in health. Uh, we have ne financing needs to meet the SDGs. And what the pandemic did, actually, the worst uh, uh, or the most worrying impact of the pandemic has been the regression of uh, very hard-won gains that have been achieved over the last two decades. So, um, the, given the magnitude of the challenges, this cannot just be met by governments alone. Governments need the partnership of the private sector, the partnership of international players, um, the partnership of international organizations, including the United Nations and ECA and multilateral development banks. And this is really like how you get through to meeting these challenges. Um, and there has been uh, many, you know, many examples. I mean, during the during this crisis, um, you know, the through partnership, uh, there has been, uh, you know, the, uh, at a global level, the attempts with the G20 to do the debt suspension, uh, um, service suspension initiative, to do reforms to the common framework. The, there has been also partnership with, between ECA and um, Africa Bank on doing platforms to help with the challenges in pharmaceutical. Uh, there has been many very uh, um, good examples of uh, in, you know, multi-stakeholders coming together, yeah. you know, in time of crisis to, and in to meet challenge, huge challenges that the continent uh, faces. But probably we can go back after we tackle the main issue on how exactly right. this is, can be done better. And that context is important because in a global and multilateral world, um, where multilateralism has really been questioned, those partnerships are really important. Let me bring into the conversation uh, Dr. Hippolyte uh, Fofak from the African, uh, African Export Import Bank, Africsum Bank. And let's start talking about unlocking capital, deploying capital. Your microphone is working. And how much money is really needed? Are you comfortable? Yes, I am. Okay. So let's talk about what's really needed. So many figures that are often bandied about. When we talk about climate solutions, we hear about $100 billion that's been pledged. It needs to be unlocked from pledges into bankable projects. When we talk about infrastructure, we hear similar figures per annum. Um, when we talk about soft infrastructure, schools, healthcare, what is needed to make projects bankable? We hear that all the time. Money that's not just sitting in commitments, but that can be rolled out. No, thank you um, very much. I think, uh, let me, before we get to, into it, on behalf of uh, President Rama, to really thank UNECA for organizing such a timely event, quite frankly, and very in particular for uh, really uh, this topic. We believe that this is a critical topic, not just because of the challenge facing the regions, historical challenges that uh, you mentioned, but also in terms of timeliness, I think we are hosting this event, this topic in particular, at a very critical time, in the sense that we've seen 
increasingly a shift, a pivot at global level of really systemically important central bank, the ECB, the Fed, the Bank of England, shifting toward tightening monitoring policy in response to inflation fighting mode. And I think that will have significant implications in terms of cost of funding for Africa, in terms of global volatility, in terms of capital flows and so forth. So in addition to looking at historical issues, which you mentioned, the infrastructure and climate financing, climate change mitigations, we are actually entering a trajectory where accessing funding will be even more difficult at a time where the challenge facing the region are actually even more important. So it is a very timely topic. I'd like to really thank you for putting this forward. Now, going back to your key questions, but what does it take to actually deliver a project? I think financing is one angle that is actually very much emphasized when we have clients coming to us, always oh, it's about financing, financing. But we did realize recently that when it comes to major infrastructure project, the key issue is what you raised, the issue of bankability. Do we actually have bankable project on the table that we can finance if we really wanted to? And it's hard to say that it's not always the case. I think in the infra space, the key concern actually to put together bankable project. And that's why a couple of years ago, two, three years ago, uh, Africa Sim Bank decided to launch what we call a PPF, a project preparation facility, to ensure that we have good project on the table that we can finance, that we have good project on the table that we can actually comfortably use our convening power partnership to mobilize more investors, bankers, institutions to come to the table for risk sharing and bearing so that we can actually deliver on this project. I think that's what I would like to say when it comes to really bankability. I think it's been proven now that where we have project preparation facility in place, yeah. deliver it faster, but it's also help a lot in terms of maintenance of this infrastructure to ensure that the return over the time horizon it's sustainable over time. Thank you. Thank you for that. And you've obviously pointed us to the very real macro challenges that exist in the world right now. Global inflation, rising prices, oil prices, complicated obviously by the situation um, unfolding in the Ukraine and in Russia. What are going to be issues of liquidity? this year? I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying you're a soothsayer, you'll know it, but what are the things that governments ought to be thinking about when we look at where the money will come from and whether or not it really will be there by way of liquidity in this year, given some of the challenges that have already been outlined and given the fact that we are still very much in the grips of a global pandemic and managing all these uh, uh, competing interests? Lerato, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I will respond to your question uh, from an African policy-making standpoint mm -hmm. because my, uh, you have two panelists the, from the banking and financial sector that I'm sure that they can bring the technocratic side of the problem because this problem, financing for development, uh, should be approached from an African policy-making standpoint and also. Let me start just providing some numbers because liquidity crisis is just the tip of an iceberg. And if we, and if we do not understand a little bit the size of the iceberg, we'll miss the picture. And everybody knows that Africa loses $88 billion in illicit financial flows on an annual basis. By the end of today, Africa had lost only today 
240 million dollars. When we finish our working session, let me say our talking session, Africa has lost 240 million dollars. During the time of this conference, five days, Africa had lost 1.2 billion dollars. And in a couple of months, June, the, is the deadline where Africa will be called to pay 60 billion dollars when we reach the debt relief facility deadlines. So, um, I can jump, we could discuss liquidity from a short-term standpoint, the tools, the instruments, and my friend Fofak mentioned a couple of them. But these numbers indicate clearly something that if you do not address, liquidity will be with us forever. That the international architecture finance and international trade finance are just not configured for Africa. They work, you need to say this in a very open way, they work against us. And if of us don't take this as a starting point, any liquidity solution will not solve the problem in the same way that relief facilities have not solved the problem. So I'd like, allow me, Lerato, very quickly to put on our desks here, on our conversation, five issues that I believe are important to address. Liquidity, short-term issues, but the, co the root causes of financing for development in Africa. Because we reach a point after COVID-19 that we need to address the root causes. Cosmetic will no longer work. First, to recognize that our mindset needs to be tuned with urgency and emergency. From a financing standpoint, we have no more time. No more time. More, more, we have no more time. We need to tune our mindset to urgency and emergency. We are going to lose 1.2 billion. However, in a couple of months, we need to put on the table 60 billion. Second, to recognize that, and President Kagame said it today, I was so happy. Second, to recognize that despite the fact that domestic resources are not enough to bridge the gap, they need to be in the driver's seat to determine our path, our direction. Third, to recognize the multiplier effect of domestic resource mobilization. It goes beyond a financial accounting issue. It's, just to, it's, it's not only to calculate it, how much we receive from the external world, the gap, and the DRM just bridge the gap. DRM, uh, DRM systems, because we, it's a system, domestic resource mobilization should be addressed as a system. And DRM systems, they are crucial for policy space. The only way to get policy space, and we know, my dear brother, if you have a strong DRM system, if you want to control your economic flows, your financial flows, you need a strong DRM system. To manage the the, the country risk profile, the B's and the A's and the outlooks, you need a strong DRM system. And, of course, the, the risk of the SDGs. Fourth item that I think is important to address unlocking financing in Africa. To recognize the power of strong country systems and strong institutions in supporting Africa to stop having the weak position in the negotiation table. We always, when you sit in a negotiation table, always you have the weak position. And DRM systems, as we speak, are a key success factor to change this. And I can give you an example. Later on, the climate. 
change table. You have a weak position, and this is linked to our weak DRS systems. The last one, but not the least. Strong ownership of national resources and flows as a lever to increase external financing with appropriate interest rates and maturities. With me, what I want to say, good external finance, not, not a 10-year zero bond with a 10% interest rate to finance current, current expenditures. But good external finance starts with a strong DRM system. Why? Because strong DRM systems is the, is the key to build credibility, trust. And credibility and trust is critical to get, um, uh, to get uh, I, I would say, uh, an important, an important uh, or a good external, external, external financing. So, I do believe that to get, to be in power in the global stage, Africa needs to look inside. Africa needs to look domestically. Because only by being strong domestically, mm -hmm. you'll be in a position to claim mm -hmm. your right position in the global table. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that's a very powerful intervention. And uh, it also applies to citizens. If, if we believe that the resources that we are obligated to put back into the system by way of taxes and, and the like, if those are being used for the greater good, it's easier to support um, the broader vision. Hanan, I'd like you to bring you into the conversation here and go back to what Minister Ndagajimana had mentioned about you know, the pre-COVID world and the COVID world, which technically we're still involved in, and how much was needed in the response. And in the case of many African nations, it's led to taking out more debt. And so, as we talk about a post-COVID recovery, the starting point is going to be of heavy indebtedness and something we should really think of overcoming because the challenges are beyond just paying back loans. And so there is a liquidity and sustainability facility. How is it going to help? Thank you. Uh, indeed, so uh, COVID, as, as we mentioned, came, um, you know, it, it, even before COVID, we were facing these enormous fi financing needs uh, at multiple levels. Uh, and then uh, when COVID hit, uh, you know, uh, governments had to increase their fiscal spending to be able to help and mitigate the socioeconomic impact of the crisis, which actually led to, uh, on average, the fiscal deficits in the continent doubling for debt levels, um, you know, sharply increasing from around 60% between 2017 and 19 to um, more than 70%. Uh, by last year. Uh, so this uh, uh, also um, came on the background actually of uh, an evolution in the composition and debt structure. So over the last two decades, uh, the debt that the continent uh, had incurred has shifted from the concessional type of uh, borrowing to more commercial, to more private, and to new, um, uh, basically, sources and uh, uh, bilateral borrowing like China. Um, and uh, um, all this, basically, like all the needs for COVID, have, uh, have basically exacerbated the fiscal and debt situation. Uh, not only that, but in the next um, five years, uh, there will be, uh, uh, you know, a, a huge amount of um, external debt repayments that are due in the continent, a huge wall of them. Uh, and at the same time, we have a, a global environment where inflation has been increasing, which led many central banks to actually raise interest rates, which actually mean for the continent that the cost of debt is even going to go higher it's going to be more difficult to roll over debt in international capital markets. Uh, and 
you know, cost a lot more. So um, there has been, uh, uh, of course, a call in terms of, you know, uh, what the continent uh, needs and what can do. Uh, you know, there has been the progress, as we mentioned, on the G20 and the DSSI and common framework. However, this has been more uh, toward countries that are low, uh, low-income countries, develop, more developing countries, where are the ones that are middle-income countries, and there are many in the continent, that are also very vulnerable. Uh, and um, they have been, you know, uh, had huge... Uh, uh, um, uh, made huge progress in their ability and gaining credibility in tapping international capital markets. However, the tools that are available for these countries are very limited. Um, so here comes the, you know, the, this liquidity sustainability facility. What it tries to do is to find ways for actually um, creating this uh, repo market to lower the cost of um, tapping international capital markets for the continent. I think this is a space that has not been tackled within the uh, current uh, global financial architecture, uh, so that no one is, no country is left behind. Because vulnerability, yes, we have vulnerable low-income countries, but there are countries which have a lot of vulnerability because of, say, you know, the high level of inequality, uh, you know, the, the high levels of poverty, even actually in, um, you know, high and uh, high level uh, income and middle level income countries within the continent. So it would be really key to pay attention to such facilities so that the global financial system is not leaving anyone behind. At the same time, I just wanted to add something to the earlier discussion. A, a very important issue for African countries is having a unified voice to be in, on the table. Just country by country, we cannot move the needle. If we want to move the needle on global uh, financial architecture, we have, we have to come to the table as a unified voice. And we've seen that work, for example, with, uh, you know, uh, when, when the um, African finance ministers unified their voice for China to actually you know, bleach for the reallocation of the SDR. This happens, so we need to actually encourage more of these uh, unified voices right. to make change happen. If I was to just challenge a little bit of what you've just said in the last one, it's all good and well to stand and speak with a unified voice externally. What about internally? You have some of the larger African countries, and it was referred to earlier on with the issue of illicit funds, is that you actually do have some modicum of liquidity in the local domestic economy, particularly within the private sector. We've got countries where the private sector is sitting on billions in reserve, but they won't unlock it because the business confidence is not there. And so the question is, Africans believing enough in Africa to unlock their own resources. You've raised a very important issue. Of course, there are, uh, uh, I mean, a big role to doing more domestically, um, you know, across the continent. Um, I've always said before, you know, we have, given the limited resources, our biggest challenge is to get the highest returns for what we have. So, you know, at, at, a, at a policy maker's level, it's about increasing efficiency, it's about reducing leakages, in terms of the domestic environment, it's about building trust. It's about having an enabling environment for the private sector. Uh, so this is really what will drive it. It's about the government becoming an enabler rather than a competitor. So there is you know, a lot of things that need to be done, but yes, there are, and there are also regulation issues. So like one of the things that actually elude what you're, you were mentioning is uh, the, all the uh, funds in uh, pension funds in the continent. Uh, however, in many countries, uh, the existing regulatory framework does not allow for these pension funds to even consider the investment options within the continent. So we have a long way to go in terms of fixing the systems and the incentives within the system. Fair point uh, on prescribed assets. 
Minister of Finance, Rwanda, Minister Ndagachimana, you know, we speak about the pre-COVID world, the COVID world. Let us imagine the post-COVID world. And with 70% of your population vaccinated, you're almost there in the post-COVID world. And the kind of funding and financing that's going to be needed for building better, because that's also part of the topic, is you may find the money, but after that you've got to do things better as African nations. What does that mean to you? Thank you. Uh, in relation to what I said earlier, we need to have uh, strong solutions and systems that allow the efficient utilization of resources available and also the capacity to mobilize uh, more resources. Uh, in your case, for example, in 2020, when we were faced uh, by huge demand to respond to COVID-19 in the context of declining uh, uh, economy and uh, domestic resources also affected, so the only option was to, to look outside, but prudently. Uh, of course, the pre-COVID uh, debt situation matters. We had a comfortable situation because we, have, uh, we had a low level uh, uh, of debt uh, and we, st we had uh, available concession loans with our different partners. So the first move was to, to exhaust the available concessional uh, resources with the World Bank, African Development Bank, European Investment Bank, uh, different uh, partners like uh, Ofid, Badea. We really we mobilize all the available resources. We exhaust the available concessional windows, but for really for targeted uh, priorities, uh, being the immediate re response to immediate uh, needs uh, for COVID management, but also medium and long and long term, everything aligned with our uh, long term vision. Uh, so we even expanded uh, our partnership. We, like the French Development Agency, we, 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 we tapped into the opportunity, very concessional loans for health, for energy. We went to Asia, we mobilized money for ICT, for Economic Recovery Fund. We entered the Euro, Euro bond as well. We raised Euro bond, but with two objectives. The biggest part of it, uh, was used to refinance existing expensive loans to keep our debt at sustainable level, and but we had a balance to invest in key priorities for economic recovery. So we had a, a euro bond worth 400 million. 85% was refinanced by a new, cheaper bond because the previous one was about six, close to 7%, and we were able to raise a bond at 5.5. So we, this was used at 85% to refinance the existing bond, and we kept some money to, to pay the balance when it will be due next year. We also refinanced fully 100% another expensive loan that we had contracted for our airline, and we, ha we had a balance of about 150 to be invested in the export-oriented uh, projects that we generate more forex for also debt servicing. So we also observed that the investment made in the managing COVID-19 has allowed us to, to progressively uh, uh, relax uh, health measures and uh, most of business activities have restarted. Then we can, we can observe a, a, a now a recovery process uh, taking place. So we are optimistic for this year to have a good growth. Unfortunately, there is a new uh, factor, the U Ukraine crisis and its impact on our economies is, is, is a threat. We are trying to estimate how this will impact uh, our import bills and the, or the inflation. So, but otherwise, things were moving in the, in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you for that. Before we go to our representative from the business community, I'd like to just come back to you, uh, Dr. Fofak, and say, 
quite a bit has been mentioned here about the capital markets, the bond markets, the coupons um, that were paid. And obviously that's strongly linked to, to uh, debt and affordability. But it does say something about international investors and how they view viability and opportunities um, on the African continent, albeit um, participating through these markets. Tell us about different funding options, models for Africa that go, you know, they may begin at the capital markets in this recovery stage, but where else can people go? Where else can governments go, the business community go to unlock capital for development? The DFIs. Yes, I think thank you very much. If, if I may, I would like to, to come back to the good point made by um, Mr. Minister on um, the need to build back better because it's related to the question on sustainable, sustainable development financing. I think when you look at what happened in 2020, when about 18 countries were downgraded within the continent, and if you add the first six months of um, 2021, about 65% of African downgraded to junk. And if you take the case of, Rwanda, of Burundi and, um, and Gabon, for instance, the reason provided by rating agency was essentially to say that given that commodity price collapsed, they would not be in the positions to honor the external commitment and liabilities. So you can see the correlation between commodity dependency trap and risk exposure to the market. In other words, that commodity dependency has been both a risk driver in terms of ratings, but also a major constraint in terms of achieving your SDGs. Because you're creating, like in Asia, the labor-intensive opportunities which actually expand and spend wages, increase wages, and then address the issue of domestic resource mobilization because you're actually increasing the fiscal space by essentially creating good jobs in the manufacturing sector. So it becomes very important when we say building back better post-pandemic within the continent to emphasize manufacturing and structural transformations to reduce that correlation between commodity terms of trade and growth, which has been a major constraint to growth, but also a major risk driver from the standpoint of rating. So that's the building back better. I think, to go back to your question now, um, moderator, I think what we saw in 2020 in during the COVID management, when, as you notice in the first half of the year, where there was massive exodus away from the continent, where the risk premium has actually increased. We had capital outflows with more than almost 10 billion out leaving South Africa for that matters. And the impact in terms of currency, gyrations, depreciation were significant. But what we saw within the bank is that the partnership that um, colleague Mercy mentioned earlier actually enabled us, the bank, to have good relationship with a number of global ECAs and partners, if you take Japan and see, if you take the China Development Banks, if you take um, uh, MF, MUFGs, we're able to, through that partnership, to actually leverage affordable financing better than the market, to leverage the resources into the continent to essentially finance transformation of African trade and growth where it was simply not possible to tap into the market at that particular time. So I think that partnership with global ECA is very important, but it so happened because the bank has the investment grade, which enables us to actually mobilize more resources and then increase return. So that's on the ECA side through our guarantees and special financing. But we've also done similar effort in the syndication space, whereby there are good projects and the risk sharing, which enable us to bring other partners outside the continent 
to actually implement large infrastructure projects that one single institution will not have been able to, to deliver. It's another possibility that one can think of. But the key point, if I may, going back to the issue of domestic resource mobilizations, is that when we look at what happened in 2020, the US Federal Reserve actually has a swap line, the, P, the P5, the key countries, I mean the UK, the EU, and the ECB, the Bank of Canada. And then when there was liquidity in the market, they extended from P5 to P14, they increased them to 14 countries. But even though that number was actually increased significantly, there was not a single African country into it. Essentially, meaning that unless we have means to actually mitigate the exposure, liquidity will continue to be an issue. But I think the point raised by Minister Duarte of really bringing back the two trillion dollar that we have sitting abroad yeah. in the form of capital flight, it's something we should be looking into. We did some research recently with the University of Massachusetts that just looking at a sample of 30 African countries, the capital flight estimate are in the range of $2 trillion. Yeah. That would be enough to provide enough caution to raise our perception within the market and mitigate our cost. Thank you. I'd like to bring into the conversation virtually uh, Olamide Badebo. She is the chief executive officer of Aduni Organics. Olamide, first and foremost, tell us a little bit about your business, what you do, um, the enabling environment, where you operate, and what would help you, essentially, as an entrepreneur, to do more of what you do, expand and grow your business and its capacity. Thank you very much. Um, greetings to everybody seated. Um, I think I need to say a big thank you to the UNECA for inviting me to be a part of this. I think it speaks to your genuine intent to see growth in Africa. Um, I hope I can represent my demographic satisfactorily. Uh, my name is Olumide. I am the owner of a cosmetics manufacturing company based in Lagos, Nigeria. We manufacture a range of skincare products using plant-based ingredients. Uh, that are local to us here in um, Nigeria. Uh, we have been in business for about eight years and let's just say it hasn't been easy to grow. We've been able to um, achieve a junction between using locally available ingredients to make global standards, aligning products that align with global standards and we sell them via um, e-commerce and what we now call social commerce. Um, I am one of, I dare say, thousands of young women in Africa who are trying to help ourselves because we have woken up to a situation where there really isn't anybody trying to help us, or at least that's how it feels a lot of the time. So it's interesting to sit um, with individuals like you and hear your side. And I'm hoping that if you hear our side, there might be a meeting right. of both sides so that we can have what I can only define as more realistic progress for Africa. I'm, um, going, I'm going to stay with you, Olamide, and a few things have been said here that, you've, that you uh, have listened to. Um, you've heard issues of managing debt at a fiscal and government level. We've heard about inflation, rising prices, and the threats going forward. And for somebody like you who lives in Nigeria that has about 70% of an import bill, in other words, almost 70% of what's consumed and used in Nigeria comes from elsewhere, you know, those become really significant issues, or I assume those are significant issues for somebody like yourself, because you've got to grow a business, but you've got to buy everything from abroad in US dollars with prices rising. What would you want to see being done better to make your situation better? Thank you very much. Um, you're quite right. Even though I am a local manufacturer, and I 
use my raw materials are sourced locally, but things like packaging, branding, I buy them abroad. Even the ones that I find locally, their raw materials are imported. So at the end of the day, my business is at the mercy of the US dollar. Um, right now, there's a huge restriction on um, the ability to, to access foreign currency. Um, so assuming that you even have the funds, getting the dollars to buy is a serious issue in Nigeria right now. And I am one of those who are, you know, who you could say are doing quite well. There are, for every person like me, there are at least 10 to 100 who are struggling to get to where my business is right now. Um, to answer your question, I, I would say broadly education. Um, there are so many opportunities that a lot of people don't know about, so many opportunities that people do not know how to take advantage of. Um, but there's also quite a huge bottleneck between what is available and the people who these things are created for. I've sat down here today and I've heard so many things for the first time, as well read as I am. And I'm just wondering why do people my age in my situation not hear these things? Yeah. I come from a continent, but somehow the people who are in charge of determining my future speak in a language that mm. my generation does not understand. Is it possible to access us on social media because that's where we live? Right. Is it a, can somebody develop apps that we use all the time to communicate to us and actually involve us in these processes? We make up the greater part of the population of this continent. Why are we not involved? Why is there such a huge gap between those Africans below 40 and everyone else? Right. We, you know, we're the ones making the strides in technology right now. There are so many African cities right now doing amazing things, and it's all from their sweat and blood. Everybody, um, before I came to this panel, I, I, I tried to ask a few friends. Everybody just feels isolated. We honestly feel like we're fighting our own battles on our own. All of me so there. is okay. there a way to, to, to help us to help ourselves? Because that's essentially what we need. All of me there. I think, to be fair, you are on the panel, so you are definitely not excluded. But broadly speaking, you raise an important issue about young entrepreneurs, female entrepreneurs being considered at policy making level, and we will certainly raise that question. Before I let you go, I'd like to know, on the funding side, what are the opportunities or the challenges you've identified for yourself as a young manufacturer? Where have you sourced the capital? Have you just gone straight to a bank? Or have you uh, had to go to uh, venture capitalists, those who can help you grow your business through models like private equity? Or are you looking for something a lot more sophisticated that would help you really scale up? Thank you. Um, again, I'm lucky. I have excellent financial management skills, so I, I wouldn't necessarily be the right example in terms of accessing finance because my business, I, I bootstrapped everything from the beginning and the business managed to break even early enough and I've never really had to borrow money. But when I did try to borrow money, I was met with interest rates of 27%. I was told to bring books. I was told to bring assets. I was told to get guarantors who were worth certain amounts. These things were way beyond my reach. Uh, it just felt like the system was set up against me. So um, because I was able to survive um, and scale through, one thing I've, I've tried to tell anybody who's trying to do what I'm doing is to keep books. But there's such a knowledge gap. A lot of people are doing so many things, selling, buying and selling, manufacturing, but they don't even know what they need to have in order to look attractive to a bank. And why are banks borrowing anybody money at 27%? How is anybody supposed to be able to return this money? Yeah. Especially because of the volatility of the economy right now with everything that we are dealing with. Is it possible to create programs, processes, or is it possible for the existing ones to be made accessible to people because you keep hearing of programs and policies, you keep hearing of projects, but I honestly don't really know many people personally who access these things. Okay. 
and are able to make them, you know, into real results. Thank you for your interventions. The views there of Olamide Badebo. She is the chief executive officer, the founder of Aduni Organics, a cosmetics company. Now, to our steam panel, that's just the voice from the real economy, some would say, you know. That's what's happening on the ground, far away, it seems, from policymakers, and certainly far away from some of these more esoteric conversations we have about financing for development. How do we bring from this high level the talk to just say, this is what a woman needs, this is what a young person needs, this is what a local SME and manufacturer needs, and let's unlock the capital to make it happen? Because ultimately, these are the job creators of the future. Uh, thank you. Uh, this conversation about uh, the uh, financing uh, the SME sector in Africa, I think that uh, needs to, from a policy making again, needs to be unpacked. Uh, banks, and I hope my colleague for fact can help me on that, banks established banks, commercial banks, universal banks, they are on the risk sector. They buy and sell risk within certain parameters because they have shareholders. From a policy-making standpoint, we cannot impose to commercial banks additional risks outside their risk perimeter. From a policymaker, and I'm talking in a very open way, doesn't make sense. So there is a time, there is a stage where financing the SME, one, two, formalizing the informal economy is responsibility of the policymakers. Let's go to the SME. The only way to bring private banks to this SME financing conversation is to structure very well risk sharing mechanisms so that by activating these risk sharing mechanisms, we succeed from a policy making standpoint, take the SME sector and put it within the risk perimeter of the banks. Otherwise, they will be just outside to the informal uh, part of the economy. Above all, again, is a policy-making responsibility. Because the informal sector, and I think we have no alternative in the next five years, the informal sector in Africa basically is a huge opportunity cost. A huge opportunity cost. Maybe higher than the $60 billion that I mentioned when responding to your gender question. So the formalization process should be done first adopting a completely ex exemption tax approach. We don't need the informal sector when formalizing to contribute to our tax base line for the next 10 years. We don't need it. Because it doesn't make sense. If policymakers lose $89 billion in illicit financial flows, is it fair to formalize the economy and start taxing in the following day? Go get your illicit financial flow that you lose every day. Doesn't make sense. So the formalization process in African economies should be done in a certain way that we just, allow me to say in this way, we just put them the red carpet. Mm. They are not supposed to pay taxes. Mm. They are supposed to be allowed to open banking accounts and pay nothing. Yeah. Pay nothing for the first two years. And then the banking will get the money after two years because they will be putting millions of dollars in that bank. Mm. Things should be addressed on a medium-term basis, not in a short-term basis. Yeah. 
Social security, which is a heavy cost in, 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 in the informal sector, if you want to formalize them and you tell uh, an informal economy that it needs to pay uh, for each employee, let's say in this way, 15% uh, of the social security system, he has no money. So let's bring, let's bring and, give the, and give them what I called a huge grace right. period. Yeah. A huge grace period so they can formalize, yeah. have roots, yeah. start walking at, a novel, at another level, and then yeah. say, okay, let's talk and give me some money because now it's time to tax. Mm. So, but I think we need to, to unpack this Re policy, uh, this uh, uh, approach. Uh, Thank you. And also just uh, you know, think outside the box. Hanan, risk is a terminology that's been used as it applies to banks, and commercial banks in particular, being in the business of risk managing risk, selling risk. Now, this is where DFIs come into the picture because it's said that they can absorb or they've got the capacity to take on a little bit more risk. And so you're not going to fund an SME, but certainly at a sovereign... Oh, you are? Okay. My assumption is that, you know, DFIs don't fund SMEs, but certainly they can create the space through which the risk takers on the commercial side can think outside the box. Thank you. Um, actually, international financial institutions actually can do these, what is called like women credit lines or SME credit lines. They don't directly lend to SME, but they can give these credit lines to banks to on lend. So it is possible. I think what we are talking about here are a number of issues. One related to the cost of the borrowing. And there are a number of factors that determines that cost. Um, for example, the issue of having credit information, a track record. A, a, a key issue that can actually help SMEs and women is uh, building these credit uh, uh, bureaus that can collect information on the ability to pay utilities on time, rent on time, repay loans, uh, that you can actually can better able to have the information and assess the capacity to rebay by a bank. Uh, so collecting this information and usually actually by evidence, women are shown to be better in paying back their debt and you know uh, utilities. So uh, gathering this information would be key because that will enable the banks to do better decisions in terms of risk assessment. Uh, also having things like, and some countries in the continent have actually managed to do it, things like um, uh, movable collateral registries. What do I mean? Usually banks in the continent tend to ask for uh, land or property as a collateral or, you know, uh, whatever you have in a bank account. Uh, but what the movable uh, 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 collateral registry does, it allows you to use other things. It can be machinery, it can be livestock, it can be um, uh, gold that is in jewelry. So it, it enables you to have other forms of showing your capacity or a proof of collateral that is beyond the typical, and especially in countries that ha has issues with uh, land rights or certain, whether it's women or others, access to this land, this becomes essential. So there are a number of things that are on the like, you know, ecosystem that can be fixed, that can help. There is also uh, you know, the issue of basically um, uh, having uh, or policymakers or government providing uh, uh, lines that are credit guarantees. So basically you are... Um, providing some guarantees to the banking system for certain level of losses that you will help so that they are able to better extend these lines. And finally, the issue of actually benefiting from blended finance. So to reduce the cost, having, uh, you know, the, uh, using some of the concessional funding that you get to actually on lend to this segment, um, you know, of, of the... Uh, um, a, a critical that is very critical to the economy so that they can grow, expand, um, and have better opportunities to succeed. Dr. Fofak, I'd like to ask you a question. Now, we're going to look beyond the crisis into the recovery, into the 
broader transformation. So we're thinking Agenda 2063 here and the different funding mechanisms. Uh, for a long time, we've been very simplistic, perhaps, in the way we've talked about funding and financing. We've, you know, it's been government, it's been going to the capital markets, it's been collaboration through PPEs. What else is available to really pursue very ambitious programs at national level, but then also at this business and SME level? A term has been used here, blended finance, it's increasingly being used in these conversations as it applies to the private sector. But what op options and opportunities are there for unlocking capital for big, big transformative projects? No, thank you um, very much, Che. I think, uh, if allow me to go back a little bit to the point made by uh, the private sector from Nigeria. I think it's important to say that she was right. I think she's right. And there's been um, really um, financial repression within the continent uh, and um, across the continent. If you look at um, lending the private sector within the continent as a share of GDP, we are less than 20% in this continent compared to the 70%, 120% in the rest of the world. So the banking sector essentially has been even more risk averse but also very much pro-cyclical. In other words, when there's a crisis, they run away. And when there's no crisis, we have those prohibitive rates of 27% that she mentions. But there are some good news. And in part, those policies reflected the fact that in many countries, you could actually go and uh, invest in government bonds, risk-free, and make money, isn't it? So you saw what happened in Nigeria, where the central bank decided to forcefully, to force bank to support the private sector through the loan deposit ratio of 65%, that from now on, you'll have to be compelled to meet that requirement. And I'm pleased to announce that when they reviewed the policy impact last month, a few months ago, it turns out that Nigerian Bank provided more lending during COVID than at any time without necessarily increasing their NPL ratios. So I think there are things which can be done within government to actually incentivize support toward the African private sector. I think the example of Nigeria is a clear case for that. Then, quite frankly, going back to domestic resource mobilization and partnership, we can learn a lot from the US model, the SBA, Small Business Administrations, whereby their public procurement policy, it's a policy for US SMEs. I think that will actually ensure that there is real scope for development of regional value chains, which will therefore contribute to expanding that fiscal space and create more revenue for government to do even more going forward, essentially setting the stage for a multiplier effect. So it's very important to really look into that in that domestic space. But the good news, before I get to that last point, is that the, one of the key constraints in the past has been the fragmentations of African economies and market, which have actually made it difficult for corporation to spread the risk of investing in small market. I think the African Consent Free Trade Area Agreement, and specifically the attached rules of origins, is actually, I said earlier in the opening sessions, a game changer in the sense that it's going to give priority to African manufacturing company industries. And that is a major incentive in terms of really creating the conditions for sustainable growth and development. And the financing will follow because as a result of that integration, productivity and competitiveness gain will actually increase and become a natural incentives. And that's why at the bank, we've actually been reorganizing our portfolio to invest more into intra-African trade, intra-African investment. I think that will help a lot in terms of galvanizing more financing 
from commercial within mm. the continent, but also globally from potential partner. I think we have to look at the quick short-term win and look at regional value chains, the way they did in Asia, mm. the strategic sector, which will be major drivers. What we are doing currently in the automotive space, it's a major thing mm. in terms of really creating jobs, but also value additions mm. on our commodities. Thank you. Fantastic. And uh, Minister Ndagajmana, so much has been said from the macro level, going to the international markets. You've done it as well, building up um, vehicle assembly plants, so you've thought about boosting manu uh, manufacturing capacity and introducing new value chains. But when we go back to this issue of partnerships, it's all good and well for Rwanda to be doing it as a country. But if you can't get some measure of transformation within the region to create broader markets through which made in Rwanda goods can be sold, you know, you continue to have a challenge. So when we think in a transformative way about this future, this agenda 2063, what is a transformative, out of the box thinking? What does it entail? Uh, thank you. There, are, there is a lot of work to do domestically, but also there's a lot of work to do uh, collectively in, uh, at the regional level, at the continental level, and globally. So those approaches should go concurrently. Like a small market like Rwanda, there's no way you can uh, grow to really to high extent without trading, without collaborating with the, with the neighboring uh, countries and beyond. So, uh, reforms on the, uh, on the domestic market are important, like the issues raised by the uh, entrepreneur from Nigeria. These are a common problem in many countries, including my own country. So, we, as government, uh, make effort to mobilize resources, uh, the, which also have limitation in terms of borrowing space, which has narrowed during COVID, and some countries have no more rooms for borrowing. So it is important also to focus on private sector development and to improve our system to ease access to finance for large, small, medium, and micro businesses and that unlock all dif different bottlenecks like uh, what we, was this described. There is a low level of financial literacy we need to address where there is the issue of risk. So we need to find the risking mechanism to support uh, SMEs. We have tried here in Rwanda, we have uh, a network of uh, uh, microfinance institutions which are supported to provide uh, small loans to operators. We have uh, an institution that support entrepreneurs to develop their projects uh, in the phase of uh, development before they qualify for loans. We have uh, an agency that provide guarantees funded by government to support, they provide up to 75% of the required guarantee to, to access right. loans. Um, we also, we have created the uh, uh, economic recovery fund now worth $350 million to support all uh, businesses of all sizes that have been seriously affected by COVID at a very mm. low rate. And we think that because this is a revolving fund, maybe we can expand in the future mm. to see how we can support the borrowers while um, uh, allowing banks to, to, set, to, to, to provide the loans at their condition, but that facility could reduce the risk right. and in the end, the, the interest rate could go, could go down. Mm. So, and also we are trying to attract more uh, financial institutions in Rwanda, maybe also to increase right. some, to increase competition. So, uh, we are reforming the laws to make sure that uh, uh, there is really a, a competitive market right. for financial institutions. And also, we need to build also right. our human capacities in these institutions mm -hmm. uh, to adapt their product 
to the market mm. needs. Thank so it's a, it's a holistic picture is what you're painting. In the interest of time, we're going to be ending our conversation here, this high-level panel. I know that when we'd begun, four uh, delegates had said that they want to be able to ask a question. Is that still the case? Please stand up, ma'am. Daniel at the back, the gentleman over here. Have we lost the other two? That's okay. These are the two questions and comments we will take uh, to which our esteemed panelists can respond and then we can go and reflect on what's being said over lunch. Thank you very much. My name is Daniel Onyetulam. I represent uh, Stevenson Holistic Care Foundation from Nigeria. And uh, I, I want to make uh, an observation. One of the... in. Uh, with high priority to the team in question that has been discussed, and then uh, uh, bordering on one of the key areas that has been emphasized both by uh, Madam, uh, Madam Wing, the doctor from, uh, just hold on, let me get the name right, Dr. Sangwe. So we've talked so much about the uh, the, very, the five goals that has been addressed here. But then looking at the team, I was just wondering why uh, not so much have been talked about, I mean, why the goal 13 have not been included amongst the five that we're discussing, talking about the quality education, gender equality, life underwater, and then a life uh, on land, and then uh, collaborations. So but then uh, the goal 13 is not inclusive in the discussion here. Then the second thing I want, the second observation I want to make has to do with uh, the fact that after attending such meetings, I don't know if there's any deliberate plan and deliberate action towards having a step down meeting by the various uh, contingents from the various countries, you know, by way of mobilizing other African nations within the continent, you know towards actualization of the goal 2030 and uh, 2063. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. It's the lady in the second row. My name is Jacqueline Amongin and I'm a parliamentarian for, from Uganda. And I have been in parliament legislating for the last 15 years. And today I would like to thank the presenters who have, uh, who have made keen presentations. But I really need to reckon to the lady, the business, the entrepreneur from Nigeria who talked about access to financing. And we're talking about financing and we are talking about addressing Agenda 2063 and addressing the SDGs. I'm looking at inclusivity of everyone, including the young people, including the women. And I, I, there is always a saying that there is nothing for us without us. If I'm a businesswoman in, for example, Uganda, where I come from, I don't own land, I'm married somewhere else, and I am doing business, but... The bank is telling me I need security, I need all this. So I think that as we come up with this, uh, uh, we, we discuss and the outcomes of these forums, it's very important that we try to see how to link policies, our discussions to policy implementations at the national level, so that whatever we discuss here is domesticatable in our homes where we come from. That's when it makes sense, and that's when we will be on move for example, if we are talking about financing, which is the topic which has been addressed today, how many of the countries are already having policies in place that allow inclusive borrowing, for example? I'm a businesswoman as well. But what, what do I have to, what policy protects me when I'm borrowing, for example, financing? The young people, we are always talking about young people being job creators rather than job seekers. But... I just finished school yesterday. 
I own nothing. Everything is owned by my parents. And then the, I want to start something small. I just need a little income, to, little financing to start my business, probably on the street. How does government put in place those policies that enable young people or the women or those vulnerable people right. to access financing so as to run effective businesses? Right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I mean, a lot is being said. It's commentary. It's just reflection. Um, the one question was, we focused on the five goals that are going to be underpinning this particular session. But what about goal 13? My understanding is goal 13 was an important pillar of the seventh session, last year's session. And that's why there was a memorandum uh, and a carbon agreement uh, that was signed, or cooperation on carbon financing. But perhaps we can, uh, or climate financing, but I think perhaps we can, by way of responding to that question, demonstrate how funding, when it's unlocked, could also trickle all the way through to the green economy and to climate solutions to provide a holistic approach. I don't know if somebody would hazard an attempt to, to answer that. Yes, ma'am. Allow me to take this opportunity about climate to, to bring to our conversation uh, two or three notes that I believe that are crucial for Africa when looking at uh, COP27 and then uh, energy financing, of course. I'm sure that you notice that um, the global narrative around climate, and we need to talk these things in a very open way, is pushing Africa to the corner. And you need to be very careful. Africa is a continent that when addressed climate adaptation, uh, climate change and climate mitigation, has very as a huge set of specificities. The first one, that we contribute only with 4%. So Africa is in a position that to discuss climate needs to discuss, at the same time, energy. We cannot discuss in a separate way. Second, when discussing energy, I think that we need all to understand, first us, and then the international community, that Africa is entitled to decide its own energy mix. Because at the end of the day, you have 18 million jobs on an annual base to generate. And this is something that is urgent. We should have been done yesterday. And we need to tell everybody that we can do both. We, ca we can decide our energy mix and at the same time keep a leading position as a green continent. Going to Financing, climate financing, energy financing. I believe that my dear colleague Vera uh, responded to those issues in a very eloquent way. We have a low hanging fruit already that can provide Africa with financing to address climate adaptation, climate mitigation, and more than that, to address the 80 million job. Is the carbon financing, is the carbon pricing. And we need now. To, to get expertise, to get knowledge, because it's a very complicated issue. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Perhaps we can also then answer the second question, and I think this is just broad. This is something that the entrepreneur in Nigeria also mentioned. And when we talk like this, it almost feels as if we're not talking to ordinary people. It's, it's complex, sophisticated finance, with its development, capital markets. But how, how can we make the subject matter as important as it is for the fiscus, for governments and sovereignty? How can we keep on remembering who we serve, the people of Africa, the entrepreneurs of Africa, the, the women of Africa? Yes, I think, um, quite frankly, I think let me thank the MP for raising that important questions. And one thing we've actually not 
really articulate it within this continent is to realize that the private sector and the public sector fit are definitely intertwined. Unless the African private sector, whether it is SMEs or medium or large corporations, are fully supported and incentivized by the government, we will continue to be in a model where there is significant leakages. In other words, a project that could actually be created locally and create jobs will result in reliance on import and as a result, as a result, exporting jobs and as a result, creating the condition for our external liability and debt to increase. That is the model we've been into for the last um, maybe 40, 50 years. So empowering the African private sector is actually in the interest of the government. It's no longer an either or. And we have to find a way to essentially strengthen public-private partnership to create the condition for sustainable development. There's no sustainable development goal without that angle. It also happened, going back to the important point made by the chair at opening, that may well be the only way for Africa to actually own its development. Mm. To own your own development will require that you rely on your private sector. So, and at Afrexim Bank, I think you'd be very pleased to know that we actually established what we call, we realize that our funding, it's such that we often go for big ticket, but we recently established FEDA, Fund for Export Development in Africa, essentially because it became quite clear to us that there are many young entrepreneurs start up good ideas which tend to die because of financing issues. Yeah. So our equity financing is enabling us to ensure that, for President Rama has said this, that under his leadership he will ensure that no good ideas in this continent will end up dying because of financing right. deficit. So we are actually working on that. We also just approve our SME strategy within the bank to not only look at the startup side, but also support the existing. Right. We are definitely on that page. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think we can summarize by say, whatever happens, the commitment is to ensure that no good ideas die and nobody is left behind. This is development for all of us, by all of us. Please join me in thanking our esteemed panel made up of the Deputy Executive Secretary and the Chief Economist of the UNECA, Hanan Morsi. Um, she is joined by the um, Chief Economist um, and the Head of Research and International Cooperation at Afrexum Bank, Dr. Hippolyte Forfak. Um, we've also had virtually, but unfortunately the line um, died on us, and those are the hazards of doing things uh, virtually online. The president of the Islamic Development Bank, His Excellency Dr. Mohammed Suleiman Al Jasser, although the sound could not be corrected, we thank him for his patience and his time and his willingness to participate. We also had the entrepreneur from Nigeria, Olamide Badebo, uh, who is the founder of Aduni organics, and last but certainly not least, the session chair and a participant in this high-level conversation, Minister of Finance and Economic Planning for Rwanda, His Excellency Uziel Ndagajimana. Just a few housekeeping notes before we close this particular high-level uh, conversation. Lunch will be served shortly, and the venues for you to be aware of is that there will be lunch in the Auditorium Club, which is on the first floor of the Kigali Convention Center. Lunch will also be served at the restaurant at, near the foyer at the entrance of the Convention Center. That restaurant is called the Fellini Restaurant. And then inside the Radisson Hotel is a restaurant known as the Lada Restaurant. And that's also where you can access lunch. So lunch upstairs, the Auditorium Club, first floor near the entrance of the KCC, the Fellini restaurant, and inside the Radisson Hotel, the Larder restaurant. We will reconvene at four o'clock 
for the election process. Thank you very much for your patience and thank you very much to our panelists.
please take your seat. We're going to start. Honorable delegates, please take your seat. Veuillez rejoindre vos sièges. Nous allons commencer. Merci. Mesdames et Messieurs, nous allons, nous allons reprendre nos travaux et nous commençons la session de l'élection du nouveau bureau, du bureau entrant. Nous avons l'honneur et le plaisir d'avoir avec nous Son Excellence, Monsieur le Ministre Malima, de, du bureau sortant. Le ministre Mavima et un grand ami du Forum, même un pilier du Forum africain sur le développement durable. Donc c'est vraiment un très grand plaisir de l'avoir avec nous cet après-midi. Excellence, vous avez la parole. Thank you. Um Those who have, take, who have not taken their seats, may you take your seats quickly. We have a very important uh, segment that we are going into. So please quickly take your seats. Um, I want uh, to, on behalf of uh, the outgoing bureau, to thank you for coming. And I really want to thank the Bureau itself for a very productive year uh, since this Bureau took over in uh, Congo Brazzaville a year ago. Um, and uh, the successes of uh, that Bureau have uh, already been outlined uh, this morning by uh, the Bureau Chair. Um, the minister from Congo Brazzaville, Madame Alet uh, Sudan uh, Nano. Uh, but she couldn't be here to preside over this, uh, this session. And I have the honor and pleasure to preside it, uh, over it. Um, I want at this particular point in time uh, to ask the Secretariat to lead us in the election of the new bureau. So, Secretariat, please, uh, can you take to the floor and uh, lead us in the election of the new bureau? I, I thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister. So, I switch to France, to French. Donc, mesdames et messieurs, honorables délégués, nous allons procéder à l'élection du nouveau bureau. Nous avons eu des consultations avec le bureau sortant. Ces consultations étaient basées sur l'historique de la représentation des différentes sous-régions dans les bureaux, les différents bureaux des précédentes éditions du Forum régional africain sur le développement durable. Nous avons convenu que la composition du bureau par sous-région serait la suivante. Présidence Afrique de l'Est, première vice-présidence Afrique de l'Ouest, deuxième vice-présidence Afrique du Nord, troisième vice-présidence Afrique australe et rapporteur Afrique centrale. Ceci est basé sur... Les, les, les rôles que chaque sous-région avait lors des dernières, des dernières éditions du forum. 
et la pratique et, et la tradition du forum est que le troisième vice-président devienne le deuxième vice-président l'année suivante et ainsi de suite. Nous, a, nous avons également eu d'autres consultations sur la base de la participation des États membres par sous-région dans les bureaux, avec comme principe d'avoir une représentation la plus inclusive possible au travers du temps, mais également en tenant compte d'un certain nombre de paramètres liés aux enjeux actuels, la nécessité également de mettre l'accent sur certains, certaines thématiques, sur certains défis auxquels sont confrontés nos pays. Et cela nous a guidés, avec le bureau sortant, vers une certaine, des propositions, je dirais. Donc le secrétariat fait des suggestions et effectivement, il, il appartient aux sous-régions de valider ou non ces suggestions. Donc, avant de partager avec vous ces suggestions, nous voudrions euh, voir s'il n'y a pas d'objection à la représentation que j'ai énoncée, à savoir, encore une fois, je répète, présidence Afrique de l'Est, première vice-présidence Afrique de l'Ouest, deuxième vice-présidence Afrique du Nord, troisième vice-présidence Afrique australe et rapporteur Afrique centrale. Encore une fois, c'est basé sur la pratique et la tradition de ce forum. Donc, je ne pense pas, Monsieur le Président, qu'il y ait euh, de commentaires sur cette euh, composition. Donc, euh, je Maintenant, je passe à la présentation des, des, de la suggestion faite par le secrétariat qui ne concerne pas toutes les sous-régions, mais il nous a semblé très important de mettre un accent sur les petites économies insulaires. C'est la raison pour laquelle nous pensons, et sur la base de l'histoire des participations de, dans la, au niveau de l'Afrique de l'Ouest, nous pensons que le Cap Vert pourrait être le premier vice Président, représentant l'Afrique de l'Ouest, pour également les pays. The continent lags behind other regions. In 2019, about 14%, Africa's uh, revenue to GDP was about 14.9% of GDP. This has gone down to 11.9% in 2020. Domestic, the share of domestic budgets that are funded by domestic taxes has, however, reached 67.8%, but this was in 2018. And the high cost of debt and insufficient concessionary financing is a critical factor. Only 26% of Africa's needs can be met through concessionary financing. And again, this is particularly important as countries, a number of African countries, have now moved to capital markets to access financing because the financing that they get from concessional sources is insufficient to meet their infrastructure needs. However, it is estimated that Africa, on average, pays between 100 to 260 basis points higher on the interest rates, even after you control for their, um, uh, uh, their uh, credit ratings. So for example, as of 2020, if you compare Greece's credit rating of a BB minus with Morocco's at that time of BB plus, Morocco was paying 2% on its coupon rate and, and, and Greece was paying 1.5%. So there's this African premium that uh, also contributes to debt, uh, high debt service costs. As a result, Africa's debt service payments as a proportion of GDP peaked at around 70% in 2020. I uh, like a uh, 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 world decline as of uh, 2021, but it's still relatively high. So how do we move forward in terms of both financing and in terms of our own efforts to position ourselves to improve our uh, um, performance on the SDGs? 
on the financing front, um, the special drawing rights that, um, of 650 billion that were recently approved by the IMF provides an important source of non-debt accumulating resources because the cost of using SDRs is relatively low, but Africa, as you know, only received 33.3 billion and these resources pale in significance to Africa's financing needs that are estimated to be about 240 billion annually. So pushing for on-lending of SDRs to regional development banks and to countries is critical going forward. In addition, strengthening domestic resource mobilization efforts uh, is also key because that is the catalyst that brings in other sources of external financing. But internally, uh, ECA has supported countries to look at how their plans are aligned with the SDGs and Agenda 2063, and we found that Several countries, most countries are not, are about, at around 60% of alignment. In some countries, the alignment of their national plans with the SD, Agenda 2030 is, more, is, is higher than with the Agenda 2063. Countries like Zambia, um, Uganda, Ethiopia demonstrate this um, uh, characteristic. Some countries like Seychelles and Sierra Leone show more balanced uh, alignment. And since alignment is the first step towards uh, implementation of the SDGs, this is a critical area that perhaps we want to look at. Now, what are some of the areas that, uh, other areas that need to be addressed? We find that most countries need some ex additional capacity to strengthen their monitoring and evaluation systems. A number of countries don't have well-defined targets and indicators which makes it difficult to track progress. Also, identification of risks in national development plans is critical. Um, the experience of COVID highlights this. How do we incorporate risk into our national development plans such that we are able to be more resilient to these shocks? And also the issue of prioritization. We know that there are 17 goals, uh, how do we, and, and several targets, how do we prioritize in a way that is informed by evidence? So capacities in scenario modeling uh, will help us to identify the sectors and the interventions that have the most uh, impactful uh, results on other sectors, given the interrelationship among the SDGs. Countries don't have to do everything at the same time. Identifying trigger areas like energy, water, can address issues, uh, other issues like health and education. Stronger alignment of NDPs, national development plans with the SDGs and Agenda 2063 is also critical. And in this context, ECA's integrated planning and reporting tool is one that we've used to actually estimate and give quantifi uh, quantify the alignment across countries. Another area uh, is the issue of spatial uh, planning. Um, spatial planning is critical because development doesn't happen uh, evenly across different spaces in a country. Identifying natural endowments and, and, and trigger points or areas where we can actually invest so as to minimize uh, spatial in, in, uh, inequalities is also should be part of our national planning processes so that we don't have uh, spatial inequalities. And also uh, linking financing frameworks to development priorities is another area that ensures that our priorities are actually funded and implemented. Um, improving domestic resource mobilization. We've talked a lot about this in also in terms of not only the domestic resources that are mobilizes, mobilized, but the leakages of about 83 billion annually that go out of our, our, our countries and also re-examining the issue of tax incentives to, to un understand what are the financial benefits from these tax incentives as, a, as opposed to the expenditures that uh, uh, come with these tax expenditures because basically these incentives means of uh, giving up the resources that you could have gained in terms of revenues. What are the benefits? And really making that assessment to uh, determine whether it's, it's critical. Redoubling current efforts to digitize economies will be critical to minimize intra-country inequalities. A lot of children have been left behind because they stayed at home but didn't have access to digital technologies to engage 
uh, with the educational system. This is also critical going forward. And more crowding in the private investments. It's estimated that global financial assets are up to about 370 trillion. And this, most of these money resources are with the private sector. So blended approaches that uh, combine public resources to leverage private resources will be critical going forward. Because even the IMF's resources uh, of about one trillion is not, would not be sufficient for, uh, to address all the needs of developing countries. And then finally, getting our development plans right, because that is the vehicle through which our ideas and our aspirations are executed. So this brings me to the end of my presentation, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, so now we, we move to the uh, com Thomas, uh, comment to your presentation. So. so I have the honor to invite the Director General of National Planning Commission of Malawi, Mr. Thomas Muntagala Muntali, to take the floor. Mr. Muntali, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, moderator. Uh, let me once again also begin by recognizing the presence of the Minister of Finance, who is also the session chair and all the protocols observed. It's quite uh, an honor to be here, along with all these distinguished delegates. And I want to thank Prof. Uh, Bartholomew Ama for a very enlightening presentation, which is trying to show to us the progress that uh, uh, we're making in as far as meeting the Agenda 2030 and 2063 is concerned. I, I would want to take it uh, from the angle of the sub-regional and national context. And I will be looking mostly in the case of Malawi, uh, where I come from. Um, I think the first most important aspect, which I think also seems to come through the meeting and in the uh, points that were being raised here, is the importance of domesticating. When we talk about Agenda 2030 and Agenda 2063, at the global and continental levels, these have to be implemented at the national levels. And if we don't get these to be aligned to our own national development plans and domesticated, then these become just mere talk shows. So what we did, for example, in the case of the Malawi, is that we now have a vision Malawi 2063, which in spirit and essence is aligned to the Malawi, I mean to the Agenda 2063 and the Agenda 2030. Our vision is about inclusive wealth creation and safe reliance. We would want to attain an upper middle income industrialized nation by 2063. And this aligns quite very well with the Agenda 2063, which uh, looks at creating a continent that is integrated, peaceful, and prosperous, driven by its own people, uh, and being a formidable force in the international arena. And by extension to the uh, aspiration of the Agenda 2030, which is leaving nobody behind. Now, with that in aligning to the Agenda 2030, Malawi came up with the first 10-year implementation plan to operationalize its vision, the Malawi 2063. And in it, there are two key milestones. First is to make sure that Malawi becomes a middle income economy by 2030. And second, which is linked to the talk of the day, is that we want to meet most of the SDGs come 2030. And I think that's pure alignment and domestication of making sure that whatever is agreed at international levels gets to be done at the national levels. We followed that through with the COVID-19 social economic recovery plan because we realized that for us to build back, we need building forward better. 
we need to put in place foundations that are going to help us uh, to meet our vision uh, by looking at the aspects that would really uh, help us to build back much better. And we have five key elements in it, to have a resilient and sustainable health system, a resilient and sustainable education system, a resilient and sustainable social protection system, a, a, a resilient um, market and labor economy, as well as a sound enabling macroeconomic environment. But having said that, we have already realized that it's important for us to take stock of where we are, especially with regard to the uh, Agenda 2030. And in doing that, we had called on the ECA uh, to even help the country. Just last week, a team from ECA was in Malawi, where they trained the line ministries and the National Planning Commission on how to use the integrated planning and reporting toolkit. This helps to uh, make sure that uh, our plans, both at the national and local levels, are aligned. And for us to move forward, we are also part of the voluntary national review uh, that, is, uh, uh, that we're undertaking, which will be presented at the high-level political forum in July. The idea is we want to be able to ascertain the state of readiness for us to meet most of the SDGs as we've as espoused in our own 10-year implementation plan. And we know already that uh, some of the um, SDGs uh, that are lagging behind for us are gender related. We know that uh, out of the uh, population that we have, most of the jobs in the informal sector are being run by women. Actually, women, uh, women take part in about 94% of the informal jobs in Malawi, meaning there's a huge dimension to the impacts of COVID-19 because the restrictions of movements or transacting affect women a lot more. And so even though we are doing the voluntary national review, there are already things that we know which we are putting in place mechanisms to address. Now, as I finish in giving um, my reaction to the presentation which uh, Prof. Amar has ably presented, is really to put forward uh, about three, four or five recommendations quickly. One, and I think I, I'm going to uh, re-emphasize the point that um, the Executive Secretary for uh, ECA, uh, Madam Vera Song, we pointed out that we've got to intensify vaccinations. In Malawi, we've, we still are below 5% of the population that is supposed to be vaccinated. We are supposed to have 60% vaccination, but we're only at 5%. And so what we've done is to go at the community level. Now there's intensification of vaccinations, and we are having to go um, um, uh, over uh, 8,000 plus that are getting vaccinated uh, at the community level on a daily basis, which I think is a very huge number. And we are hoping we can uh, meet the levels that Rwanda has, uh, that uh, we're talking of about 7%. Second, uh, and, and I think the issue about the intensification of vaccinations is simple that, you know, you cannot open up economies if your people uh, cannot transact. And second is the issue of digitalization. We now have gone more digital in education, in health. We have what we call in Chichewa, in our language, Chipatala Chapa Konde, I mean Chipatala Chapa Phone, meaning a health facility by phone. So people can phone through some of the ailments, they don't have to come to the hospital. They can just call a medical doctor and get some uh, advisory on the phone. Uh, and thirdly, uh, that means even commerce. Commerce is going more digital uh, uh, because of the, that aspect. Third, we are talking of social protection programs. We have intensified that as well because there are segments of our society that are still really lagging behind. And if we're not going to leave, and if we're going to leave nobody behind, then those segments have to be uh, targeted. Fourth is the issue of making sure that these fiscal and monetary uh, policy programs that we started off when COVID started showing its face in our country in April 2020 are intensified and continued, especially targeting those uh, industries like creative arts, music industry, tourism, that are faced with huge challenges because of the restrictions imposed uh, by COVID. The last but one is front-loading of infrastructure investments. I think you've seen in America there, is, there was a bill around infrastructure intensification. The idea is to stimulate the economy. And if we get more money to be in people's hands, uh, we believe that uh, we can recover much faster. And lastly, 
is the idea of financing. And I think it touches a lot more uh, on the issues that came out this morning and part of the afternoon on domestic resource mobilization. Uh, we are not going to um, face these issues well in future if our fiscal space remains limited. And it was exciting to hear the Minister of Finance from Rwanda um, talking about how Rwanda managed to salvage the situation because they had a pre-COVID environment that had a strong foundation. So when COVID struck, they were in a far much better position to face COVID. Uh, they may not have faced it 100%, but their position was much stronger than some of us who are having to be faced with very uh, weak fiscal space. The plea, though, as I finish, is that institutions like ECA, uh, and I think the African Capacity Building Foundation, ADB, African Bank, and the, and the like, need to really intensify efforts around capacity building to access financing. A lot of the times, a lot of the countries, we know that finances are out there. But what we don't know is where, what amounts, and how we can access them. So I think it's very important to build that capacity, more especially now that we're having the African uh, uh, continental free trade area. We need to be able to look at carbon financing, how do we access it? How, bank, bank carbon investment projects, how do we do that? So capacities around these issues will be very critical as we move forward in building back better in meeting the Agenda 2030 and Agenda 2063. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, DG Montali. Yes. And thanks again, Bartolomeo, um, for this uh, two enlightening presentations. We are running uh, a little bit late, so perhaps we go with the reduced number of questions. Let's go for three questions, and then uh, let's try to, to, to start the next session before six, around six. So, yeah, I see uh, Morocco, you have the floor. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Is this on? Is the mic on? Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Uh, je tiens tout d'abord à féliciter uh, Son Excellence, Monsieur le Président du Bureau et le pays frère du Rwanda pour uh, l'accueil chaleureux qui nous a été réservé. Et je vous félicite aussi tous les membres uh, les nouveaux membres élus du bureau. Je voudrais euh, tout simplement soulever une, une question concernant le, le rôle et la contribution du euh, partenariat interafricain dans le redressement euh, de la situation économique après Covid. Nous savons tous que nous vivons actuellement dans un contexte global d'austérité et que qu'il est temps maintenant pour l'Afrique de se prendre en charge et de cesser cette dépendance sur les partenaires globaux parce que les partenaires globaux aussi ils ont leurs problèmes et leurs défis comme on le sait tous. Où est-ce qu'on est actuellement avec ce partenariat interafricain qui s'inscrit dans le cadre de la coopération Sud-Sud Qu'est-ce qu'on a comme structure existante Quelles sont les avancées Comment peut-on améliorer ce partenariat interafricain qui demeure un impératif dans le contexte actuel pour aider l'Afrique justement de faire face aux multiples défis qu'impose le Covid, le processus de changement climatique et certes, bien sûr, d'autres défis. Donc, j'aimerais bien savoir, euh, qu'on clarifie un petit peu euh, euh, ce partenariat interafricain et, et, et à quel stade ce partenariat se trouve actuellement. Merci, M. le Président. Et Je tiens aussi à remercier donc, euh, euh, nos chers collègues pour ces présentations euh, qui nous ont éclairé sur euh, un certain nombre de, 
de questions importantes. Merci. Merci, Monsieur l'Ambassadeur. Nous allons prendre deux autres questions. Please. Take the floor. And please introduce yourself. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for a very informative um, presentation. My, my attention was caught by the lack of alignment by our African governments to the targets, the SDGs, and the aspirations of the Agenda 2063 of our own national plans. One is tempted to want to find out more. If you look into a broader, you know, avenue of the government operations, whatever is on those aspirations and uh, development plans, I mean, uh, sustainable development goals, even if they could not have existed, at least would have been touching on them. What is it really that was identified through the evaluation that the governments are not doing properly in order to align ourselves with those? Because going forward, we really need to, 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 to make sure that if we are to address the concerns that you are saying we have, we need to be able to align all those frameworks and be able to meet targets and be able to identify key performance indicators that we really need to address. So I really want to understand what is it that we are doing wrong and what is the advice going forward? I thank you. Thank you, thank you very much for this uh, very concrete question and uh, crucial. Yeah, please, uh, the floor. Please introduce yourself. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Je voudrais joindre ma voix à ceux qui m'ont devancé pour remercier euh, le pays hôte pour l'accueil que nous avons reçu. Je voudrais juste euh, avoir quelques clarifications de la part de, du professeur. Quand il présentait le rapport, il a semblé dire que l'agenda 2030 est mieux intégré dans les plans nationaux que l'agenda 2063. Alors la question à l'analyse, qu'est-ce qui bloque la prise en compte de l'agenda 2063, un agenda que nous nous sommes donné en tant qu'Africains Qu'est-ce qui bloque l'intégration parfaite de cet agenda dans nos plans de développement nationaux Quelles solutions, en tout cas, ce, ce groupe-là envisage pour renforcer, en tout cas, la mise en œuvre de l'agenda 2063 à travers son intégration dans les plans de développement national. Voilà un peu ma préoccupation. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup pour votre question. Nous allons peut-être répondre à ces trois questions et on verra par la suite s'il si nous reste un peu de temps pour faire un deuxième tour de questions. Les trois questions sont vraiment corrélées dans le sens où, comme il a été souligné dans la troisième question, on a une différence significative entre la mise en œuvre et l'intégration de l'agenda 2030 et de l'agenda 2063. Donc la question très importante d'identifier les blocages. Ce reste, est-ce que cela souligne un manque de mise en œuvre du partenariat interafricain tel que souligné par M. l'ambassadeur mais en tout cas, ça souligne l'importance de l'évaluation pour mesurer précisément le manque d'alignement tel que souligné par la deuxième question. Donc, trois questions très cohérentes qui touchent diff différents points fondamentaux pour pouvoir justement accélérer euh, la mise en œuvre des, 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 de l'agenda 2030, mais également 
de l'agenda 2063. Je commence par Bartolomeo. Ah, ma, vous avez la parole. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the questions. And I think uh, they get at the heart of some of the questions that we've asked ourselves. And I'll start with the integration and alignment issue. Um, so why are countries relatively less aligned on both? Why is the level of alignment not where we think it should be? And why is 2063 even less aligned? Let me start with the first. On the alignment, I, I think um, the, f the fact is that countries have currently assessed alignment using more of a subjective approach. In other words, they look at their plans, look at their agenda, and then they basically make some notes about what the level of alignment is. They, and so when they do that, for example, and you ask a country, are you aligned with the agenda 2063 or 2030? They'll tell you yes. But if you probe further and say, well, the agendas have goals, targets, and indicators. So at the goal level, can you tell me indicatively what is the level of alignment? They will not be able to give you any quantify this. And it is this um, challenge that inspired ECA to develop this integrated planning and reporting tool to give some kind of a quantitative rigor to that discussion. Because what we find is that in general, alignment is much higher at the goal level. But as you go down to the targets and indicator level, the alignment declines. Now, why is this the case? Well, in some cases, a country would say that, well, some of these goals are not really uh, relevant to me. Uh, some countries that are landlocked have said, well, the life below water is, is really not as important for me as uh, uh, life uh, on land, because basically I'm not, uh, you know, I don't abut an ocean, although, of course, they do have water resources. But also, countries use proxy indicators, and when these indicators are not exactly the same or not very close to the agenda, uh, both agendas, then the level of alignment gets weaker. So we don't just talk about uh, uh, alignment in a binary way that is aligned or not aligned. We also have a mid-level, uh, what we call partial alignment, where the indicator captures to some degree the spirit of the uh, SDGs and Agenda 2063, but it's not exactly the same. So data is really another dimension. So it's data, prioritization. But also, there's another dimension, which is policy sequencing, right? Because um, national development plans are five-year, four-year plans, and the SDGs are 30, uh, uh, 15-year uh, program. So a country would probably say, well, in my five-year program, I'm going to target energy, water, and I know that when I address these, I'm also addressing some of the other uh, goals and targets. So the exercise in alignment is not simply about saying whether you're 90% or 20% aligned, but what is the underlying rationale? And that is what we try to tease out, not simply um, an exercise in you know, the degree of alignment, but really to understand whether there's a theory of change in the national plan, which means that maybe in subsequent plans, other aspects will be tackled, other aspects of the SDGs will be tackled. So is it because of a policy sequencing? And in some cases, that is the case. Now, on the, with respect to whether the 20, why the 2063 tends to be less or fall in danger of being left behind, I think it's, it's more of an advocacy. Uh, there's need for more advocacy. Um, but also, I think, when you are able to actually quantify the alignment and you see for sure that your alignment is skewed in one, for one goal uh, agenda as opposed to the the other, it then reminds countries that they need to rebalance. So the lack of an ability, of several countries' ability to really quantify the alignment is really um, a problem in terms of really going beyond saying I am aligned to actually saying um, this is the 
way I am aligned. Because even beyond the alignment to a particular, uh, to the SDGs, one would ask the question, are you more aligned towards the social sector and leaving out the environmental? Because even if you are 60% aligned, most of that would be simply focused on the social, leaving out the environmental. So we need to be a little bit more uh, empirical in terms of how we assess alignment, because that is, it is only then that we can begin a conversation about how to make national development plans more uh, responsive to that to meeting regional and global commitments. On the issue of partnerships in Africa, um, where are we? I would say that AFCFTA provides us the most robust framework for intra-Africa partnerships. If you look at the um, composition of trade among African countries, intra-Africa trade, manufacturing accounts for about 42% of that trade, intra-Africa trade. But when we trade with others, manufacturing is very low. What does that mean? It means that the intra-Africa market can be a stepping stone to refining our manufactured products and to eventually export them outside. So the, the partnership is at multi-levels. It is at the capacity building level, it's at the trade level, it's also could be at the financing level. And at the financing level, really it's, I would see it more in terms of how do we ensure that small countries that lack the endowments can still benefit from the endowments of other countries. So uh, DRC may have the capacity to produce energy. How do we share that with a, banana, a smaller country? So this kind of intra-regional uh, sharing and pooling of resources, as was manifested when African countries created a platform to procure vaccines as a collective, because as individual countries, they didn't have the the buying power to attract the attention of the suppliers. By pooling our resources, we're able to uh, muster enough uh, uh, buying power and, to, and therefore reduce um, uh, some of the, the prices that we paid for these vaccines. And it is, you know, we can also talk about regional health centers or centers of health, excellence in health, as opposed to having every country have uh, the best uh, clinics and so on and so forth. So this kind of pooling approach for me should be underpin some of our partnerships. I'll stop here uh, on those. Thank you. Thank you very much for these uh, responses. DG Mantali. I, I just want to add uh, a couple of things. Uh, Prof. Amar has uh, responded to the questions very well. Two things that I want to put forward is that first, the issue of alignment is also to do a lot more with our mindset. A lot of the times when we go back to our countries, the conviction that we take back is not that strong. We come here, we attend these meetings, but we get back there and say, they are saying that we should align. And not that we ourselves are convinced that alignment is an important feature. And I think as far as we still have that mindset, we will continue to have on the African continent meetings where resolutions never trickle down to domesticated in the national agendas. So I think that mindset has to really change if we're going to make this alignment possible beyond the capacity building element uh, that uh, Prof. Amar has pointed out. And again, when you're talking about the extent why Agenda 2030 versus Agenda 2063 is reflected in national development plans, I'll tell you a clear case of Malawi. When we are developing our, first, our, our vision, the Malawi 2063, and the first 10 year implementation plan to operationalize it, the UN agencies were all over us. Everybody, UNICEF, UNFPA, wanted population issues, this one wanted this. And so the alignment on Agenda 2030 received a lot more attention. The African Union was nowhere. So you have the African region, uh, uh, regional offices that I think to borrow his, I think the, his point of advocacy, but also activeness. As they say, he who has the money, you know, pays the pipe. So oftentimes, a lot more times, African uh, governments are having to be supported by these Afri uh, uh, UN agencies that pour money on them to align. Uh, but we are happy, actually, ECA is not just aligning, 
It's, an, it's, it's, it's a UN agency, but it's not aligning just Agenda 2030. In their integrated planning and reporting toolkit, they've also included Agenda 2063, which I would urge uh, member countries to take advantage of that if they really are going to make a dent. So I think I thought I should add that. My last point is to once again to say, as far as Africa remains behind in its self-reliance, that we're relying on others to, to, to design our programs based on resources from elsewhere, our plans will be aligned to elsewhere and not to the African continent. And therefore, we have to make sure that we uh, focus a lot more on creating wealth ourselves on the continent. So that that wealth then begins to drive us to a position where we can be self-reliant and be a formidable force in the international arena. Otherwise, we keep on having other agendas other than our own continental agendas. Thank you. Merci, merci. Il nous reste une petite dizaine de minutes si nous souhaitons commencer la session suivante à, à 6 heures. Euh, nous avons deux, deux possibilités. Soit nous faisons une courte pause, café de 10 minutes, et nous arrêterons. Dans ce cas, nous arrêterons cette session-là, ou nous reprenons une ou deux questions. Il y a une question. Nous prenons encore une question. Je vous en prie. Thank you. My name is Wamina Kwe from Ghana. Uh, my question is on the issue of leakages, and I think it came up in the report. I just want to find out if there are any recommendations on that, because it actually borders on efficiency, which also affects all the SDGs. Thank you. Okay, thank you, on, on linkages, so we would like to, or both you can respond to. Yes, um, on, on linkages, we all know that um, there are linkages, health and sanitation are linked um, to access to water, energy is linked to access to uh, education and even health and employment. Um, but I think to really go from that conceptual understanding of what of the existence of linkages, linkages to actually doing an analysis of what happens to my GDP or what happens to health when I improve access to water. If we can quantify those relationships, we can find certain sectors have a bigger impact on other sectors than some other sectors. So basically, there are some sectors with higher multiplier effects or with higher impacts. So, so um, but that means that we have to actually invest a little bit more in some modeling to really estimate what happens to employment when I increase my expenditures on, on say, energy. What happens to health when I improve my access to water? And which of these interventions has the biggest multiplier effect? That then helps you then to prioritize your interventions because countries have only have so much resources. And evidence based policy making has become even more important in the context of fiscal constraints. It's okay. So let's take a, a last question and then we'll close this uh, session. Yeah, there. Um, thank you very much. My name is Honorable Garang Majak from South Sudan. I greet you all, your excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I would like to echo excellent presentation by uh, the presenters. And my question will be short. I know for sure this is very important forum. It has brought a lot of expert and also stakeholders from all over Africa. I came from South Sudan as an individual, of course, my background. I used to be a PS in the Ministry of Finance and Planning. I do understand exactly what we're talking about, but I'm not here to represent South Sudan. I am invited as 
a consultant to come and also share with you what I think about uh, the agendas of, 20, 20, of 2030 and 2063. Now, I know for sure we're talking about alignments of national agendas together with other countries. For example, I want to say that Agenda 2030 is popular than Agenda 2063 because there is awareness on Agenda 2030. But Agenda 2063 is still unpopular because there is no awareness. In South Sudan, we know very well we are working toward the agenda of 2030. My question would be, of course, without finances, we will not be able to implement all this. Now, we know very well in Africa, there are issues of insecurity. And for us to mobilize financial resources, we must have access to each and every corner in Africa to mobilize resources. I know for sure we are actually competing on the resources that are circulating in the economy, but when it comes to us to grow as a continent, we must be able to produce goods and services. I would give you an example of South Sudan. We are endowed with a lot of natural resources, for example, oil, gold, and other minerals. But some of the countries, they are not accessible because of insecurity. My question to presenters are two. Number one, what are we doing as a continent to make sure that Africa is secure in terms of security and peace? Without that, we cannot develop without security and peace. Number two, what mechanism is in place for coordination? Because I know if we are to move together, leaving nobody behind by Agenda 2063, we must be coordinated in a manner that all resources are coordinated. The communication is also effective. Are we also aligning the leadership will to support the agendas of 2030 and 2063? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this uh, two linked questions. Who would like to respond? Yeah, DG. I, I think th th those are very important questions, but if you look at the continent already, there is a lot of efforts around, uh, you know, coordinating issues around security. I know the African Union and the regional economic communities have got arms uh, that deal with the issues of security because is considered one of the most important aspects. Matter of fact, the key aspiration of the African uh, Union in Agenda 2063 uh, is that we need uh, an integrated, prosperous, and peaceful continent. And I think that addition of peaceful was by design because you cannot achieve integration or prosperity if you're not peaceful. So security is so key. So I, I think efforts are there, uh, but what needs to transcend down as we earlier on pointed out, is to get those things to be aligned at the national level, that we begin to put in plans mechanisms for making sure that as regions, as countries, we're secure. Uh, so I think the coordination mechanism is really uh, already on the ground. But maybe, uh, Prof, you might wish to add. No, I, I'll, I'll touch on the security and development nexus. I think they are intertwined and bi-directional, meaning Without security, there's no development. Insecurity stabilizes development. And lack of development fuels insecurity uh, as well. I mean, the continent has a big youth, youthful population. Um, if you don't have jobs, they will find a way to survive, and they become possibly a fertile ground for recruitment. So um, while there are many drivers of insecurity, I would like to focus on the economic drive, drivers of insecurity. And so it really comes back to how do we grow our economies in a way that is inclusive, 
and empowers our youth economically so that they have a stake in the development of the country and not to the demise of the, econ of the, of the, of the economy. So, and how do we get the leaders to buy into this? I think if we can understand, if, if, if the lack of inclusive development poses an existential threat to the leadership, then I'm sure leaders will wake up to that uh, uh, threat. But this is not to say that economics is the only driver of insecurity, but at least that is where ECA is working on to, to try to address issues of development in a way that is sustainable. And really, that is really part of the, the story of a sustainable development, right? The development in all its dimensions, the economic, environmental, and social, but also the political dimension. Thank you very much, uh, Ba. Thank you very much, uh, DJ Montali. Just before closing this, this uh, session, some housekeeping issues. So uh, we start immediately after this session with the session on the VNR. So the session on that, that on statistics will be is postponed for tomorrow. So uh, you have the online the, the, the updated program. So please consult the uh, updated program online. And uh, we start at 9 tomorrow morning with the session on the data statistics, and the, the rest will be delayed by one hour. So without further delay, and before closing, I would like to reiterate, reiterate our congratulations to the election of the new bureau and the chair, uh, His Excellency Minister Uziel Ndagishidmala. Congratulations. Thank you. So let me invite the Deputy Executive Secretary of the ECA, Dr. Hanan Mercy, the moderator of the next session, that is shared also by, by His Excellency Minister Uziel Daji Kimana, and the panelists to join her, please. Please, could you put the names on the stage?
Good afternoon, um, and welcome to this um, plenary roundtable on voluntary national reviews uh, and peer learning to build forward better. We are delighted to have a distinguished panel today um, to really listen to uh, the experiences, challenges, opportunities, and uh, how can we even make the process work even better for the future. So uh, let me uh, first perhaps just uh, introduce the um, distinguished panel that we have today. Uh, we are uh, delighted to have Her Excellency, the Minister of Planning and Development of Cote d'Ivoire, Nayera Kaba, welcome. And um, warm welcome to the Minister of Digital uh, Economy and Innovation of Djibouti, Her Excellency uh, Mariam Hamoud Ali. Uh, and we're also joined by the uh, Deputy Minister of Economic Management of Liberia, uh, His Excellency Augustus uh, Flamo. And um, as well, we have the um, uh, SDG and Agenda 2063 expert, uh, Sara Taufi Hamouda. Uh, welcome. And um, we have uh, also the uh, lecturer in international relations, University of Namibia, uh, Rosetta, um, here with us. Uh, and we're also joined on by virtually uh, by uh, our, the uh, special representative of the Secretary General on Violence Against Children, uh, Najat Majid. Uh, welcome. So uh, let me just maybe start the session by... ...an overview uh, that, uh, and points where we should really be happy and proud about. Um, that we, we have a record number of 21 African countries undertaking voluntary national reviews of frameworks in place and progress uh, toward the SDGs and Agenda 2063 in this year, uh, 2022. And this is actually the largest number of countries from any region in one year. So it's something that you know, uh, we are proud of and uh, should be celebrating. And it shows that, that Africa is uh, really um, reflecting how the priority in Africa uh, and how uh, this really reflects the global and regional commitments uh, to ensure inclusive and green growth and development. Uh, and these VNRs, we've seen them increasing in uh, importance and um, specifically in terms of responses to COVID pandemic. Uh, what we want to um, you know, reflect today in terms of we want to uh, have time to look into uh, reflections from the outcomes of both the VNRs and VLR workshops that were held earlier this week. Uh, and to hear really experiences um, from uh, our distinguished panel. So um, perhaps we can uh, start by getting, um, you know, uh, our panelists to address a few issues in the first round. Uh, the things that I'd like the, uh, the panel to reflect on in terms of what do, we, do you see as good practices and lessons learned from the voluntary national reviews and follow-up process, and how um, how can you, what type of challenges you've been facing, and how does have really contributed to the um, you know policy reform, and particularly in terms of response to COVID. So, if we can start with you, Honourable Minister from Cote d'Ivoire. Merci, merci, Madame le Modérateur. Je voudrais euh, euh, la première à prendre la parole, donc euh, commencer par remercier sincèrement donc les autorités du Rwanda pour euh, 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 l'accueil 
et toutes les commodités dont la délégation ivoirienne et moi-même avons euh, bénéficié euh, à l'occasion de ce forum. Remercier également donc euh, euh, les Nations Unies et la CEA de nous associer à cet, à cet exercice qui est un exercice extrêmement important. Euh, alors, le, il faut dire que les ODD, le, le VNR et tout cet exercice a été mis en place, donc euh, a commencé avec euh, euh, la reprise de façon active et volontariste d'un processus de planification dans mon pays. Et nous sommes euh, depuis 2012 au troisième plan quinquennal et euh, les ODD ont été adoptés donc, au cours du deuxième plan quinquennal et avec l'appui de la CEA et d'autres agences du système des Nations Unies, nous avons fait cet exercice d'alignement un exercice d'alignement euh, qui nous a permis d'intégrer les ODD dans le, déjà le deuxième plan national de développement. Et bien entendu, nous sommes en application du troisième. L'alignement également a été fait. Il faut dire que la Côte d'Ivoire a déjà fait le VNR en 2019. C'est un exercice qui est utile. C'est un exercice qui est important parce que ça nous permet en réalité à la fois de mesurer les pas euh, vers euh, les efforts que nous faisons pour euh, atteindre les objectifs, mais également ça nous permet de mettre l'accent sur les défis. Et à cet égard, donc, ça permet, on va dire, d'ajuster les mesures de politique économique. Nous, nous avons, dans le cadre de notre planification un exercice annuel que nous faisons à la fois avec les bailleurs de fonds, avec la société civile, avec le secteur privé, c'est d'essayer d'évaluer la mise en œuvre du plan national de développement chaque année. Ça s'apparente un peu à l'exercice d'auto-évaluation en, en regardant les progrès et euh, c'est une bonne pratique qui permet, qui facilite l'exercice du VNR et le fait de le rendre inclusif euh, euh, entraîne, on va dire, l'ensemble des parties prenantes dans le processus. C'est un exercice intéressant puisqu'il il est en lien aussi un peu avec la redevabilité de l'État par rapport donc, euh, au processus de développement. Il faut dire que les défis sont importants. Le premier que je ne cesse de répéter, c'est le défi de la donnée statistique. Dans mon pays et comme dans beaucoup d'autres pays, j'imagine, nous ne disposons pas d'un système statistique solide qui mette à disposition des données à la fois avec la régularité nécessaire, mais également avec le niveau de désagrégation qui permette de calculer tous les indicateurs pour le suivi des ODD. C'est en lien avec le coût de la statistique, c'est cher, le produit n'est pas un produit matériel, et nous, les décideurs, nous ne nous, nous rendons pas compte toujours que des statistiques publiques fiables et de qualité, c'est précurseur à de bonnes politiques publiques. Euh, le deuxième défi, bien sûr, c'est le défi du financement des ODD eux-mêmes, madame. Euh, vous savez que euh, nous sommes en face d'indicateurs, nous sommes en face de secteurs qui ne peuvent pas toujours souffrir sur le long terme de financement de ressources de marché. Donc, nous avons besoin de ressources constitutionnelles pour financer durablement et massivement les ODD. Nous avons également besoin d'espace budgétaire. Je pense que c'est une question récurrente qui revient. Et à cet égard, il est important d'attirer donc euh, de, de solliciter donc les, les agences du système national du, du, du système des Nations Unies pour accompagner nos pays notamment dans euh, euh, le recouvrement efficace des ressources intérieures euh, qu'est-ce que je, en, en termes de leçons qu'est-ce que je peux également dire sur ce, le VNR en réalité, c'est un exercice qui est un exercice complet et qui met en évidence également la nécessité pour nos États de se transformer et qui pose la question de la transformation structurelle. Elle est importante, elle est multidimensionnelle, 
euh, parce que, euh, en définitive, les ressources que nous mettons en, 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 en œuvre sont des ressources que nous avons besoin d'arbitrer entre la génération de ressources et entre faire face à, euh, euh, aux questions euh, spécifiques des ODD, à savoir les questions de l'inclusion, euh, l'emploi, l'éducation, la formation et la santé. Donc, dire que c'est cet exercice qui, qui met en, en avant la complexité du processus de développement, qui, de, qui met en avant euh, également donc, la nécessité que ces questions soient abordées ensemble, de façon euh, concomitante, mais également avec euh, 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 le défi de pouvoir les financer de façon durable, sans faire exploser nos dettes qui sont toujours un élément euh, 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 en travail, et également donc en ayant l'accompagnement nécessaire pour pouvoir donc avoir l'espace budgétaire nécessaire. Je voudrais m'arrêter là. Merci, madame. Thank you very much, madame minister. Um, and now, if we could uh, turn to uh, our next panelist to hear the experience um, actually from Djibouti. Uh, and I know this is uh, the first VNR, so we, you're not at the stage of uh, kind of telling us more about the reforms that happened as a result, but perhaps you can tell us more about the challenges and how you see the process working. Merci, Madame Présidente. Je, je rejoins les intervenants euh, avant moi et remercie le, le Président et le peuple rwandais. Euh, pour l'accueil chaleureux. Je crois qu'on devoir m'arranger. Euh, euh, Djibouti n'a pas encore euh, fait son rapport euh, euh, à l'examen de VNR. Euh, elle avait programmé en 2019, mais euh, l'agenda n'était pas... Euh, on avait une élection et ce n'était pas possible. Mais tous les résultats étaient disponibles pour euh, élaborer ces, ces rapports. Euh, C'est prévu maintenant... Euh, à partir de en juillet, le, Djibouti va présenter son rapport. Et euh, je voulais juste, comme les rapports, euh, le VNR découle de, 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 de la revue à euh, mes parcours de politique sectorielle et politique nationale du pays, peut-être un peu euh, vous décrire ce que Djibouti a, a produit et réalisé et quel est euh, son niveau d'engagement par rapport euh, aux ODD. Il faut savoir une chose. Euh, Djibouti était, avait adopté à une vision euh, qui a précédé l'agenda 2063. Je crois qu'on était dix euh, pays à avoir euh, une vision avant l'agenda 2063. Et des experts euh, euh, de l'Union africaine sont venus à Djibouti. C'était de voir un peu la méthodologie que nous avons utilisée pour élaborer cette vision. Et dans la salle tout à l'heure, une personne avait posé la question en demandant pourquoi l'agenda 2063 n'est pas aussi important que le, le programme 2030. L'agenda 2063, c'est les priorités et la vision de tous les pays africains. J'ai été, euh, oui, été vraiment associée à cet exercice en tant que euh, directrice du plan à l'époque. Je me rappelle que l'Union africaine, lorsqu'elle travaillait sur l'agenda 2063, euh, c'était un processus participatif. Ils ont été dans tous les pays du continent et euh, essayer de voir un peu les défis euh, de chaque pays. L'agenda La, 2063, c'est notre vision. Maintenant, à côté, euh, juste après, nous avons, euh, euh, à travers euh, nos institutions en hein, l'Union africaine, la CA, euh, le système des Nations unies a soumis à, aux pays africains l'agenda 2030. Je trace un peu l'historique parce que c'est des agendas, c'est complète et ça, ça vient de, de, des aspirations des la, de, 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 de décideurs euh, du continent africain. Et euh, ils ne sont pas contradictoires. L'agenda 2063 comme euh, le programme 2030, ils sont complémentaires. Peut-être que euh, l'agenda 2063 ne, ne donne pas de priorité, n'est pas, pas aussi précis que euh, les ODD, l'agenda 2030. Nous, en ce qui nous concerne, Djibouti, qui avait initié euh, 
cette euh, étude prospective 2035, nous avons été associés à cet exercice et peut-être même contribué à l'agenda 2063 parce que les experts sont venus nous demander la méthodologie que nous avions utilisée à l'époque. Cette, cette vision qui précédait l'agenda a été suivie par son plan quinquennal qui euh, était à quelques mois avant l'agenda 2030. La, le premier plan quinquennal avait, euh, on avait fini le, le, et soumis au Parlement. Après, euh, on avait une idée des ODD, des objectifs qui ont été arrêtés, mais le, les ODD n'étaient pas encore adoptés en 2014. Et nous avions juste aligné les 17 objectifs aux, aux 8 euh, priorités de notre plan quinquennal. Un travail a été fait après, par la suite, avec, euh, on a sollicité le PNUD parce que euh, comme notre plan arrivait une année avant ou quelques mois avant l'agenda 2030, on a voulu voir les degrés d'appropriation et d'alignement de, de nos objectifs aux ODD. Et cette analyse, euh, le hein, l'analyse euh, intégrée, euh, le système que le PNUD utilise, a montré que nos priorités étaient alignées à 80% des, euh, aux objectifs et aux cibles des ODD. On avait juste euh, observé au niveau de la statistique une faible appropriation des indicateurs au niveau national. On était à un, un pourcentage de 30%, et ce qui nous a un peu euh, poussé à, à préparer euh, avec euh, l'Institut de la statistique une, une, un, un état des lieux pour voir euh, comment euh, approcher les indicateurs des ODD aux indicateurs euh, du pays. Et nous avons identifié euh, une centaine d'indicateurs que nous serons prêts à renseigner des ODD. Et ces indicateurs aujourd'hui ont été validés par le gouvernement et un certain nombre de cibles. Et c'est vrai que le document, le VNR, n'a pas été élaboré à Djibouti, mais euh, à travers nos politiques, en suivant nos priorités, nous avons toujours regardé du côté, voir un peu au niveau des ODD. Il y a une chose, peut-être que ce n'est pas le cas dans tous les pays. Chez nous, nous avons observé en 2018, lorsqu'on a fait un atelier de sensibilisation, que certains départements en secteur n'étaient même pas informés de ces ODD. Il était question d'associer et surtout former au niveau sectoriel, au ministère de l'Agriculture, certains départements mener leur propre politique et sans pour autant mettre à côté les ODD, les cibles des ODD. C'est là que nous avions commencé à faire un plaidoyer, une sensibilisation. Et on a trouvé que c'était un peu tôt pour nous d'élaborer un rapport s'il si, euh, n'y a pas une appropriation au niveau sectoriel, surtout une, la société civile n'était pas encore bien imprégnée de, de l'ODD. Nous, nous trouvions qu'en 2019, que c'était un peu prématuré, qu'il fallait euh, engager quelques actions des ateliers de sensibilisation. Aujourd'hui, nous sommes prêts. Nous avions arrêté nos cibles, euh, les indicateurs. Nous sommes à notre deuxième plan quinquennal. Le travail qui, a, qui est fait euh, dans, pendant l'élaboration du deuxième plan, nous avons associé les systèmes des Nations Unies. Je ne sais pas si le coordonnateur, le représentant du coordonnateur du, du, est, est présent dans la salle, mais on a voulu que le deuxième plan soit euh, à l'image, et même une appropriation, même une intégration des ODD, les piliers avec les cibles, les sous-programmes avec encore les cibles prioritaires, les indicateurs, et le deuxième plan euh, pour indiquer un peu le niveau d'engagement de, 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 de nos politiques, le deuxième plan contient dans son cadre de résultats les indicateurs des ODD. Je dirais que c'est une, un parfait, un parfait, une, une parfaite appropriation que nous avions fait dans le cadre du deuxième plan, je vous dis ici. Nous n'avons pas cité pendant ces années, c'est vrai que l'année dé la, la, dernière, 2020-2021, nous avons, comme tous les pays, été perturbés par le Covid, mais nous avons toujours voulu respecter nos, les calendriers parce qu'on a euh, cette vision et, et cette vision nous indique des orientations et on s'est donné le moyen de réaliser au moins nos, nos grands objectifs. Voilà un peu, le VNR est, est possible. Le, les collègues sont là pour euh, confirmer dimanche le lancement officiel sera fait. Je vous tiens inscrit dans l'agenda pour présenter en juillet 2022 le premier rapport du VNR. Mais entre-temps, nous avions toujours voulu rester présents et surtout ne pas s'éloigner des agendas mondiaux, l'agenda 2063 comme l'agenda 2030. Merci. 
Thank you very much for uh, your insights. Um, I think what we've heard so far uh, from both um, Djibouti and Côte d'Ivoire is basically that uh, it, the process has been useful in terms of tracking progress, uh, engaging stakeholders, validating, and the challenges that have been, I think, uh, emphasized by both are the quality of data and statistics, um, the issues of uh, uh, challenges to really ensure advocacy and ownership, um, and then later on the issues of budget and financing. Thank you very much for these insights. And now we turn to uh, His Excellency from Liberia to tell us more uh, in terms of, um, you know, Liberia had already completed DNRs before. So how have you seen the process in terms of uh, helping in driving policy reforms? Uh, and how, you know, how has this shaped or helped in the res response to COVID? Hello? Yeah, it's Thank working. You. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I uh, first let me say thanks to, to, to all of you for, for this wonderful platform to allow us to share um, with, with you uh, our experience. Uh, so yes, yeah, 2020 we did a presentation. Um, we had started before COVID with all the preparation. Uh, interestingly, in, in Liberia, when we started the SDGs, uh, and of course, Agenda 2063, which is aligned with our national development plan, we, as a government, we, we took the ownership. So we took the lead to um, to begin to get the engagements uh, of, of the stakeholders and at the same time trying to ensure that um, the specific areas of interest based on what our national development plan says, which aligns with the SDGs, uh, w you know, were, were being looked at. Very, very common as, as others was, 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 I mean, have said already, data was a problem. Data was a problem. Um, the quality of data that we we generate um, uh, most of the time is challenged because of the fact that coming from the subnational level to that of the national systems, uh, there, there there are lots of you know still disconnect. L let me say that Th there are still disconnect. So the the exercise allow us to to identify those disconnects. It allow us to, to know that uh, why we from the Ministry of Finance and from the national government working to, to ensure that we are communicating, that we are talking about you know, the agenda and the national development plan working together and ensuring that is, is, you know, the results are coming. There was a feedback from, from the ground that says, no, you know, we, we, we don't seem to, to get what you're talking about. So that gave us uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, advantage in, in trying to prepare for the second review because then it, it allowed us to pick up some of the gaps. Unfortunately, the first time we were doing presentation, we was 2020, uh, 20, uh, 20, was uh, during the time of COVID. COVID had just come and then uh, all the planning changed from physical into, into virtual. Um, but we were able to also adjust to move into the virtual terrain. Yes, there were a lot of challenges in trying to get those in the rural areas to participate because then they disconnected from connectivity. So that, that became, uh, became a very important uh, factor for us to consider as a government. Um, we also realized that in the in the in the in the process of identifying and ensuring that the indicators that we are reporting on uh, directly working in line with uh, or they are kind of aligned with our national development agenda became also you know a matter of concern uh, because 
in the SDGs reporting, most times people get lost into, into talking more about the SDGs than the actual issues of the key alignment of national development priorities that are linked with the SDGs. Mm -hmm. So with, with the gap of that linkage, uh, you, you will find that the development partners on one end will put more, will try to put more emphasis on SDGs reporting, whereby the government will want to be saying, look, SDGs is the same as our national development plan. Because out of the SDGs, the global picture is our national ownership. Mm -hmm. So we, we have to first see how the, 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 the relationship between the, the global indicators I, I speaking to the national indicator so that the alignment and the communication of that report is realistic. So I think that's that's one lesson and one key issue that we, we also we also said, I mean we, we recognized it. And there was the whole issue about alignment. Along the reporting corridor, there's a concern about alignment with uh, external resources and alignment with national resources. So when you talk alignment, the, the most of the time conversation that the alignment has been done at the policy level. So you see all the, the documentation, the literatures, all will say yes, um, you know, this goal meets your national development plan goal, say two, for example. And, and, but if you go to the activity level, there's a disconnect also at that level of alignment. So between the SDGs, uh, local, you know, in the local context, we need to see how the, the, the connection between the, the understanding of the development partners on what alignment is and to that of the understanding of the government to what alignment is in the context of reporting on the SDGs and that of the, the activities that they were implementing. So that, that, was, that was another concern I, I think we saw coming very clear, that alignment was probably misunderstood uh, along the conversation between development partners and, some, uh, and the government on, on the other end. But uh, in 2022, which, which we, are now, we are now moving on, uh, lessons learned from, from 2020, 2020 present, uh, presentation now allows us to, to know that uh, we have to go on this with one approach. So we now have uh, a team uh, set, to, uh, set up in Liberia on, on this second review that is now capturing and enlisting and making sure that all the stakeholders are included and that we understand from which anger we are reporting and what we are doing as a team. So that exercise have allowed us to, to then be able to, to see the opportunities that we need to, to explore. For example, uh, some of the ch key challenges we pick up in the first review were data quality. So how do we then capture, uh, overcome that issue? So we're looking at the national systems on data collection, you know, data measurement, how, how does that speak to our national statistics, you know, as, as a whole. We also, <clears throat> we are pushing, we launch our national aid policy, you know, for the first time in, in Liberia, which created a tool called the Liberia Project Dashboard. In that tool, we, we, we tried as much as possible to align projects, which is at the activity level now, to align projects to national development agenda, to SDG goals, agenda 2063. So if, if you go to, it's, it's an open source uh, if, uh, database we have online. If you just type Liberia Project Dashboard on Google, you will see the system you know, that provides an opportunity for us to have a systematic way of trying to capture you know, data, whether from the government perspective or what areas we are investing into or from the development you know, partners perspective as to what we are investing into you know, for us to be able to do. So that's the uh, lesson learned from, 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 
from 2020, allowing us to strengthen uh, this, this, this angle. Um, and another thing we've tried to do is to also ensure that uh, the MAE system, the national MAE system, uh, becomes a system that is acceptable to, to all. It, it has to be a system that, uh, you know, you, you don't have development finance or external resources reporting in one, one end and then uh, government reporting in the other end. It has to be, uh, the data has to speak to what is happening in Liberia. So that monetary mechanism has to monitor everything, government and development intervention, uh, external resource intervention. And, and then, of course, there is a citizen feedback mechanism, uh, which was supported by the, the United Nations uh, program in Liberia that allows citizens from, from all over the country, uh, especially those who have uh, internet access, to go online and look at what's happening, programs that are working, things that government is doing, what the development partners are doing, and providing feedback through that system so that we are able to sit in, say, Monrovia, and, and hear what the guy in, uh, in Bangladesh is, is thinking about what the particular implementation looks like or feeds into the national system. And so that, 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 uh, that uh, system is, is now up and, and running, and, and we really hope that it will help us sufficiently on this, on this uh, 2022 uh, review. And, and, and of course, looking into the future, we, we believe that uh, the reporting for VNR and, and the SDGs vis-a-vis uh, -vis the National Development uh, Plan <coughs> should, should, be really, should be really looked at in a way that prioritize and deploy resources. I, I will give you an, a classic example. Liberia has two critical binding, I will call them, constraints. Roads, connectivity, and energy. Uh, my, my, my sister from Cote d'Ivoire knows that uh, we have the West African power pool coming out of Cote d'Ivoire, coming to Liberia that we, we will be benefiting from as part of the regional connectivity and, and, this, and the programming we're trying to do. Without good roads, uh, we are unable to deliver education on time. We are unable to develop, I mean, to de deliver health services on time, you know, and, and, and to get the services to the right places. But in, the, in, the, in, in, in what we've seen as part of the challenge we've had is, is the fact that alignment is still an issue and we believe that looking into the future, the UN systems should work and other development partners should work with the countries uh, to ensure that you are actually addressing the binding constraints that will unlock a lot of other potentials. Because if we are able to do good roads and do electricity, now we can supply, uh, you know, health services, educational services, uh, using those 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 highways uh, that will be that will be developed or that will be extended. Out of uh, of 15 counties, country, you have just about five counties connected by paved roads. But now, in the connectivity, in the alignment, in the reporting to the SDGs and the national development agenda, the government pushes a priority on road construction on energy access, and then, and then there's, a, there's another side of it that focuses on something else which may not be meeting up with some of the, the issues. So there, there, are, there are things that we think in the future that we should really pay attention to when it comes to national priority uh, settings and alignment, and ensuring that, of course, the, the right resources, the right financing are kind of programmed to support uh, governments and countries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think we've um, added to the uh, insights and the issues that are raised, uh, one on how the VNR has been useful to really in getting the pulse, uh, filling gaps, alignment of national, you know, helping in better alignment between national priorities and SDGs, uh, and uh, enhancing, helping raise awareness on the need to enhance communication um, and align reporting um, uh, so that, uh, uh, you know, it's, there is less misunderstanding between the achievements and how, uh, how it's be viewed by partners. Uh, and uh, also uh, uh, the value of citizen uh, feedback mechanisms. Uh, 
and I hear the, from you the need to focus on uh, the most binding constraints. Thank you very much. Um, and now if we can get uh, the insights from you, Sarah, on uh, the cross-country perspective, having seen this process across countries, really the lessons learned uh, on how we can make it even better. Thank you. So, uh, good evening, uh, um, early afternoon. I don't know how, um, how I should address the audience now. Um, but thank you so much for giving us the, the chance to be here today. Uh, I'm giving this um, uh, speech or remarks on behalf of Professor Edi Maloka, who extends his apology to all of you. He was really hoping to join this panel, but due to the delays we had, he couldn't stay for long to follow the discussions. Um, uh, allow me to thank first the Republic of Rwanda for a great organization of the forum and to also thank UNECA for inviting me to be part of this panel. Uh, reflecting on your question, um, uh, Madam Moderator, uh, I will focus on the good practices, lessons learned from uh, the, v the VNRs and follow-up processes and also the support that could be given uh, by partners at regional and global levels. So first of all, the African Peer Review Mechanism, the EPRM, under the expanded mandate, and it, it's of course part of the African Union, has been committed since 2017 to support knowledge sharing and peer learning um, capacities for the voluntary national reporting, uh, preparations and reporting on Agenda 2063. EPRM was designated a mandate by the African Union Assembly to play a role in the monitoring and the evaluation of both agendas. Uh, given the strong uh, congruence and also similarity between both agendas, and of course the relevance between development and governance nexus, we are also keen to link uh, these processes with the EPRM core mandate pertinent to uh, good governance assessment reviews among African countries. Um, actually, EPRM has, a, uh, has got a practice uh, of organizing an annual peer learning continental workshop in VNRs to complement unique and EU efforts to offer a regional platform for member states uh, to present national processes, methods of working and challenges on preparations of VNRs. Over the last three years, we organized three workshops in Ethiopia, Rwanda, and actually last year was in Djibouti. And I'm very honored to share the panel today with my sister, Dr. Mariam, because she was one of the speakers at the EPRM workshop in Djibouti in February last year. While acknowledging the challenges in preparing VNRs, African countries have also exerted efforts that could be classified as best, best practices, especially in the COVID-19 times. I have four key areas to focus on. First, creating necessary institutional mechanisms to prepare for the VNR processes and promote national multi-stakeholder approach is visibly improving between African countries. We take note that since 2017, African governments founded high-level ministerial and technical committees to collaborate on developing VNRs and align development visions with SDGs and Agenda 2063, as the, uh, my distinguished ministers already alluded from three different countries. For instance, we also realized while conducting the national governance reviews that countries like Uganda, Kenya, Egypt, South Africa, Côte d'Ivoire, Senegal, and Sierra Leone established special task force uh, for VNRs and Agenda 2063 planning. These efforts are, are commendable and allow also for non-state actors like civil society organizations, youth, and women groups to be better engaged in the national decision making. Second, and connecting to the first point, um, African countries are also taking the lead in uh, revising the national development plans and prioritizing certain goals based on national needs and uh, uh, challenges. For instance, we heard from Lesotho yesterday that the country started to prioritize goal one, uh, which addresses poverty reduction alongside other goals. In Senegal, Nigeria, and Sierra Leone, EPRM was honored to work with the governments to ensure integrating uh, some recommendations on good governance, SDG 16 uh, goal into national development plans to enhance also, an, and also to enhance other goals like education, health, and gender equality. Uh, Sierra Leone and Nigeria in particular are also um, um, briefed already EPRM earlier that they prioritize SDG 3 due to the COVID-19 crisis. 
Um, APRM likewise created a network on national development planning to discuss alignment of SDGs, Agenda 2063 recommendations, but also and, and further also discuss the issue of resilience and to what extent countries are uh, adopting resilient frameworks into NDPs. And unfortunately, as uh, emphasized by the previous presenter, uh, Mr. Arma from UNECA, we have few African countries uh, integrating resilient frameworks into national development plans. Uh, my third observation, Madam Moderator, is that also developing national indicators to report on a specific goals like SG16, which addresses good governance issues, i.e., for instance, illicit financial flows, human rights, rule of law, accountability and inclusiveness, is also progressing despite low performance in the last decade. African countries took different measures to domesticate development agendas guided by SDGs indicators and Agenda 2063, which is an excellent uh, practice. And I believe Rwanda is a leading example uh, in developing certain governance indicators to promote good governance uh, principles. Rwanda devotes to participation and inclusiveness as one of the key indicators measuring the state of governance in the country. Further, the Rwanda Governance Board adopted the Rwanda Governance Score uh, scorecard, which includes eight pillars for good governance assessment, including decentralization, quality of service delivery, fighting corruption, and accountability. This is one of the best practices that could assist other African countries in preparing VNRs and reporting on certain goals with an adequate data and even promote focused group uh, discussions to assess these issues. We truly look forward to also sharing Rwanda's experience in this regard with other African countries. Fourth, and this is also related to the lessons learned, um, starting early as soon as possible to prepare for such a, a VNR process, adequate coordination between government bodies, national ownership to strengthen subnational communities' engagement, and develop an adequate template for data collection alongside qualitative analysis of some social issues, i.e. social co uh, cohesion, resilience, um, and also um, gender inequalities are necessary to be considered. Um, lastly, but not least, on the support provided by the partners at regional and, lo and global levels. Um, here we have three key messages as EPRM, and um, we are trying to be as also frank as possible with our partners. That first, the role of the African Union is indeed strategic to address coherence issues between the global and regional partners in Africa, as well as to avoid proliferation of activities. We have a quite coherent partnership with the United Nations, thanks to the AU-UN framework for the implementation of both agendas. Uh, and thus, we can see more horizontal partnerships are developed between the African Union and UN in the last five years. UNDP and UNECA are also strategic partners to EPRM. They used to be engaged in the governance assessment reviews since 2010 and even earlier. And they used to also cooperate on uh, activities like VNRs. However, more resources shall be considered for their engagement uh, in the continent. Second, and this is related more to EPRM, we work with member states uh, actually at two levels. The first level is to engage the regional economic communities. The engagement of regional economic communities is extremely important in the conversation on programming with member states. They are key drivers uh, for Africa's progress in achieving both agendas. And they have also um, uh, been providing member states with a lot of guidance during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and many of them, uh, especially COMESA, ECOWAS, IGAD, they started to integrate uh, some of SDG's elements into their regional views. Secondly, EPRM developed strategic partnerships with different development partners, including the European Union, GIZ, African Development Bank, as well as UNDESA to support national capacities in preparing VNRs and improve measuring the implementation of some of the aspects like UN SIPA principles for effective governance of SDGs, which were endorsed by ECOSOC in 2018 to improve reporting on SDG 16 in the continent. Third and finally, we acknowledge that no single country has fully recovered from the pandemic. The recovery scenario from COVID-19 necessitates actually an adequate SDGs financing strategy, national SDGs financing strategy for most of African countries. And this is recommended to be developed by the government and supported by regional and UN organizations. 
during the latest EPRM VNRs workshop in Djibouti, uh, as I mentioned before, the representatives of African countries clearly refer, refer to the persistent distinction between Agenda 2063 and Agenda 2030 at domestic level. And they also called for better collaboration between UNECA, AUC, EPRM, and SDG Center for Africa to work closely together to come up with an integrated uh, monitoring and evaluation tools to track both agendas. The harmonization of the different monitoring and reporting system remain important to overcome the reporting fatigue before member states. I guess this is the kind of support we should focus on for more reliable, accurate, and inclusive VNRs and local reviews in Africa. I thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I think we've discussed a lot of things. Uh, maybe a couple, a few things that um, takeaways would be uh, the fact that uh, countries really tailored these national reviews to align with their priorities. So they um, focused on SDGs that are most relevant to their circumstances and current priorities. Uh, and the uh, advice to uh, take advantage by uh, starting early um, cooperation across uh, the different uh, um, national entities and ministries, um, ensuring national ownership uh, and the uh, um, you know, need for uh, perhaps establishing an integrated monitoring and reporting. Thank you. So uh, now to you, um, Rosetta. Uh, we're glad to have you here and uh, look forward to hearing from you as the, you know, uh, our uh, youth voice and um, uh, views in terms of how you see the process um, and how we can really have the whole process even more inclusive and, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, meeting the inspiration of the youth. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Madam Moderator. Firstly, I would like to um, acknowledge um, recognition of the Honorable Minister of Finance uh, of Rwanda, the chairperson of the session. Um, my Honorable Minister of uh, Basic Education, um, Arts and Culture, as well as the Deputy Minister of um, ICT of Namibia. Thank you very much. Um, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to highlight the fact that um, Namibia presented um, the VNR twice um, in 2018 and 2021 in July. And the nation is committed in um, trying to integrate the implementation process of, 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 of the Agenda 2030. So these SDGs um, can be viewed as national Okay, that can be used uh, by Namibia to enable uh, monitoring of the progress of our national development agendas um, as they are aligned. And I take note of the whole alignment issue that was also brought up. Um, but we, our our national development agendas are aligned to the SDGs. We have the NDP five, we have the um, Harambe Prosperity Plan two, as well as the Vision 2030 of Namibia that are in, um, aligned to. Um, the SDGs. Now to bring, um, to answer your question basically, <laughs> um, the VNR report and the reviews, um, they assist in understanding the impact of programs and policies towards um, realizing sustainable development, both nationally as globally as well. So there are certain um, areas, key areas of interventions that um, um, the review uh, process had um, focused on that had to do with in, uh, economic integration, environmental sustainability, um, social transformation, as well as good governance. Um, but to highlight some of the challenges um, or how we can actually address the challenges that we are commonly facing, that have already been mentioned by a few countries um, that we're presenting here on data and statistics that has to do with inclusivity and so on, how we can address those issues. Perhaps we could encourage and ensure a broad-based participation in sustainable development. 
if we have to look at, um, for example, issue of, 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 of um, access to quality education, what our um, um, Namibia has done is um, obviously being assisted by um, the review process we have ensured that we have access to quality education from a, uh, from a, a very younger age, zero to five, uh, uh, ages from zero to five, to have quality education. Um, we have in, um, somehow also introduced um, no payment for school fees uh, on secondary and primary um, levels as well, as well as um, issues around, um, for example, um, in, um, encouraging ICT, you know, ICT in, in, in the system of um, international, and uh, not international, but uh, primary, secondary, and tertiary institutions as a form of enhancing e-learning. Now, in the process, um, when we conducted the APRM report, we looked at um, addressing gender equality and focusing on the girl-child under Objective 4 of socioeconomic development. Um, something that uh, the VNR also highlights, um, and, and the language basically speaks, um, is, is in line. However, um, when we address gender parity, we should also, as much as we are um, encouraging and motivating gen um, the girl child, one thing that we should also probably engage in is, 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 is access to education for the boy child, and COVID-19 has actually magnified the issue around access to, the bo uh, to education for the boy child. What is happening is um, the boy child, because of COVID and other activities have been left behind. Um, this is due to access perhaps to e-learning. Um, as much as it's available, you know, um, we have been having channels that are encouraging girl child to have access or not, not to leave behind the boy child as well. It's equally available for everybody. However, however, we have now boy child that's not returning to school, you know, especially as much as there's been availability of, 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 of e-learning uh, facilities and so on. And obviously that now leads to um, criminal activities or potential rise in, in criminal activities um, in, 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 in our communities. And that is something that has been magnified by, by, by um, COVID-19. So what we need to do um, is to perhaps raise awareness, continue to raise awareness of gender parity and to strive a balance between the two um, genders. And this would perhaps help if we have to mentor young men and women in championing gender equality, encouraging them to um, obviously stay in school and so on. And also in the process of, of, of um, ensuring that we address um, issues around um, employment, for example, we should um, try to have invest more into uh, human capital development as a nation as well. And also, um, that we can now do through obviously highlighting the need for resource and, and capacity assistance and funding from regional and global development partners. And lastly, just to highlight um, one more thing, um, Namibia uh, has a status of uh, upper income, um, up, upper middle income country. Now that um, somehow challenges um, the country in, 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 in it when it comes to access to, to, to um, funding, external funding, because now we have stakeholders such as the civil society organizations that depend highly on external funding, and that status could, could somehow create um, some sort of inequality amongst community because now there's a widening gap between the rich and the poor as well, and we are trying to develop a, a middle income um, um, class, you know, develop growth in middle income class for the country, uh, for the, for the country as well. So that question of, or, or, or that statement of, of Namibia being a upper middle income um, country, is it rather, we should rather look at it, should we rather look at it as a trap or how can we address that issue? Because it's affecting, um, or it, it basically blocks the access to adequate funding for the country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I think um, it is, uh, 
really useful to hear th these views. Uh, I think you've emphasized the issue of broad-based participation. Yeah. Making sure that no one is left behind, including child boy. Um, and the need to invest in human capital development. And you also raised a, a very uh, important issue that actually came even in discussions when uh, I was in Namibia like a week ago, which is the issue that uh, the slide that the country is the second highest in terms of inequality um, because of the um, high level of income, uh, the concessional financing that is available for other countries is not available there. Yeah. So definitely this becomes a challenge in terms of how you deal with this uh, and what type of resources you can tap. Thank you very much. Um, and now if we can uh, turn to uh, the special representative of the Secretary General on Violence, Najat, to uh, give us uh, her uh, reflections and thoughts on how to mainstream um, issues of children in the BNR process. Najat? Thank you a lot. Do you hear me well? Because I had many problems of connection. Sometimes I hear you, sometimes not. It's okay? We don't it's fine? hear you yet. Uh, the, do you hear me? Yes, now I now we do. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, wonderful. So thank uh, I thank you so much. I just wanted to allow me to react very quickly, and I am happy to speak just after uh, the previous, uh, you know, speakers with uh, representing the youth perspective. And uh, what is important is first that she was highlighting the human capital development. And I want to remind all the countries that Africa is one of the most populous and youngest countries. And these younger people had to be seen as a human capital to invest on and not as a problem to resolve because, you know, they didn't anticipate. So I think it's really, really important. She highlighted also another thing that I will also uh, stress is also the inclusivity of, you know, uh, during all the process. And I think we have to switch from seeing the VNR only as a report, but as a process. And why it's important also to make sure that within this process, we ensure inclusiveness, we ensure wide mobilization of all key stakeholders, including children and young people themselves, because they have to be seen as actors of change, as part of solution, as not only as a recipient, passive recipient of services. This is one. The other point, when you see the SDGs, the 17 SDGs, and when you see Agenda 2063, and when you, we forget always, always Agenda 2040, the African one for children, you have to see that all the SDGs are interlinked. You cannot end, you know, violence against children and gender-based violence if you are not fighting poverty, discrimination, if you are not building uh, social justice, if you are not building peace. All these points are important. And it is why it's really important during all my uh, work with the countries who are presenting their VNR since 2019, it's really to reach each country and after UN country team, national authorities, civil society, children and young people themselves and all other key stakeholders to make sure that child protection, child and gender sensitive violence prevention and protection are embedded and mainstreaming within all the SDGs. This is very important. The other point, I think we need to build on also the lessons learned from the pandemic that highlighted, you know, the uh, inequalities that were, were already existing, social inequalities, the weaknesses of systems that highlighted the increase of violence against children, domestic violence, violence online, the socioeconomic impact of the pandemic that it is, is increasing violence, but is increasing also child labor, early marriage that already was existing, trafficking, enrollment, you know, in armed groups, in terrorist groups, and in the same time showed us that it has an impact on mental health. So we need to learn on the, to build on these lessons learned, to move from this silo approach, from this donor-driven approach, to an integrated and interlinked approach 
linking all these services and making them people-centered for children and their caregivers. What it means? It means education that is, has to be safe, inclusive, empowering. It means digital literacy. It means protection mechanism, you know, for children and for women. It means also child and gender sensitive justice. It means birth registration. And it means also parenting and family support. And it means social protection that is sustainable, uh, tackling all the most vulnerable people children, caregivers, families, and communities. And it means also, and I am coming from, I am Moroccan and I am coming from this continent, it means also changing mindset and tackling all the harmful uh, social norms, all the gender discrimination, discrimination against minorities and protect and promoting protective norms. This is very, very important. The other point that if we are not doing that, if we are not moving from this siloed approach to this broad vision that is people-centered, we are not going to build this social contract that paves the way really for resilient, sustainable economies and human capital development. So for me, the VNR process is really an opportunity to build this chain of services around people. It is an opportunity to mobilize and to make all people own you know, this process. It's very important to make sure that it's inclusive, that you know, children, women, local uh, communities, uh, traditional leader, private sector, local government, central governments are heard, listened, and are involved and in being part of implementing it. Third, it's a strong, strong opportunity for building strong partnership, you know, and partnerships that are coordinated, results oriented, and taking into account also that children and young people, boys and girls, are seen as part of solution. But it's allowed us also to see the challenges that already were addressed by the previous, you know, speakers. The big problem of lack of information, but it's not the only one. Sorry, we have a big lack of effective implementation. We have huge number of plans, huge numbers of strategies that are not implemented because of lack of capacities, because of lack of coordination, because of lack of accountability, because of lack of monitoring. It's this, it's really important, and it's not only always because of lack of resources. Many countries in Africa have natural resources. So what is important, how we can make sure that we are prioritize social services that, that are equitable, that are just, that are inclusive, reaching all these people. This is very, very, very important. It's linked to governance and to efficient governance. It's linked to transparency. It's linked to be accountable to the population. And it's linked to fight corruption and impunity. This also is really important. It's a big package. And I think we can make it. We can make it if we use this process and not seeing it only as a report to show during the high level political forum and forget it. And this VNR process has to be embedded within the national development plan. This is very important. It's not parallel. And it has to take into account the agenda 2063, the agenda 2040, but also taking into account the concluding observation, you know, coming from UPR, from CRC, from CEDO, from the African also committee. I think it's a wonderful exercise if it's well done. But let me also uh, having two main points. I think also it's a good opportunity for the whole UN system, not only UNICEF, RC and the whole UN system to work together to really switch from this uh, kind of providing services to be more programmatic, more political, and really strengthening the capacities of the local and national systems of the countries to make them accessible to all, to make them of quality, to make them sustainable. This is very important and linking, you know, the nexus 
between development, humanitarian, and peace. This is very important because many countries are not only facing the challenge of COVID, but many other challenges that already were highlighted, you know, humanitarian crisis, digital gap, other disease like malaria, like HIV, the lack of decentralization, many, many things. So in and climate change, natural disasters. So we need really to tackle all this issue in a coordinated manner. And regarding the donors, the partners, I think it's also important to start being more result oriented, more people centered, and also strengthening the capacities of the countries at local and national level, making them more inclusive, more accountable, more of quality to make sure that they are accessible to all, leaving no one behind and seeing children and young people as really key actors, as a human capital to invest on. Despite the fiscal constraints, the priority is really, really, really investing in people if we need to be really an Africa that is resilient, because I am sure that Africa has all the resources needed, but we need to change the way we are dealing with making policies. It's not only about commitment. It's not only about slogan. It's only really about being acting and being accountable. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nagat. Uh, I think there are many elements that you've highlighted, but let me just uh, uh, mention a few uh, that uh, you left us with. Uh, the need for the DNR process to be inclusive and also embedded in national planning. Um, the, you know, focus on the need to focus on human capital development, given that the continent is a very young one. Uh, and I think perhaps uh, uh, very importantly, the issue of uh, strategies and uh, uh, um, uh, uh, reviews to be people-centered for development to be sustainable. Uh, and uh, you've highlighted also another issue that it's not always about the uh, issue of resources, but there is also a need to focus on the other elements that may limit uh, you know, progress in, in, in benefiting from these reviews, such as enhancing capacity, coordination, uh, monitoring, and above all, prioritizing the um, social services. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to uh, take questions, uh, open the floor for questions, uh, a few ones. So uh, if you have a question, maybe you can raise your hand and then we can um, see the lady in the um, second row, if you can please give her the mic and then uh, the gentleman to this side and then here. Um, okay, so if we can go with these three questions, please go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, moderator, and thank you to the panelists. It's, it's interesting to, to listen to different perspectives with regard to voluntary peer review. I was listening to I have never been engaged in peer review myself. What I do is look at the reports already produced and, and, and send it through. But I'm looking at the existing data collection mechanisms and frameworks that are existing in our institutions already. And uh, having talked already about the alignment of our national plans with the the, the, the development agendas, uh, visi I mean, uh, vision, t I mean, 2030 agenda and the and the uh, and the um, agenda 2063. If those are aligned, what I need to understand is if if how how are they mutually informative? The the, the existing uh, data collection and, and and reporting mechanisms that we are having, for example, in our ministry. You have an education management and information system that collects information that are relevant to the, 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 the objectives and the targets of the agendas, like number of girl children, the pass rate, and, 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 and so on. So they are, correct, correctly so, 
disintegrated. Uh, my, I, I'm, I'm, I'm leading to a point of saying, to make it easy, how do these information gathering mechanisms inform each other with the peer review, voluntary peer review mechanisms, which, which would make it easy if it's aligned from above, definitely if you have got your, your, your educational sensors, which is telling you a lot about your, your, your educational issues, you have got your, your, your 15th day school, school day statistics, and then you go through, by the time you reach the peer review, how, do, how does it inform each other? Or are we running parallel, you know, kind of review and reporting systems while we are uh, supposed to be reviewing uh, programs that are aligned towards each other? Uh, thank you. Thank you. The next person. Merci, Madame la Présidente, pour la parole donnée. Je m'appelle Ngomina Braminga. Je viens du Tchad. Je suis coordinateur technique de la plateforme de suivi des ODD. Bien qu'accrédité par le ministère en charge des agendas, je suis beaucoup plus invité ici en tant que technicien. Et parlant des examens nationaux volontaires, le Tchad est l'un des pays qui a renoué deux fois avec cette expérience. La première en deux... Merci. Et je disais la seconde en 2021. En termes de commentaires, je voudrais dire que si nous adoptons les agendas, je voudrais parler de l'agenda 2030 et de l'agenda 2063 de l'Union africaine et que nous ne les allions pas dans nos planifications, il ne sert à rien de s'engager dans cet exercice. Et justement, par rapport à l'agenda 2030, le Tchad a allié sa vision, appelée Vision 2030, le chat que nous voulons, sur l'horizon temporel de l'agenda 2030. Et cette, euh, cette, cette vision-là est déclinée en trois plans, comme la plupart des pays, en trois plans quinquennaux, dont le premier, c'est le PND 2017-2021, qui, à partir de l'Utiria, avec notre partenaire PNUD, nous avons avec l'outiria qui est un outil d'évaluation, euh, nous avons essayé d'évaluer ce PND 2017-2021 avec cet outil. Et cela nous a permis d'avoir le niveau d'alignement de l'agenda 2030 sur le premier plan quinquennal que le Tchad a élaboré. Et l'analyse de ce plan a permis euh, de savoir que le niveau d'alignement de l'agenda 2030 sur notre plan national de développement, là, varie d'un pilier à un autre et d'un ODD à un autre. Et ce qui nous a permis également de prendre les dispositions nécessaires pour pouvoir le corriger lorsque nous allons adopter le deuxième PND. Et justement, par rapport à cela, nous avons adopté une stratégie. Comment faire Je pense qu'une question a été posée tout à l'heure par rapport à l'alignement de l'agenda 2063. C'est là où euh, la plupart des pays se posent quand même un problème en ce qui concerne cet agenda. Mais par rapport aux ODD, je pense qu'avec l'appui des partenaires, nous avons quand même fait un travail assez remarquable. Et justement, par rapport à cette question, le Tchad a arrêté une stratégie. Nous avons décidé chaque année d'élaborer euh, le rapport national de suivi, mais de suivi conjoint de ces deux agendas. Nous, suivons, euh, nous, nous faisons un rapport de suivi de l'agenda 2030 et de l'agenda 2063. Et justement, en 2022, nous sommes en cours d'élaboration du nouveau PND 2022-2026. Et pour pouvoir régler ce qui a été constaté avec notre premier plan national de développement, nous avons engagé 
le renforcement des capacités de tous les points focaux. Les points focaux sont les représentants des différentes parties prenantes impliquées dans la mise en œuvre de ces deux agendas. Donc nous, les avons, nous avons renforcé leurs capacités à travers l'INSED qui était notre bras armé en ce qui concerne les données. Et nous faisons en sorte que, avec le nouveau plan, nous allons faire en sorte que ce qui n'a pas pu réussir avec le premier plan national de développement de 2017-2021, nous, nous voudrions maintenant que cela soit amélioré avec le deuxième. Et, et le renforcement de capacité a permis maintenant, puisqu'on a impliqué fortement les différents points focaux, qui, sont les, euh, qui, qui, qui représentent les différents ministères, également les, certaines institutions, la société civile et autres, nous allons faire en sorte que nous puissions améliorer maintenant l'intégration, non seulement de l'agenda 2030, mais également de l'agenda 2063 dans le nouveau plan que nous allons élaborer. Je pense que euh, si, si tout le monde suit cette logique, nous allons d'ici peu pouvoir intégrer suffisamment ces deux agendas dans nos planifications respectives. Merci. Bien, je remercie euh, le modérateur. Euh, avant que j'intervienne, je me présente d'abord. C'est le professeur euh, Simon Bokolo, euh, professeur de classe excellente du peuple. Je viens de la RDC, Congo-Kinshasa. J'interviens ici puisque nous avons suivi avec attention soutenu les différentes interventions des intervenants. Et j'ai quelques observations à faire. L'Afrique ne peut pas être plénichard. On ne peut pas développer l'Afrique en allant mendier l'argent à l'étranger. Ce sont nos offres. Nos efforts partenaires, les partenaires au développement doivent venir chez nous en appui de ce que nous faisons en rapport avec les affectations, les affectations budgétaires. Deuxième observation, on ne peut pas parler des questions sur les objectifs du développement durable sans se baser sur les deux approches. La première approche, c'est une approche, il y a une intervenante qui a dit, dégager les sources de vérification, les objectifs, les indicateurs clés. Donc, on ne peut pas parler des questions des objectifs sans se baser sur deux approches. L'approche inter, intersectorielle, telle que je vis développer là-bas, c'est secteur par secteur, et c'est basant sur l'approche pan-sociétale. Il faut qu'il y ait l'implication de tous les acteurs, société civile, institutions gouvernementales et les partenaires techniques au développement. La troisième observation est moins de dire nous nous réunissions, il y avait la septième session à Brazzaville, il y a eu la cinquième, la sixième, mais Parmi les recommandations que nous prenons, parmi les résolutions que la commission qui nous réunit ces jours à, la 8, à sa huitième session, mais est-ce qu'il y a applicabilité dans nos pays Vous me le dites, s'il si n'y a pas l'application de toutes ces résolutions et recommandations dans nos pays, c'est un leurre. Alors, la grande question qui entrave, que j'allais poser. Qu'est-ce qui entrave Quels sont les goulots d'étranglement qui entrave l'avancement ou le progrès du développement durable en Afrique Je dis, je vous remercie. Demain, si on a le temps, on pourrait s'échanger. Merci à vous. We'll, we'll go through, we'll, we'll give uh, each of the panelists, um, you know, um, three minutes to basically reflect on the questions that have been asked and uh, give any, you know, a uh, few thoughts or uh, reflections that you would like to leave with us. Um, Honorable Minister from Côte d'Ivoire, if we can start with you. Merci, euh, Madame le modérateur. Je pense que nous avons ici 
des réflexions assez enrichissantes sur ce processus qui est en réalité un peu, on va dire, un examen conjoint de toutes les parties prenantes de ce que nous faisons en matière d'avancement dans les ODD. Je voudrais me faire mienne cette réflexion euh, d'un des intervenants. Je pense que c'est la dame qui est intervenue à l'écran pour dire qu'en réalité, euh, euh, toutes ces euh, priorités, toutes ces préoccupations en ce qui concerne les ODD se tiennent. Nous avons... L'Afrique a beaucoup de défis à relever et nous avons à avancer sur beaucoup de secteurs concomitants. Et je pense que la, la question de la COVID, qui est en réalité est en lien avec euh, euh, nos, nos, nos débats de ce jour, on, la COVID a imposé à notre continent de nouveaux défis de nouveaux défis en lien avec la nécessité, ça a été dit ce matin, de produire certaines choses par nous-mêmes, de nouveaux défis en lien avec la nécessité d'assurer euh, ou de renforcer notre sécurité alimentaire. Et c'est autant de priorités sur les ODD ou de de, de, autant de besoins, de nouvelles priorisations des ODD qu'il faut voir. Donc, c'est un processus dynamique et cet examen de VNR aide justement à s'interroger avec l'ensemble des, des parties prenantes, y compris la société civile, le secteur privé et tous ceux, y compris également le monde enseignant, tous ceux qui réfléchissent ensemble avec nous sur les questions de développement, de s'interroger sur la meilleure façon de le faire. Je voudrais dire que la Côte d'Ivoire, pour la deuxième fois en juillet, va euh, également faire son processus VNR. Je voudrais enfin partager avec vous euh, une expérience que nous, nous avons, qui est une expérience de... Euh, euh, nous avons développé un outil que nous, a, nous appelons un outil d'accélérateur des, des, des ODD un peu plus azimuts. C'est ce qu'on a appelé le programme social du gouvernement où, de façon volontariste, nous identifions les secteurs de fragilité et l'État investit massivement euh, dans ces secteurs. Nous l'avons fait en 2019-2020, où euh, sur euh, ces deux années, on a multiplié par deux ou trois le nombre de ménages qui ont eu accès à l'électricité par rapport aux sept années précédentes. Nous sommes en train de rééditer l'exercice euh, euh, à partir de 2022 et nous allons axer... Euh, euh, les euh, effectuer des investissements massifs donc dans les zones de fragilité. Vous savez, nous sommes à, à un pays frontière avec euh, des pays en proie avec la sécurité, les questions de sécurité. Donc, il s'agit de relever de façon substantielle donc, euh, les défis sécuritaires dans ces zones pour pouvoir adresser. Ce que je veux dire, c'est que euh, euh, les VNR nous donnent l'occasion de ces débats partagés, d'identifier ensemble les fragilités et de les adresser. Euh, J'ai je, 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 entendu un commentaire sur la question du financement. C'est vrai qu'il y a la question de la gouvernance. Adresser la question de la gouvernance, c'est aussi adresser la question du financement. Je pense qu'il est important de réfléchir de façon approfondie comment l'Afrique peut mieux financer son développement, mieux financer ses, do, ses ODD. Comment euh, euh, régler la question de l'accès au marché, euh, euh, aux ressources de marché euh, Je l'ai entendu aujourd'hui, ce n'est pas beaucoup évoqué, mais de façon équitable. De façon équitable et comment faire en sorte euh, que nous puissions donc relever, euh, euh, mobiliser les financements, des financements intérieurs euh, euh, et euh, lutter contre les flux illicites. En tout cas, je vous remercie. Dire que sur la question du financement, la Côte d'Ivoire va organiser au mois de juin, les 14 et 15 juin 2022, euh, les, une table ronde des bailleurs de fonds pour mobiliser euh, euh, le financement de son plan national de développement 2016-2021. Non, 2000, euh, nous sommes en 2021-2025. Et je voudrais ici donc euh, solennellement inviter 
et la CEA, mais l'ensemble des agences du système des Nations Unies, à venir nous accompagner dans la mobilisation du financement de notre plan national de développement. Je vous remercie. Thank you very much um, for your uh, thoughts and reflections. Uh, Honorable Minister from Djibouti, if you can. Merci. Je vais continuer dans la même lancée que ma collègue de Côte d'Ivoire, parce que l'intervenant a insisté sur le volet de financement. Et le financement, c'est vrai que cette question, elle revient souvent. Même le système des Nations Unies dans l'ancien agenda OMD, il y avait un, un huitième objectif. Et je me rappelle à chaque fois, cet objectif on, on, on était là. Euh, on ne savait pas qui était responsable, est-ce que c'est le pays ou est-ce que c'est le partenaire. Et on a toujours voulu que cet objectif, euh, le huitième objectif des ODD, soit renseigné quelque part, soit par les partenaires, soit par le pays. Mais on n'a jamais obtenu cette réponse. Et on est dans la même situation aujourd'hui avec l'objectif 17. C'est vrai que le pays euh, s'autour aux alliés avec les, les VNR, mais j'aimerais bien aussi, euh, au niveau du système des Nations Unies et des partenaires bilatéraux, que le financement a, qui est, je sais pas, un, un rapport euh, des partenaires qui montre leur volonté d'apporter le financement nécessaire dans l'atteinte de ces objectifs, euh, les, les agendas 2030 ou l'agenda la, la, 2063. Mais ce qui concerne Djibouti, Djibouti, c'est un petit pays. On a un PIB par tête qui est aujourd'hui autour de 3 000, 1 800, 2 800, euh, entre 2 000 et 2 500 dollars par tête, ce qui fait qu'on n'est pas éligible au guichet d'an. Et pourtant, nous avions des, déf des défis. Euh, nous trouver dans une situation avec un taux de pauvreté qui est autour de 38 une disparité entre la capitale et les villes de l'intérieur, comme mon collègue... Euh, dit problème de connectivité entre la ville principale et les régions de l'intérieur, la nécessité d'investir de, dans des infrastructures et on sait que nos ressources budgétaires euh, ne, ne peuvent pas financer ces, ces infrastructures. Et il y a à côté d'autres partenaires euh, ceux qui travaillent au ministère des Finances seront, qui posent des conditions des critères euh, sans citer un partenaire voilà ce qu'on peut obtenir ou le, 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 le niveau d'endettement qu'on peut réaliser. Lorsqu'on en dépasse ce niveau, on, a, euh, on est un pays à risque, un pays fragile, un pays qui, euh, euh, qui a pris des risques et qu'il faut, qu faut surveiller de près. Je crois que euh, c'est pareil un peu partout. On est dans un dilemme. L'atteinte des ODD nous amène à des investissements énormes. À côté, les partenaires sont là pour ne pas dépasser un seuil d'endettement de plus de 40%. Je crois que quelque part, les partenaires, le système des Nations Unies, nos partenaires, hein, doivent mener des de réflexions et avoir à, à, un objectif ou un budget pour l'atteinte des ODD. Ce budget peut être partagé ensemble entre les pays et euh, nos, le, le système des Nations Unies et demander à ce qu'il y ait une exception parce que si on veut réaliser ces huit objectifs, pauvreté zéro pour un pays qui a 40% de taux de pauvreté, je pense que ça va être difficile si on fait pas, si on ne fait pas appel à un financement ou, euh, sous forme de dons ou sous forme de, de prêts. Je crois que quelque part, il y a un exercice à faire et euh, souvent, le, 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 les questions et les conditions sont de notre côté pays, mais je sens que du côté des partenaires, il n'y a pas un exercice d'auto-évaluation qui est fait. Moi, aujourd'hui, je vais apporter cette recommandation pour que l'objectif 17 de financement ne, ne connaisse pas la même situation que l'objectif 8 des OMD. Ceux qui ont travaillé sur les OMD pour comprendre l'OMD 8. Pour ce qui concerne les le ressources, je vais parler de financement en Afrique. Vous savez que chez nous, le secteur privé euh, ne rapporte pas beaucoup. On, est, on travaille on est essentiellement dans en, en, la matière première qui dépend du marché euh, international, qui dépend des crises euh, et des niveaux qui on n'a pas une, une industrie euh, vraiment développée, ce qui fait que les recettes qui arrivent dans les caisses de l'État euh, couvrent, euh, je veux dire, autour de 70, entre 60 et 70 
le fonctionnement de l'administration, les salaires, les, les, les salaires de, de l'administration et ne, ne permet pas, il n'y a pas une marge pour porter des financements, apporter des financements, surtout des constructions de routes ou euh, des constructions d'écoles. Et euh, juste pour euh, revenir un peu à le dernier intervenant, aucun pays ne, ne finance son développement sur un fonds propre. Même les grandes puissances que vous voyez en face de vous fait appel à, 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 à des marchés. Peut-être les marchés sont différents. Nous, nos partenaires sont multilatéraux, bilatéraux. Euh, les pays développés font appel à, au marché primaire ou secondaire euh, la, de, de bourse et euh, disposent de transformations, des outils qui, peut-être à notre niveau en Afrique, avec des réformes, surtout j'insiste sur le volet réforme, les réformes sont difficiles à mettre en place. On a un contexte d'une éducation et on ne veut pas reprendre des réformes qui ont réussi dans les pays riches parce qu'on n'est pas là. On n'a pas la même culture, on n'a pas la même idéologie. Je crois que euh, pour réussir, euh, c est, c est, c est, pour bien réussir et surtout atteindre ces ODD, ça, quelque part, il faut, il faut partager les responsabilités. Et je mets aujourd'hui comme recommandation nos partenaires et système des Nations Unies et bilatéraux tiennent compte de ces volets et financements. Merci. Thank you. Um, Sarah, if you can, in just a you know, couple of minutes, really reflect maybe your thoughts on the questions that were asked, as well as any concluding thoughts. Thank you, Madam Moderator. I think um, I would prefer to give it actually the, the final words to our member states, uh, as we always do. Maybe a quick one on the finance issue and also the data collection raised by Madam, uh, Madam the Minister of Education uh, in Namibia. I think on the finance, member states definitely need to also prioritize um, and identify priorities um, uh, for goals to be financed by, member, by, by development partners. Um, I remember that some countries like Egypt and even South Africa, they have uh, um, quite good practice to have a round table with the donors and see to what extent and which sectors donors can support. So also member states have their own voice on what the donors can put on the table. I think this is an extremely important exercise. In many occasions, we hear from uh, partners uh, as a regional organ that there is money, but they don't know what, what priorities uh, African countries actually are asking for. And sometimes uh, there's also, as I said, the collaboration between national uh, bureau and national um, authorities is necessary so they can also speak with one voice with the partners. The second and quick comment on the data collection and how are they are mutually informative um, as regard the agenda 2050 between SDGs. Um, I refer to that in my, in my input and in my taking points because there is a clear challenge. Uh, we have um, a, a joint tool, it's called the ECA tool to report on both agendas. And usually ECA approaches member states to, to collect data for this exercise. And we have also agenda 2063 core indicators framework And when we prepare the, globe, the continental report every two years, I think the latest one was launched in the AU summit in 2022, in February, we also address member states for the same purpose. Um, uh, I, would, I would say frankly from technical point of view that the SDGs, the SDGs indicators remain more inclusive than the Agenda 2063 global indicators framework because what we have tried to do is to reduce the fatigue of reporting, but we ended up also missing some clear indicators uh, to reflect on both agendas. So um, it's still a, a national exercise and it really depends on the country and the statistical capacities of national statistical of, uh, offices or authorities to inform um, the progress on both agendas. Thank you. Thank you. Honorable <laughs> Minister of um, Liberia. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I think it's, it's uh It's a wealth of, of, of conversation here that we all can, can learn from. I, I would try to be very brief and, and take on the, the, the last question or the last speaker who, who was on the floor asking question about or making comments about whether Africa will only rely on donor resources for, for, for meeting its development goals. So I, I think that the emphasis here comes on, on us you know, uh, working hard on um, on the domestic resource mobilization front to be able to see 
what priorities we are financing with the resources that we generate. Uh, but it's also important that uh, because, you know, we, we work, we, we exist in the world of partnership. And because we exist in the world of partnership, it's important that the, the resources of, of, I mean, available uh, uh, from our partners be, uh, be matched with that of what we have as governments to be able to do more uh, based, on, based on the development agenda, uh, the SDGs, uh, and, and of course the agenda uh, 2063. So this is, it, it is about the, the action part. Uh, for example, what we've, what we've done in Liberia, just before I came, we have started the planning of what we call a high level field visit. Uh, there's been a conversation about alignment. There's been a conversation, like I said, from the last BNR uh, about uh, resource allocation. So we said, you know what, let's get to the field. Let's partners and government, let's, let's go to the project sites. Let's see what's happening in the field. Let's understand whether uh, what we are working on is the actual priority that we need to, we need to work on to be able to meet the, the, the goals, to be able to meet the agenda. So uh, that mission is, planning, uh, is planned for the, the 12th and, and the 13th of March, which, which is for us the first time uh, in our development space to have the partners and the government uh, led by the Minister of Finance going into the field to actually visit both government and development uh, finance projects. And then to listen and to experience what the issues are on the ground when it comes to the actual uh, implementations. And we believe with, with those kinds of things, I think it will even inform more alignment. It will even inform more conversation about alignment. It will inform more conversation about policies and activities. It will inform more, you know, more actions about the resources. How do we deploy and where are we deploying the resources? So we, we think, yes, it is important that we use the, the national resources in terms of the domestic resources that we generate, but certainly you can't do it uh, only relying on the, the, the domestic resources. Because some of the countries, of course, are very challenged when it comes to raising more domestic resources, considering the fact that, you know, there is in fragile areas, uh, they have small economies. I mean, just name the, the rest of the challenges. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Loretta, to you. Um, thank you very much, Madam Moderator. Um, just to add on what um, the last two p uh, panelists were um, discussing on funding, I agree with that and what we should do is to strengthen um, PPP funding. So basically that's in line with what you're saying because what's happening now, the other thing that we should also highlight because of COVID is the vaccination, you know, um, the, the pace that we are going at um, in uh, various African countries. Slow pace means obviously a risk for investors to come into the country and that would obviously have an impact on the economic development of that country which would create funding for development in the country. So that is one thing that we should um, look into because like in um, Namibia we have a very slow pace, about 15, 16%. I had another country in the previous um, presentation about 5% um, vaccination pay, like uh, rate. Uh, and we are encouraging for that, so to invite more um, investors from the outside. Now, just to, I'm an educator, so I just had to, with my closing remarks, and to add, I just want to highlight um, on gender equality, education, and, 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 and how that is actually linked to um, socioeconomic development. You see, the VNR report um, highlighted the rise in, in, in suicide mortality, which is attributed to socioeconomic um, positions. And it has been um, highlighted that it's more common in men. Now, coming back to again the boy child. Um, you see, even in the APRM report, it highlights uh, on, on, on the increase of female enrollment in primary, secondary, and tertiary institutions. We look at female graduates uh, that are, like the numbers are higher than um, the, the boys. So if we have to focus on, 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 on addressing that problem, perhaps we could also avoid on suicide <laughs> mortalities that will be covered in, 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 in men, you know, in, in something that is highlighted in the VN, VNR of, of, of our 2021 um, process.
So yeah, that is something that I wanted to um, highlight. And also um, when it comes to funding, Namibia has um, launched, was it last year, 2021, we launched the Development Finance Assessment Report, which basically provides an overview on how these finances could be aligned to the national objectives and policies that would uh, maximize um, outcomes and, and, and output out there. You know, and in conclusion, despite all of these challenges that we have, um, Namibia is still committed in achieving the global um, targets and COVID-19 will definitely not derail us from our efforts. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, if I can now turn to Najat to uh, give us um, her concluding thoughts and remarks in a couple of minutes. Najat, do we still have her online? You, uh, I am, Jusmila, you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. You hear me? Okay, okay. Je veux juste réagir très, très rapidement. Euh, D'abord au Tchad, parce que j'ai eu l'honneur de faire euh, un, une visite pays en décembre dernier, où j'ai eu, euh, donc c'est très récent, où il y a beaucoup de bruit derrière, euh, je n'entends pas. Ok. Euh, où j'ai eu l'occasion de visiter le pays pendant une semaine, et juste pour dire deux points, c'était un pays, c'est un pays qui est en transition politique, et qui en même temps actuellement euh, revoit sa constitution. Et je tiens à réellement euh, mettre en exergue ce point-là. On a travaillé avec eux et avec tout le UN Country Team et toutes les autorités locales. Et ce qu'on a pu voir, c'est que le processus de transition, la révision de la constitution, c'est voulu être très, très, très participative. C'était très important, impliquant toutes les franges de la population, pas uniquement les, pol les partis politiques, mais aussi les enfants, les jeunes et les femmes. Le deuxième point, je veux revenir sur la partie qui a, où on a parlé beaucoup de la capacité des pays. Et je pense que ce qui est capital, c'est de renforcer les capacités des pays et les capacités des systèmes locaux et nationaux. Et c'est le rôle des partenaires, qu'ils soient onusiens ou donateurs ou techniques, parce qu'il est capital que les priorités soient définies par les pays, quand je dis par les, par les pays, pas que par les gouvernants, mais aussi par la population, par les femmes, par les enfants, par les jeunes, par les communautés locales, partout, c'est très important. Le deuxième point, l'approche doit être ascendante et non pas descendante, et la transparence est quelque chose de capital. Je pense que quand on alloue des ressources, quand les budgets sont alloués, on doit, la population doit savoir pourquoi ils ont été alloués et quel est l'impact des ressources allouées. Je crois que mesurer l'impact des ressources sur la situation des populations est importante. Et mon dernier point, euh, il y a beaucoup de bruit derrière, je suis désolée, j'espère que vous m'entendez. Mon dernier point, c'est le coût qui est très important de la non-action, et particulièrement sur la violence à l'égard des enfants, filles et garçons. Le fait de ne pas prévenir la violence a un coût économique et un coût humain. Et je vous dis tout simplement, si l'Afrique prévenait et mettait fin aux violences contre les enfants et aux violences basées sur le genre, elle aurait un gain de 8% de son BIP. C'est des trillions de dollars. Donc c'est aussi un investissement, c'est très important. Voilà, je m'arrête là parce que très honnêtement, il y a beaucoup de bruit et je ne sais pas si vous m'avez entendu ou pas. Yes, thank you. Yes, we, were, we have been able to hear you. Thank you very much. Um, it has been a very uh, uh, insightful and engaging discussion. Um, I'd, I'd really like to um, uh, thank, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the, all the distinguished panelists very much. And uh, if you can please give them a warm round of applause. <laughs> we have we, we, we really got a lot of food for thought to reflect on in terms of the need for the process to be inclusive, to be integrated throughout from budgeting to implementation, to engage with stakeholders um, and to really be more people centered. So um, thanks very much to the panel. And uh, I will handle now to the Secretariat to uh, make the announcements uh, and closing. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, DES. Thank you, everyone, for bearing with us. Uh, it has been, obviously, a very long day. 
um, but also one which I think has been very rich. Um, everyone is invited to a cocktail, which is available now. Uh, for tomorrow, the uh, new program has been posted on the website. Uh, we have had to move one session from today to tomorrow morning, 9 a.m., which means that the whole program uh, tomorrow is moved back uh, by one hour, right? So if your event was at 10, it will be one hour later because the first event will be the panel on statistics at uh, 9 a.m., which was uh, postponed from today. Uh, so thank you for uh, reconvening tomorrow morning at 9 in this room. There will also, as you know, there will be parallel sessions tomorrow. And the parallel sessions normally would have taken place at 11, but the parallel sessions have to take place at the same time. So they have been moved back to 1.45. So all of the parallel sessions are uh, tomorrow morning at 1.45, but the normal session starts at 9 a.m. And we will be finishing by 6 if we uh, are on time tomorrow. And I think we will be able to start on time tomorrow, so we should be uh, much better in terms of uh, timing. Thank you to all those following online. Thank you to all the technical team, and thank you to the interpreters. And lastly, thank, thank you to our excellent panel and to the government of Rwanda for their hospitality. Merci, bonne soirée, nous I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not